Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities, our meeting of March 2nd, 2022. This committee meeting is being convened by electronic means, as authorized under Part 14 of the Procedure Bylaw, the City of Vancouver Electronic Meetings. As such, council members may participate in person or by electronic means. If a committee member attending by electronic means loses connection during the voting process, staff are available to get you back online quickly while the voting process is suspended. The staff contact information has been circulated to you. Video of committee members speaking, presentations, and vote results will be rejected on the live stream when available. Committee members are reminded in accordance with Section 1413 of the Procedure Bylaw, members must enable their video to confirm quorum. Given the surge in COVID transmission and reinstatement of our COVID safety plan, the maximum capacity of the council chamber is 20 persons. I would like to remind everyone that all staff are participating electronic for this week's meetings. Members of the public who wish to participate are encouraged to submit comments online or participate via telephone. If attending in person, health protocols associated with COVID-19 will be observed in council chambers and throughout City Hall. Members of the public are strongly encouraged to attend remotely. We begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh people. We thank them for having care for this land, look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. I also want to take a moment to recognize the incredible contributions of City of Vancouver staff who work hard every single day to help make our city an incredible place to live, work, and play. Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Councillor Carr in the chair, Mayor Stewart. Present. Uh, Councillor DiGenova? Not here. Councillor Fry? Present. Councillor Swanson? Here. Councillor Hardwick? Councillor Weeb? Present. Councillor Boyle? Present. Councillor Dominato? Not here. Councillor Bly? Present. Councillor Kirby Young. Present. You have quorum, Chair Carr. Thank you. Just sir. a point of privilege. I'm here as well, Chair Carr, Councillor DiGenova. Thank you for noting that. It's noted. Okay, um, we have um, eight items of business on today's agenda four staff reports, four member motions referred from yesterday's council meeting. We will recess at noon for lunch and reconvene at 1 p.m. Should the business not be completed prior to 5 p.m. today, which I think all of us should aim for, uh, we will recess for dinner at 5 p.m. and reconvene at 6 p.m. If an additional day is required, the meeting will reconvene Tuesday, March 8th at 3 p.m. Finally, I would like to remind council members that if amendments are brought forward, please submit them to the city clerk in final written form before the council member introduces them. And please ensure the clerk has received your amendment by using the council meeting amendments DL. So as chair for this meeting, I'm suggesting for reports that have no speakers or presentations that we adopt the recommendations collectively in a single motion. Report three has no presentations or speakers. Does any member wish to hold report three, which is approval of commercial drive business improvement area renewal? Need to move that on the consent agenda, chair. Um, sorry, I'm just looking for anybody okay. who's wishing to hold it. Councillor DiGenova, is anybody okay. wanting to hold this item for debate or decision? Right. Okay. Uh, secondly, does Maybe any member, back. excuse me, just a second, Councillor DiGenova? I, if I any, point of privilege? Um, yes, Councillor DiGenova? I can't get my panel up. My apologies, Chair. So I'm sorry. And my, my hearing's a little delayed. I'll try and restart after we're through this point, but I okay. apologize. Okay. Um, I am first um, going to ask, or secondly going to ask, does any member wish to declare a conflict of interest on the consent item? Okay, no, no. Now, Councillor DiGenova, if you would like to move this item, this is the Happy right to moment. Move it. Thank you. And I will endeavor to get my crest on panel. Right. Thank you. Um, so, all, uh, this is the approval of Commercial Drive Business Improvement Area, BIA Renewal 2022. All those in favor say yay. Any opposed say nay? Yay. Was that a yay or a nay? Yay. Yay. Okay, delayed yay. Got it. Um, and no nays. Um, so uh, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, that means the following uh, item has been approved on consent. Approval of com uh, a commercial drive business improvement area, BIA renewal 2022. Great. Um, 
page. So moving on to the rest of the agenda, I just want, before we start, want to remind speakers that you have five minutes to make comments, should state whether you are in support or in opposition of recommendations, and can only speak once. Committee members, again, reminding you this is committee, so we have three minutes to ask questions to speakers. And you understand, of course, speakers are under no obligation to respond. I will also ask if speakers are residents of Vancouver if it is not noted on the speakers list. Following the last speaker on the um, speakers list for each item, we will go back through the list for those who were not present when their name was initially called. I also want to note the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including utmost respect for all genders. I remind Council that when addressing speakers and staff, please avoid using gendered honorifics. Instead, refer to the person by first and last name, by role or title. Our first item is revisiting the City's single-use beverage cup fee policy. We have Albert Seamus, Director of Solid Waste Management and Green Operations, on the line to provide a presentation. Um, Albert Seamus, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Carr. I will share my screen. Okay, this works out okay. And can everyone see the presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, it looks okay. like we, we, everybody can. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come to Council today to speak on the data of the single use beverage cup fee policy as directed by Council at, at the end of January. If I can get these pages to work. Uh, today, I'll provide a bit of background information on this we've taken to review the byline implementation um, since council directed us to do so the, the key takeaways from the information that we gathered our proposed recommendations conclusions as of the rationale behind the single use cup and bag bylaws um, there are some single use items thrown away in the garbage in Vancouver every year 82 million single use, which break down to approximately 50% hot drink and 50% cold drink cups, 89 million plastic shopping bags, 4 million paper bags. The bus were passed in 2019. There was a significant public consultation that went before that in 2018 and the early part of 20. And the bylaws initially were set to come into effect January 1st of 2021, and Council approved delaying the impact of the bylaws to January 1st, 2022, uh, due to the impacts of the pandemic on businesses. Council direction in, in January that um, because there had been a number of concerns raised about the bylaws, relax to people experiencing homelessness and residents with low incomes, businesses seeing the cup fee. Uh, without offering reusable alternatives, I'll be using the cup fee revenue and some challenges around bags for takeout and food delivery. I'll ask us to report back by March 15th to provide a better understanding of the fin experience since the bylaw came into effect. And this would include any random recommendations or adjustments to the policy. Over the past three or four weeks, we have taken the following steps. We've reviewed the business for the bylaws to come into effect by looking at the requests for and distribution of the toolkit. We've reviewed the number and types of inquiries received. We've learned levels of business compliance by contacting 87 food vendor locations. We've spoken to industry associations as well as national and multinational franchises. We've had meetings and emails with cup share programs in Vancouver. We looked at the shopping bag regulations across the Lower Mainland uh, through Vancouver and in other communities in Nova Scotia that have bag bans in effect. And we've received from nonprofits and uh, investigated some of the equity concerns associated with the feedback received. We'll start with some key takes from the research that we did. Business preparedness. What we found was that businesses prepared for bylaws in advance, but many left at the last minute. 
9% of the toolkit material requested were after the bylaws came to effect on January 1st. And so you can see there the, the numbers of requests that we had totaling 5,500 requests, of which 3,300 and change occurred before the bylaws came into effect and 2,100 and change after. Prior to the bylaws coming, in fact, we did send out notification letters to, to advise them of the bylaws coming into effect and also to advise them that there, there was information prepared in the toolkits that we had assembled that they could access to support initiatives to initiate, initiate the bylaws. So we sent out a letter in the first part of October and you can see the blue lines there represent the number of calls and inquiries and requests for the toolkits that came in after that. Another notification letter in the latter part of November. And then we do see on the 27th of December, before the bylaws came, there was quite, a, quite an increase in the number of people seeking the toolkits. On the 3rd of January, a number came in then, and it's gradually declined over the last few weeks. Bylaw inquiries, so complaints declined speaking to the bylaw. We had a number of complaints the first week, uh, totaling about 100 and and they dropped significantly after the first week to 60 the second week and gradually declined. And um, the, you know, we're down below 20 February 7th, and we continue to see those calls decline. Uh, we did see them before the bylaw came into effect in the, in the month of December, but they really peaked first week after people were being impacted. It indicated to us that there was uh, a lot of preparation in place for the, the number of complaints was actually significantly less than we would have expected, given the number to be affected by these bylaws. Um, you know, the, the number that we received the month of January after the bylaws came into effect was was uh, under 400, and so you know we would have expected in the thousands of calls, so significantly less than um, than our overall expectations. Research by contacting the businesses around their current operations, how they were for the transition to reusables. And what we found was small businesses and local chain quickest to implement. Uh, most local chains and small businesses already give the option to cut fee and, and accept reusables. One national chain has developed their own program, but also accepts customer reusable cups and offers reusables for it to stay as well. Large chains, um, multinational lagging behind, they are working on expanding the reusable options, but they were hampered by interns between the corporation and franchises as they're looking at broader changes than Vancouver. So while we may be pushing for the changes here in Vancouver, the multinationals are actually, actually considering making these changes on a broader base to uh, the province uh, across the country. We also found that delaying the cup fee will disadvantage small businesses and local chains that have already complied with transition to reusables. And it could derail initiatives underway, particularly in the area of cup share. Cup share programs are really alive and well. Um, they're designed to have customers borrow sanitized reusable cups for drinks to return at a later date. Currently available at 48 vendors in 82 locations and there's an expectation in the businesses of another 75 to 100 in the next. The Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association has a part in a cup share provider, and they're targeting 50 businesses in the downtown core. Found that customer demand for reusable options is driving business participation in these programs, and that the cup fee revenue can offset the fees for things like cup washing. Uh, the purchase of cups, staff training, and customer education. And the cup fee could stall or end some of these programs. There were concerns raised about giving consumers options to avoid the cup fee, and it was found that city intervention may be needed in this area. The city has the ability to businesses to accept customer reusable cups, and some businesses may need more time. Food safety and sanitation plans which have to be approved by Vancouver Co Coastal Health, excuse me, Vancouver Coastal Health, so that the business can actually accept the reusable cups. There were concerns raised by the public um, expressing mistrust businesses are using the cup fee revenue. 
The city can set a deadline for businesses to open cups or to stay drinks and provide cup share for to go drinks. Uh, we don't businesses to invest the fees in reusable alternatives rather than just uh, receiving revenue. The challenge with the um, in use or in store use of reusables is that not all facilities are or equipped to do that. There are space concerns around the ability to use or install dishwashers and sanitation facilities. It will take time for all the businesses to roll into a suitable cup share program. Some businesses had reduced the drink prices to offset the fee, and this was true in one um, national chain, multinational chain, where they weren't ready to offer their reusable options. So they chose to reduce the fee or the cup cost, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the drink cost by 25 cents to offset the cup fee. What we feel is that that is not a reasonable approach where they don't have the reasonable options available yet, but showing the cup fee separately creates consumer pressure for the, the move to reusable options. And that's supported by the reason done around behavior change. We did look at bylaws for stopping banks in other communities, and we found that Vancouver's bylaw is consistent with other BC municipalities. However, our fees for um, disposable bags for paper and for reusable bags are low in the other municipalities. None of the jurisdictions we use on drive-through, takeout, or food delivery bags. One of the things that I think is really important as we look at our own bylaws is to make sure they are as soon as possible with others in the region and the province, which is the effective path to change. And at this time, we don't recommend any changes to the shop bylaw. The summary of the bylaws for within BC, and it includes the Ministerial 9 from the government of BC, which is targeted towards those communities that function under the community charter and allows them to implement wise uh, bag bylaws and fees on their own without going back individually to approval. So you can see that in all jurisdictions, there are bylaw bags, or there are bylaws that ban bags. There are some options, for example, Vancouver, Esquimo, Nanaimo, and Stat have an initial fee of 15 cents for the bags, paper bags. All others have cents. No municipalities exempt drive through delivery. Uh, we, along with the uh, other three municipalities, reusable bag fees of $1 initially, um, and others, others, and in all cases, the businesses keep the fees. The other concern that's been raised um, uh, across the board has been around and the challenges for those that uh, face income inequity. As a reminder, the consultation on the bylaws dates back to 28 and early 2019. The bylaws were adopted in 2019, and these predate 21 equity framework. When we developed the bag bylaws and the cup bylaws, focused on balancing a number of competing factors, which included equity for people in poverty or living with low income. We did have a cup fee exemption for charitable for this. We did institute a program for collecting and redistributing donated reused bags, and we did provide support in multiple languages. Even for our areas where the bylaws can be improved, uh, and one I think of the most ones is exempting free drinks from the cup fee. We found early in the days of being in place that there was a situation that came up where uh, meal vouchers were provided multinational that um, didn't include Laundry and in some cases, the, uh, the residents seeking the meal voucher renewal were found, found that they had to actually pay a cup fee to get a free cup of coffee. And so removing that requirement for the bylaw was to, um, to avoid those situations. We also heard from the multinational and national chains that it's a benefit to them as well because then they can offer on occasion to support uh, the low-income community. 
those supports the development of low barrier cup share programs. That's something we can take on. Uh, share options that can support those that are, are experiencing poverty or low incomes. We can work with the, uh, the nonprofit community and uh, organizations that distribute meals and meal vouchers to people that um, are faced with low income. And we also need to work closely with the, including nonprofits and other stakeholders, to look at other potential options to support those that are most disadvantaged. We believe that using the current equity frames adopted in 2021 to further evaluate supports will provide greater long-term to the community as a whole. The other uh, information we see from the business and particular in residents as well was that continued outreach, education and support to the businesses and the community on the cup will be important as we go forward. So that everybody is aware, they, they are not surprised that there's a cup fee, that we keep that awareness front and center forward. And using the information we got, we provided the, final, the following recommendations in the report. A exempt its free drinks from the cup fee, which again provides that benefit to those living with poverty or low incomes. And it covers free drink vouchers, monetary gift vouchers, free water, um, particularly during during the summers. And it also allows free drinks from using a rewards program, which many residents rely on to help with affordability. Recommendation B to continue to work with nonprofits and relevant stakeholders, a low barrier cup share program uh, to continue to raise awareness about the goal to reduce these items to how to, to how to access the low barrier cup share programs, uh, identify additional options, and use the city's equity framework to assess them. And that allows us to continue to support experiencing poverty and living with low incomes as we go forward and still allows the trend reusables and zero waste. Further supports development of equitable circular business models in Vancouver and uh, again supports our zero waste targets. The quick start action for this will to be as quickly as possible to pilot a free and low barrier cup share program in partnership with profits, cup share providers and businesses. Recommendation C is to require food vendors to accept customers' reusable cups for in-store or and cold drinks by July 1st, 2022. The uh, so for that is that it ensures the cup fee works as intended, which is to replace disposable cups. It allows customers to avoid the fee and reduce waste and equal playing field for all businesses. And it supports the proactive businesses that aren't disadvantaged for successful cups now. So by that, I mean, we have many, particularly our local and uh, individual business, local chains that have adapted well to the change or are already operating, offering the reusable options. And it ensures that other businesses that have not are brought along in a fashion that allows them to, um, to put those place. And we do expect that the majority of businesses that have accepted cups in the past will do so before July 1st, uh, the recommended date. But it does allow time for us to um, look at challenges around the security issues in some local theaters, for example, in some cases uh, restrict the use of security reasons. Some of the sports venues do the same. And that's for uh, public protection. We want to make sure we work with them around how best to support them. Uh, allow for those like the, the um, businesses that did not have a reusable option beforehand who were using fountain drinks or serve yourself drinks to food safety and sanitation plans and have them approved by Vancouver Health Coastal Health. Recommendation D is a recommendation to report back within 18, 18 months on a timeline to expand the program to, for businesses to provide usable, reusable cups for drinks that are ordered to stay in this location. 
and further to get more involved and broader representation for reusable cup share programs for to go greens. And that sends a signal for businesses to invest in the reusable option, provides motion and confidence to the uh, to the business community as well as residents, and it provides us with time to consult on the timeline uh, of the requirements around having all businesses have cups reusable for internally provided drinks. It allows further time for ramp up and uh, expansion of capture programs. So a few conclusions that we drew through our, through our based on the work that we've done in the past. Our cup bylaws is the first in Canada. We did a transition period and we didn't expect that we had everything perfect right off the bat. We recognize we need to look at challenges that we may not have anticipated just accordingly. We did expect that some businesses would adjustments until after the bylaw came into effect. It's kind of par for the course for general public behavior. People do wait until the requirements are in place changes. And it will take time for consumers to adapt to changes required to focus more on reusables rather than disposable. We're encouraged by the uptake of reusable cup share, reusable cup programs in general. And while some businesses did leave preparation to lab, many were prepared in advance and did accommodate the changes. Recommendations that we put forward to address the critical and challenges that we found to date and set a stage for the city's transition to the swimming and zero waste by 2040. We'll, uh, we'll leave it there and I'll stop sharing my screen so that we can uh, go through the answers. Thanks so, so much. Um, you do have a lot of questions. Uh, starting with Councillor DiGenova. Councillor DiGenova, go ahead, up to five minutes. Thanks very much. Um, I, I really appreciate the presentation and the thoughtful work staff have put into this. It's, it's just, I've seen firsthand and I continue to see firsthand how there is a clear miscommunication already on what the rules are around this with retailers. Um, I've, I've had it happen a number of times. In fact, just last week, I was at a, a coffee re retailer and brought my own cup with me. And they said, no, no, we're, we're not doing that. Our, our dishwasher isn't working right now. So in fact, because you brought your own cup, we'll give you the cup for free. But that's, that's not the a part of the program. I've also had it, well, we're in COVID right now still. Um, you showed me your cup, I'll give you this cup for free. So they're eating that cost, but not everyone can afford to do that. Is there a question, so Councillor question, DiGenova? This is question yes, period. Yes, yeah. there is, but you don't do this to other councillors, Councillor Carr, so I'd, I'd ask you if you could please uh, treat me the same as others. Um, so, and you framed your questions much longer than mine before, but I'm going to ask you, do you, do you see barriers here for small local mom and pop shop businesses who don't have a commercial dishwasher, who don't have um, that ability to just take that 25 cents off their bottom line if they don't have a dishwasher or they're losing customers? I think when, um, it's a very good question. You know, we've tried within the recommendations to deal with the, with the two issues really that fall out of your question. The first is the, uh, is the requirement to accept reusable cups. And the second is for that follow on recommendation to deal with reusable cups for offered for, for drinks um, to stay. And, and so I think there will be challenges for some businesses as they move to reusable cups. They do have to update their uh, health and safety plans and have them approved by Vancouver Coastal Health. The CDC does allow the use of reusable cups um, they don't need to have a dishwasher to accept reusable cups if the customer is bringing their own cup. Uh, and, and so, I, you know, I don't understand that particular part of it. Um, if they were in a cup share program, then others would be collecting those cups and washing them, sanitizing them before they deliver them back to the business. But, you know, I think we may see some challenges in some businesses, but really the programs that we're trying to put in place support the transition and allow them to move forward with uh, using. Reusables, and we did find that 
the majority of the ones that are already doing it are the small local businesses and local chains as opposed to the larger ones. So, so just a follow up question to that, but I'm going to actually move for a second round of questions now. If that's um, all right. You're Jeff. moving that? Okay. Um, yeah. I'm uh, looking just, just for support from council. Just a second. You're just moving it. Um, all those councillors in support say yay. 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 Opposed say nay. Go ahead, Councillor Gijinova. There will be a second okay. round. I'm wondering in, in the idea of the cup share program, and I was trying to get to that also, although there are some retailers that actually require that they do wash your mug before they will fill it for whatever their reasons are. I've had this happen. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you can share, is, is the ultimate goal to require every single coffee shop or food service, uh, you know, takeaway to have the ability to have a cup share program? It's not a requirement to use cup share, but it is an option that's available. Okay, but to use cup share, each of those mom and pop coffee shops would have to not only install a commercial dishwasher, they'd have to pull permits to go along with that. Is that correct if they don't already have one? No, there's a number of uh, cup share programs that offer collection of the cups. They will wash them and sanitize them and they will bring them back. So the business does not need to have a commercial dishwasher. However, if we go down the road of requiring uh, to stay drinks to be reusable, we may be in a situation where there is a requirement for businesses to have a commercial dishwasher, which is why we recommended 18 months to review that so that we can look at the, the challenges that that might result in. But that is really the requirement right now, because what I'm saying, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to ask is, Right now, if a retailer doesn't have a dishwasher and they have paper cups and you, you bring your own mug is one thing, but if you wanted to sit in the, in the shop, the paper cup that you used before is now 25 cents if you stay there. If there is a requirement to move to sort of a glass mug or a mug that you would just leave there, then they would require a commercial dishwasher. So um, yeah, you are just sorry, you're out, you're out of time. But um, if you were, right, I'll go share, back on the queue. Yeah, that's great. That that would be good. You can expect that question will come up again. Thank you. Moving on to Councillor Bly, up to five minutes. Go ahead. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and thank you, Albert, for the um, presentation and the work on this. I just actually have a couple quick, hopefully simple questions. In recommendation day A, it talks about exemption. Um, exempt. Uh, that exempts drinks provided at no cost to customer, cup fee, what have you. And it lists a number of ways, uh, including monetary gift vouchers. Does that include gift cards? That's a good question. I'll ask perhaps Monica to answer that, uh, that question. But uh, our initial belief is that, yes, we will do that. And I think we, what we will do is make sure the bylaw is clear that gift cards would be exempt as well. Okay, so as a consumer, I could go to... Um, you know, a local coffee shop that provides gift cards, which generally the multi, the bigger ones do. And then I can load that for 20 or $30 and keep going about my regular sort of consumer habits, practices of, of perhaps getting single waste and not be subject to the fee. Is that right? Yes. And Andrea, can you address that question, please? Yes. So we need to draft the bylaw amendment and um, I agree we need to be quite careful about how we define free beverages so that it doesn't become a loophole um, like what you just described. Um, so when we draft the bylaw amendment we can review that with um, some... I understand the process but what's the intent? Oh, the intent is to ex um, exempt free beverages um, for the purpose of. I understand that, but is the intent to have a gift card included? Yes or yes or no is really the. It, it's we want to capture the free beverages where it will support people experiencing poverty. Um, so a monetary gift voucher that is provided to a nonprofit and then um, distributed to its community members, we want to include that. But we don't want to include a gift card in the scenario where it can become a loophole. Okay, so if I get, you know, give my nephew a movie pass for a drink and a popcorn, it's not through a charity. It's a gift. It has monetary value. So that is included. 
the, okay. yeah, the challenge with the with writing these yes. exemptions is that, hard to, yeah. <laughs> it might be the challenge with the bylaw, but I appreciate where you're going. So, um, so I'm going to just say that that's a huge flag in recommendation A is that that is still not clear. So it's actually not resolved what that initial issue was that brought we brought this this review was brought forward on the premise that there are all of these inconsistencies. And I just want to state that I, I still don't think that that's clear based on the answer, but we've got a lot of questions, a lot of answers. The staff have more feedback later. Happy to hear it. I'm going to move on. Recommendation C. Does that include it says cold drinks? I think you spoke to that, Albert. Uh, hot drinks and cold drinks. Does that include milkshakes, smoothies? Um, let's go so far as blizzards at Dairy Queen. That is, um, you know, a good question. I think that the, there are some challenges with some types of drinks that we'll have to be careful how we deal with. But in general terms, what we would be looking for over time is for all of those um, to be covered. And exempt from the fee. Uh, not specifically over time, they would be all required to have the fee. Okay, so I'm going to have to bring a cup in that can work with a blizzard machine. That just yeah, that's, that's going to be a challenge. And, you know, ultimately, in the longer term, um, we may find that there are cup share programs that develop for that sort of thing. But okay. um, I'm just gonna, I think Andrea can provide a, a bit more detail on that as well. I, I'm just going to keep going for time. I just want to highlight that these are these are this is another really important piece that was in the initial review that I don't think is addressed in the report. And I just want to touch on one more before my time is out. And that's drive through and food delivery apps. So we've heard through restaurant associations, individual, um, and these are these are multinational corporations that are clearing close to probably two million dollars in additional revenue because of this fee. I would say annually that it would be a very conservative estimate, um, and they are saying absolutely no way does this work with the drive-through model, and absolutely no way does this work with um, food delivery apps based on how it's designed. And I don't see any of that addressed in this report either. Okay, Monica and Andrew have discussed this with the businesses. Monica, can you, can you step down on this? Sure, so we're in discussion with, with large um, chains and the food delivery companies. And we know that uh, some who have cup share are piloting cup share for a drive-through as well. Food delivery services are interested in exploring this. So we see this as an early transition issue and there are um, signs of innovation on the horizon. That to me doesn't give me any confidence that it's actually happening based on the fact that I appreciate that staff are, are sort of, you know, endorsing the, the model as it is. But for us as counselors, and I've certainly been engaging, I know other counselors have too, that is not consistent with what we've heard. So unless you could email a confidential update with who you are actually referring to in terms of a business that's complying um, with this in a drive through model or a food delivery app, I don't mean to not believe what staff are saying, but sort of speaking in generalities. Yeah. We're to reply. I'm so sorry. I've, I've neglected to look at the time. You have run over time. You can get yourself it's back on I. the list. Thank you. Counselor Fry, go ahead. To five. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, staff, for this uh, presentation. I guess, uh, I guess, right off the top, um, you, you brought up the bag, the plastic bags. Are, are we still anticipating a federal plastic bag ban that's going to be rolling out for uh, the end of this year? Yes, Monica. You know the timing of that. So if you could jump in. Uh, the, my understanding is that currently they're consulting on a ban on manufacturing and importing plastic bags by the end of this year, and then the, ba the ban on selling and distribution would be in 2023, the year after that. Right. So we're, we're, we're just a bit ahead of the curve here, but this is something that's coming down the pipe for everybody in Canada. Um, Correct. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, on the, uh, Albert mentioned uh, stadiums and theaters being one of the challenges as far as safety, or, or I, f I forget what the exact issue was, but I, f I find that interesting because to me that seems like the low-hanging fruit where we have essentially what is a closed-loop system where there's no need for a disposable cup because you're literally not leaving the facility. You're within there, and that seems like the optimal opportunity for uh, reusables. Can you expand on what the issue is on that particular front? Yeah, it's throwing the cups. 
Right. So you know, it's a similar situation to, you know, when you go to a BC place, for example, and you get a beer, it's in a plastic cup. Uh, they don't want people throwing bottles or cans or things like that on the field. And the same would apply in a theater. If there's displeased <laughs> participants, perhaps they might end up throwing the cup. But that, that tends to be at the root of it more so than, than um, you know, some of the other challenges. It's, it's more protecting the, the participants right. and in a sporting event, protecting the players. Which, which seems fairly easy to remedy, I would think, with just a lighter weight plastic cup that is still reusable. But I'll, 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 yep. table, I'll table that one. That seems to me like the low-hanging fruit that we could really kind of capitalize on here. Um, curious, but so one of the big elements of confusion. So, I mean, I've certainly heard a lot from uh, talking to businesses that they didn't feel that they understood where the money was supposed to go, how this was all supposed to work. And I, and I think that there may have been a, a, a bit of a communications gap, especially over the year that we had to additionally roll this out. I'm curious, A, if, if, a, if, if you can identify where some of the communications fails may have happened in rolling this out to really get the, the business community on board. And also, if, if there's been any contemplation of how we might pivot with this fee and really even creating sort of a voluntary fund at the city. So I appreciate we can't collect a fee, but if we were to say create a, a cup fund at the city of Vancouver that McDonald's or whoever would be encouraged to contribute to that could A, offset the, 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 the waste and um, costs impacts, but also even to you know brand and create a, a reusable program uh, with the help of the city and this fund. Has, has that been contemplated at all? I think it, uh, on the issue of the fees, if Grant, Grant Murray can step on the, on the city's legal ability to do some of these things, I think that's where we ran into some challenges on directing how the fees be used. Grant, are you there? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was just uh, on mute. Um, sorry, it's Grant Murray with uh, the law department. Um, we certainly are allowed to charge uh, business license fees and uh, this appeared to be more of a tax and it's not one of the taxes that we're authorized to have them pay to us so the idea was that the money would go to the businesses and the businesses would uh, spend it in a manner that they saw fit we didn't direct in any manner how that was supposed to be done but we i don't understand that we could say you must charge 25 cents for a cup and the money must come to the city there uh, there are some uh, other alternatives that weren't uh, done here, but um, uh, they all suffered from extraordinarily complex, extraordinary complexity. And the idea is simply that you have to charge this. Uh, it's essentially not a fee, really. It's uh, the price for your cup, and they get to keep the money. But well, similar to a, a community amenity contribution, which is a development fee that is technically voluntary, could we create sort of a voluntary opportunity for strongly suggesting that that businesses might invest their cup fees into something like a reusable program that the city runs? Well, the community amenity contributions are voluntary, but they're also asking for a legislative change. And that's why, uh, you know, basically sweeten the pie or we won't cut the deal. Whereas in these circumstances, they're already subject to the rules and they aren't asking anything from us. If we were to encourage people to spend it in a particular manner, I don't see that that would be improper, but I don't know that we could target that it had to be required to be spent in a certain manner without running into uh, well, what could be some complicated issues as to whether it is in fact a tax, right? Sorry, uh, the, the city is, does not have well, a great tax uh, authority, well, property well, taxes again. basically. Over time, I'm sorry, Councillor Fry, you can get back on the list if you like. Councillor Weeb, go ahead. Yeah, uh, first of all, I just want to thank staff for the quick turnaround and the just transition that this report really provides. So it's amazing on so many levels. Uh, and the speakers we have, I'm excited to listen to. Uh, my question is really on the pilot low barrier cup share. This is really interesting to me. I want to know, are we looking at funding the capital cost for small businesses to be able to provide cup share? Are we looking at more providing cups to the vulnerable population so they can have that deposit fee paid for so they can be involved in a cup share program. And you had an example of a particular type of community cup program? 
Yeah, I can speak to that. So um, when we spoke to the cup share providers, we did ask um, about low barrier options. And so we heard um, they each have different business models. Some are already more low barrier and low cost. Um, but th there's a number of things that we could pilot through the existing cup share programs in Vancouver to see what um, is a good fit for people experiencing poverty and living with low incomes. So we'd be looking for ideas that we can test quickly together with existing cup share programs. Okay, um, and I see that Binners is one of the speakers. Is there, obviously some people will get one of the cup shares, might leave them and put them around. Are we looking at this as an opportunity for recyclables and for a low barrier employment where people can come and grab these if they are left around the city um, as we try to remove the 80 million single use items? So do we see this as an opportunity to collect some of the ones that do get left around the city? Uh, Councillor, can I clarify, are you, ex are you um, asking about the cup shares? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that some people will I, leave their cup shares around, and I'm just wondering, is there an ability to look at making sure they do fall in the circular economy here in Vancouver? And I guess second question would be, how do we see our circular economy capacity to ensure that we have enough cup share programs? Do we see a lot of innovation happening here in the city of Vancouver, and can you speak to that? Um, I will. I will say on the collection of cup shares and through an organization like the Vineyards Project, certainly that would be something we could we could explore and consider. And on the other part, Andrea, do you have any further comments on the innovation in the cup share program? I think based on what we've seen in other jurisdictions, Vancouver is really leading the way on growing cup share. We have a number of businesses in the city, and more have reached out to us expressing interest to also um, start operations here. Uh, so I think we're very encouraged by the amount of innovation we're seeing in cup share in Vancouver. We have three cup share uh, speakers registered to, uh, to speak today. I know. I saw that's exciting. It's exciting that some of the large companies are starting to look at cup share and piloting here in Vancouver. So thanks a lot for the support. Thanks, Councillor Weaven, for coming in under time. Great. Councillor Swanson, up to five minutes. Yeah, I just have some questions about the actual cup share programs. Um, is the idea that a company would get some uh, cups and then give them to their customers and then the customers would return them and what i'm wondering is would the cup be usable for like a blizzard and a cup of coffee or and also um i'm i'm suspecting that the companies would put their logos on them so if you had like a starbucks logo on the cup would mcdonald's fill it up so I, those are kind of some of the questions i have Right, Speak to this. Yeah, so there, um, there's a number of different models in the cup share programs that are in Vancouver. Um, so they each operate a bit differently, um, but to, taken together, they um, are able to offer programs for hot drinks and cold drinks and smoothies. One of them even has a cup share solution for wine, um, and each of them are differently working on options for in-store pickup, drinks or, or, that are ordered ahead, and drive-through and delivery. At least one cup share program is testing cups that can be used for bubble tea drinks. Um, others are looking at um, ice cream and, and frozen desserts. So we're seeing a lot of different options come through with cup share. They're all different cups, though. Yeah, each cup share program has their own style of cup. But um, if a business accepts clean, reusable cups and a customer brings a cup to that business and it's clean, um, then it would be like if um, a customer comes with their own personal travel mug to a business and, and wants it filled as long as it's clean and the business should be able to fill it. Uh, OK, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Swampson. Councillor Dominato, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks for the presentation and update. That's really helpful. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, can you remind me um, which other jurisdictions have cut fees in place and where the funds go that are derived from those cut fees? Again, we're the first jurisdiction with this sort of a program. And uh, Andrea, do you have any further details that you can provide? I know there was a program in the California. Yeah, the, 
the other jurisdictions um, that we're aware of that have a cup fee, um, so in the US or two, one of which is Berkeley, the businesses also keep the revenue from the fees. Sorry, you said Berkeley, so they keep the, the, the revenue and sorry, Ber was Berkeley, yeah, the businesses keep the revenue from the fees. The other is Bainbridge Island, Washington, and their businesses also keep the revenue from the cup fees. And anywhere, other jurisdictions beyond those two? Like um, European, um, like because I, anyways, I won't give the context because there's a, we yeah. don't have a lot of time. Not at this time that I'm aware of. I know a number of places are consulting and exploring cut fees, including um, Scotland. Okay. Um, did we um, explore uh, a working relationship with uh, the province and NCorp around a deposit refund model? That is something that certainly is outside of our jurisdiction. We have had discussions with Encorp and uh, not so much with the province, but that would require changes in provincial legislation and it would re require Encorp to participate in the program. Uh, Monica, you've been involved with Encorp if you have a few comments. Sir. Yeah, I, I chair the uh, advisory committee for Encorp. And I think one of the things to, to keep in mind is that um, a deposit refund system wouldn't reduce cups. It would increase the amount of cups that would be collected for recycling, but wouldn't reduce them. And the other challenge is, is that when you collect that large volume of cups, there's a very limited market at this time for recycling cups. So I think it's something that um, would be something that would be complementary to the city's fee for recycling the cups that are in use, but it would take several years to establish. Okay, thank you. Um, can you comment on um uh, our knowledge of the cup share programs that were in existence prior to the bylaw and and also those that might have been in the planning phase and it comes from some work I was doing last fall around where industry was already going in this regard and so I'm just curious if you could comment on do we have a sense of how many programs were already in existence and and or were being planned anyways regardless of the bylaw Andrew Hi. I can speak to that. Um, I mean, I think what we we knew that there were some in development. One national chain was had um, was exploring it, and um, there were one or two local companies that were um, starting to roll out their programs. But we've seen a lot of growth, and I think also um, the national chain really, I think, invested in their infrastructure in Vancouver, seeing that the fee was coming and will be um, using the, the fee to finance the program and for promotions. And then we're also seeing um, some other programs that haven't been announced yet where because of the cut fee, they'll be looking at um, rolling out infrastructure to pilot in outdoor spaces and, and venues. Uh, and another large multinational chain is looking at that as well. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, and then, uh, when when we first dealt with this report, we um, I moved an amendment with respect to ensuring uh, that we had uh, sort of an awareness campaign, uh, particularly visible in, in uh, points of sale locations where people would be aware is that you could go and ask for uh, a ceramic mug if you're going in to have a cup of coffee or to encourage customers uh, to bring uh, their own. And I'm curious if we considered, I, I saw the, the, the packages we prepared for industry, but I'm curious if we considered mandating that in the bylaw, that that be a requirement, um, that there be information made available within retail locations as well as online uh, to, again, increase awareness for the public. Because I think the public's actually already been moving this direction for some time, um, but it's not a requirement to my knowledge in the bylaw. Yes, it's not a requirement in the bylaw at this point in time. We found very good cooperation with the businesses. And uh, Monica, Andrew, if you want to jump in with any further comments on that, that'd be. We've considered it, but uh, at this point in time, we haven't recommended it. Okay, thank you. The, the bio, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to add the bylaw does require that businesses display uh, on menus, menu board, and ordering platform what the amount of the fee is, um, but the, yeah, there is not a requirement to display other signage and messaging. Okay, so it's just about the fee. That, that, okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Dominato. Councillor Chair, Kirby. Chair, this is Councillor Bly. I wonder if I can just raise a point of privilege. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to um, advise Council uh, and, and our staff um, that I unfortunately do have to leave the meeting as a representative um, for Vancouver on the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities 
There are um, significant meetings happening this morning, one of which I chair that starts in five minutes. So although I moved this review and this report is coming forward, it is with um, an enormous amount of regret. I cannot stay at this particular moment. So I will be absolutely back as of noon or one o'clock whenever um, committee reconvenes. Okay, thank you for that information. Um, you were on the list for questions, but I have got Councillor uh, Kirby Young on the list now. Um, I'm, I'm happy to have Councillor Kirby Young. As I say, the meeting starts in four minutes. Okay. So I will have Great. to go. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor uh, Kirby Young. I'm just going to reset your timer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a number of questions, so I'm hoping for um, just quick responses here. And my understanding is that Saanich exempted their drive through and their bylaw. Do we give any consideration to that? Because I've also heard from um, industry that, and I quote, this is paraphrasing feedback I've got back, that drive throughs are a non-starter. So do we consider treating drive through differently? Well, from our research, we didn't understand that uh, Sandwich had something different than we do. All the other municipalities that we surveyed and, and considered uh, for the bags were... were I'm not, talking, uh, I'm, I'm specifically speaking about cups. Uh, can't really comment on Sandwich's approach on cups because it's, it's, as far okay. as we know at this point in time, they haven't got a byline place. Okay, so, and then in terms of the recommendations, because there's sort of extended periods of time, differing periods of time, four months or so for before requiring businesses to allow a customer to bring their own cup or a year and a half, 18 months, kind of pulling us close to the end of 2023 before a cup share might be mandated. So you're suggesting that businesses still continue to clock the 25 cent fees. They're still racking up that revenue in the meantime. Is that right? But they don't have to provide either alternative. That would be the case. And only, I mean, that the issue around the, the um, requiring businesses to, to have reusables available is really to allow those times or that time for the businesses that don't have their plan in place, had a different type of approach prior to the pandemic. Uh, if I can jump in, the, most businesses based on the field review that we did are providing options for reusables. So uh, it's not that we think businesses will be charging the fee without giving options to avoid the fee. So why uh, would we, can I, jump, can I jump in then just because I want to be efficient with time. Um, if you think that most businesses are doing it now, why would we not put the requirements in sooner? Why would we give such long extended periods of time? Because I've heard different things in the presentation that about business readiness equals downloading or businesses are not ready and need the more time. And then I hear the comment and I'm trying to synthesize these different pieces of information. Then I hear the comment that, no, we think most businesses are doing it. So is it, which one is it? Like, is it that they are doing it and we can put it in place now or is it that they're not and they're not ready and they need this long period of time? I think what we've done is recommend that July 1st, because of the different types of businesses that may need to get their health program uh, approved, a council can certainly choose a different date. If you feel it is more important to go earlier, that is certainly uh, the prerogative of council. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to go back to two points, and I'm going to start with the fee and going back, to, I think, to Grant um, on the legal side, and I want, to, I want an explicit answer um, to make sure that I understood what you said previously. You said to the effect that, and this is with respect to the suggestion raised by Councillor Fry, for example, could it be a voluntary or could this, the city collect this fee? And you said essentially it created to a price per cup. The city doesn't have the ability to set pricing for private business, correct? And the second part of that question is, and I want it explicitly answered and so it's really clear, do we have the ability to collect the 25 cent fee? So two parts there. Can we set pricing and could we collect the fee? Sorry, the city has been sued about imposing uh, prices in the past and prevailed. Uh, in fact, uh, we're currently before the courts on the vacancy control because it's essentially a form of price control. Our position is, is that uh, price control is possible under our business uh, powers. Um, the second part of your question about uh, the money going to us our understanding is that that would be essentially a tax and it's not a tax that's authorized under the Vancouver Charter. So when we have consumers following through on that, when we have consumers saying, why doesn't the city, for example, collect the fee and put it into a green fund? So at least I know where it's going as a consumer. You're saying, and I just, so it's clear because we get this, asked this a lot, the city does not have the power to do that. That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Back, thank you. 
Um, back to the comment around with respects to the province, and following up on Councillor Fry's comment, and I agree with him when he said it's coming anyway with the federal regulations this year, but I just want to be clear, that's related to bags, not to cups. And so following up on Councillor Dominato's question about engaging with the province, how, why wouldn't we have meaningfully engaged with the feds or the province to look at a harmonized application for a cup strategy? Why would we not pursue that potentially? Well, I think as Monica said, one of the challenges with the deposit return system for cups is it doesn't actually reduce the number of cups that are used and disposed of. The other challenge is how do we recycle those cups when there's no Sorry, real Albert, market? maybe I can clarify no. my question. I'm I not sitting, when I say a harmonized cup strategy, I'm not suggesting it's a returnable. I'm saying like a harmonized strategy with respect to prohibiting, for example, or for requiring cup share. Why would we not try to look at a harmonized opportunity? A very we quick do. answer, very quick. We do. We advocate this through the federal and provincial government. We find that their regulations tend to follow municipal regulations. So we're encouraging them, but they're, they're taking our lead. Great. Thank you so much. Councillor Boyle, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Um, a, a couple of the questions I had have been asked. So I'm just wondering, I heard a bit of feedback um, that this was having an impact on free or low-cost meal programs, including city-funded programs. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can speak to uh, if that's true, whether that's true, what we're, what we're doing about it. Yes, thanks for that question, Councillor. It, it, it has been an issue. And we found that early on in the bylaws when uh, when free uh, food vouchers were handed out at one particular location and residents were charged the cup fee. That's why we've put in the recommendation to exempt any free um, beverages or uh, for a number of reasons uh, from the fee. Okay. In addition, charitable food services are exempt from yes. the requirement to charge the cup fee. Okay, and it doesn't have an impact um, on uh, meal programs that are doing primarily uh, takeaway food rather than eat in during COVID, like uh, Evelyn Zoller or the Carnegie Center, there's no impact there no in terms impact of there. costs? No, no impact there. Okay, okay, appreciate just being reassured on that. Um, um, and I'm just reading over my notes, but I, I will leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Boyle. Councillor DiGenova, go ahead up to your, uh, on the second round. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm going to use an example of a, a sort of retailer that is falls into the nonprofit because it's a social enterprise, because they've come to speak to us about single use of, you know, takeaway containers before. Um, actually, I think it was in the last term, and it's potluck. So, for instance, are they able to still have donations? of cups and all, do they have to charge on top of that on their catering order for using those cups when they put them out or do they not have to charge? Now this is a social enterprise that's uh, focused on nonprofit services. Yes, they but I mean they, they would also be serving the larger community in, in as a retailer. So I just want to make sure that I, I do understand that, you know, charitable organizations that are handing out free food or that are, are selling food to vulnerable people at a discount. But what about social enterprises that may actually be retailing, but what they're using their revenue for is, is for uh, good in the community or charitable types of, of activities? Yeah, the, the bylaw does exempt uh, charitable organizations from the provision of the, or for the requirement for the fee. So they should not have to uh, charge a fee when they distribute their, their products. But that is something we'll take a look at to make sure that in dealing with this, the situation that we cover off those types of situations. Okay. Just in case there's any confusion. We did run into some confusion initially in the bylaw with Evelyn Solar Gathering Place um, and those types of organizations. They were reassured that they are exempt from the bylaw and we will formally change the bylaw to make sure that those organizations are identified. So in this particular situation, Councillor, if you can pass us the name of the organization, we will we'll take a look at it and make sure it's addressed. Okay. I'm, I'm just asking overall because I've had these questions come to me. And sure. also on the communication front, I'm hearing from retailers that they're not, they're not quite sure as to how they're supposed to do this. And also, 
I want to ask the question, how much time is it going to take them to provide a report to the city of Vancouver, especially the mom and pop shops? I mean, if we're asking for them to report back on this to the city, what time commitments are we expecting or requiring of them? We haven't specified a time commitment in the in the bylaw, and really it's for those businesses that wouldn't be involved in a cup share program of some sort. That was a way for them to avoid the, the requirement for reporting. Okay, and and so, then if if they're not in a cup share program, because as I said, if they are, they it's a it's an ex upfront expense to them. Is, is yeah. there? We expect it would be very simple. Uh, just a couple questions on the business license renewal application. Okay, and and is there a reason? Like I've actually heard of people who are on the border of Burnaby and East Van, and they they will go to Burnaby now instead of supporting some of the East Van retailers for this reason because it adds up for them or for whatever reason. I'm just wondering, have we looked at sort of the impact of not doing this regionally or not working together with Metro Vancouver or the Ministry of Environment to kind of do this? I mean, yes, there, this is moving forward federally with plastic bags, but have we have we reached out and said, let's do something together regionally okay. instead of just inside Vancouver? We have been working with Metro Vancouver and um, they have adopted a regionally harmonized approach for municipal single use item bylaws and they're very consistent with Vancouver's and my understanding is City of Burnaby is looking at this as well. Okay, but right now the City of Vancouver is the only city that charges a cup fee on a single use beverage cup. For cups, right. yes. And, and, the, and the reason we're bringing forward the recommendation for businesses to accept the uh, customer's reusable cups is that so that people can avoid the fee. Um, I'm just going to leave it there right now because I'm, yes, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. Um, we're still going to be dealing with health issues in July. Um, so handling other people's cups puts workers at risk. This could be a liability issue. Uh, can a worker refuse to handle a customer's cup uh, if they do not feel it's clean enough? If someone gets sick doing this, can they sue the city? What about portion control? How do businesses charge? Um, can you answer any of these questions for me? I can answer this. Mm -hmm. um, the public health guidelines do allow businesses to accept reusable cups and fill reusable cups from customers. That's been in place since, or clarified by BC Center, Center of Disease Control since June of 2020. Um, we have worked with Vancouver Coastal Health to develop what's called a contactless cup procedure. It was actually modeled after large chains that have been using it around the world where you could put your, a, a customer could put their travel mug into another larger ceramic mug or another container. So they don't, it, they don't actually have to touch the customer's cup. So we've, we've been reassured by health authorities that this is an acceptable practice and um, we're putting that information out through our toolkit. And finally, are there any other ways that you can be tracking uh, companies to see if, if their funds are going to be put uh, towards green initiatives? Councillor Kirby Young touched on this earlier, but I think again, it, it's gonna be something that's gonna come up frequently. We're doing this, how do we know for sure where the money's going? I'd have to defer to Grant on any questions related to that. Sorry, it's uh, Grant Murray with Legal Services. Um, typically, if we ask for information from a business or anybody, it has to be for the purposes of enforcing a bylaw. If we don't have a requirement that the money be spent in a particular way, we cannot uh, ask for that information. That was uh, made clear in the uh, 1980s in a couple of court cases. So my understanding is that if we mandated that it be spent in a certain way, it would be improper and asking them how they spent it is also unlawful because we don't require that they spend it in a particular manner. If they were to volunteer the information, there would be nothing improper about that. But generally speaking, the government can't ask for information that has nothing to do with any of its bylaws. So it's toothless. Well, it's not toothless if you ask them to volunteer. People uh, frequently volunteer information uh, but if we don't have a rule about how it's supposed to be spent, then there isn't any ability to ask for the information about how it's spent. 
And we are seeing businesses respond to customer demand, customer demand for that transparency. And the reason that we have recommendation D is so that we can put in place, you know, ideally those long-term conditions to signal to businesses that they ought to be using those funds for providing reasonable uh, cups for drinks to stay and to go. What if you don't see satisfactory uptake and compliance? Well, so we are monitoring that, and I think that that's something we could report back to Council with. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, the subject was brought up earlier about um, uh, recommendation D and, and drive throughs, but I'm curious if um, in our consultation and engagement, we talked with really small footprint organizations, whether they be food trucks, the chai wagon, the coffee carts, and um, the implications for those very small organizations have a very small, you know, square footage and footprint overall, but this the ability for them to um, operationalize uh, towards that cup share model and whether that was part of the consultation. We did include food trucks in the our consultation on developing the bylaws. Um, that's also why we've developed the contactless cup procedure so that businesses, they don't need a lot of space to be able to handle reusable cups brought in by customers. And that is also why we're um, recommending that 18 month period for the longer term requirements around providing cups, uh, reusable cups to stay or to go just to make sure that we understand those implications before uh, bringing recommendations forward. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Councillor Dominato. Councillor Kirby Young. Um, I'm going to wait, Chair. I'll put. Has anybody else not had a first round right now? Uh, um, people, oh, I think everyone's been on a first round. Yes, I know. She asked about first round, though. So I think that everybody's been on a first round. We are now in the second round. Okay. Am I the only one on? Because right now, suddenly just. Oh, no. no well, there were on. other people with second round. For example, Councillor DiGenova. Okay. Um, I'm still trying to get my head around this notion of business readiness, and can you expand a little bit on why you would define business readiness as downloading kits? There's two aspects of business readiness. Well, first was downloading kits, which is gave, gave us an indication that businesses were preparing. For the, uh, for the bylaws to come into effect. And so the extrapolation of that, when we see 60% of the businesses downloading the material beforehand, you know, our assumption is that they are getting ready for the bylaw to come in place. Even with the ones that, do, that uh, downloaded it after the bylaw came into effect, they are in a preparation mode, getting ready for the bylaw requirements. They may not be quite ready, but they are preparing. And so, you know, when we see that sort of uptake early in the process, it gives us an indication that businesses are getting ready and that they will be ready when the time comes. Okay. Uh, the second part of this, when we followed up with the 87 businesses during this last few weeks, we found again, good, good indication of businesses being ready. What we found also though, was some inconsistencies for smaller franchises, local franchises. There were some inconsistencies between individual operators. And so, you know, we, we know that the large percentage of those we talked to were ready. Um, there are still those that are getting ready, if you will. Okay, I've got two more questions I want to fit in. And one is with respect to uh, recommendation A, and it's with respect to meal vouchers, um, because it, the, the language in the recommendation says exempting free drink vouchers. But what about a meal combo? Because sometimes, it, you know, to lower income people, they're being given... Um, a voucher that is for a breakfast sandwich or a muffin and a coffee. And so I yeah, see and here, for example, changes. a drink voucher, is is it an oversight or is it not intended to cover a situation like that? Or is somebody going to have to produce two different vouchers? So here's one for a coffee and here's one for a breakfast sandwich. No, no, it's intended to be included. So that uh, if it's a free food voucher, for example, uh, a breakfast sandwich and a coffee, the, co the coffee cup would not be charged the fee. Okay. And so what we have to do is make sure we're in the language and the bylaw, when we put the bylaw forward, that that's very clear. But okay. the intent is for anything like that, there is no cup fee. Okay, thanks, Albert. Um, my next question is really around drilling into small business. Um, and the comment was made during the presentation that taking away the fee would disadvantage small business. But then there was another comment that some outlets, and I've observed this too at several different locations, I think we've all gone out and tried to do our own observation homework, are actually discounting drinks. Um, so that their prices are not higher. So they're not essentially 
you receiving that revenue anyway. So how do you square those statements? So there, there's two aspects. One, when we said that um, it would disadvantage local businesses, what it meant was those local businesses that are already prepared, prepared and and um, using reusables and uh, implementing the bylaw. The, we didn't see an issue really with companies discount, or organizations discounting the cup, the, the uh, drink fee to cover off the cup, as long as the fee is identified separately on the receipt, because that's really what people will see. They'll see the receipt. They'll know that they've got uh, a cup fee there. They can avoid the... Uh, they can avoid the... But the business... Um, but just, I hear what you're saying, but the business is still netting the same amount of revenue if they're discounting the price. Because you, there was a statement met, right, and I think originally in the earlier report that the rationale for letting the businesses keep the revenue, other than we've clarified now that legally the city can collect it, the rationale was that it could go towards these alternatives. But my point is, what I'm trying to get at, is that the businesses are not keep, they're not generating that revenue if they're discounting their drink fee. They're not netting any more revenue. Yeah, those are individual business decisions. It's really not something that is covered by the bylaw. They, we can't mandate them necessarily. We haven't mandated them necessarily to charge a fixed fee for a, for a drink plus the cup fee. Those are individual business decisions. Seems to be a bit of a hole. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Fry. Yeah, thanks. Um, so just to, to close the loop on a couple of things here. Um, so we definitely heard that there was some challenges with the rollout of this and, and some of the smaller businesses felt that they didn't understand what was what they were supposed to do, how they were supposed to do it. Looking back, have we identified where some of those communications gaps happened and, and how we're, we're, we're filling those gaps and, and, and where things may have gone a little off? Well, I think what happened is because all of the preparatory work and all of the initial public consultation and public outreach and, and um, the communication work with all the organizations uh, happened before the pandemic and was geared towards bringing in the cup fees and the bag fees in January of 2021. And through the whole course of the pandemic, you know, there, there were not the same efforts put into advising business other than we continue to send out letters to all the businesses multiple times to let them know the bylaw was coming, the toolkits were available, and that uh, they were able to download them free of charge. And we continue to outreach with the business associations and various organizations at a higher level. So, you know, I don't know that it was anything that was specifically missed as much as a time-related issue. Okay, so if we had the resources, uh, presumably say if we had a, a, a voluntary fund where people were contributing their cup fee, smaller businesses, they're saying, I, I, I want to see this move forward. How, how could we imagine, and I know we're going to hear from some of the reusable cup share folks coming, and I, I know that there's a great deal of infrastructure that is rolling out right now to support this work, and I also know that the Binners Project are going to be here, and they're looking for, you know, opportunities as well, and like... Do you foresee an opportunity? So full disclosure, I came, I walked here today and I, I grabbed a coffee en route. And of course, uh, I had to pay the 25 cents for my disposable. It was a great coffee though. And I was walking, so I was happy to, you know, I was lightening my carbon footprint otherwise. But, um, you know, it, it dawned on me. It's like, well, there's nowhere for me to deposit this. Does the city, do we have an imagination about how we could better support cup share and reusable as a, as a, integrated city service almost, or support that? I, I think what you could do, Councillor, is, is Councillor council could direct us to explore that further. I, I think at the same time, um, if I could just add that, you, you know, it, this fee is not meant to generate revenue. It's meant for, for businesses to, or for consumers to avoid the fee with, with um, using the reasonable alternatives. And again, it's, it's, it's challenging because there are pilots that are in development by the private sector at this time, and they are using the, the fee that they are collecting currently on the cup fees to develop that type of infrastructure. So it's, it's very challenging because these are early days and, and the organizations aren't ready to speak publicly about them yet, but I, I think we will be seeing more such infrastructure and programs soon. When you say soon, Monica, what's, what, how soon is now to reference Our understanding this? is... March, April, or is when there are intended to be some announcements. Oh, that is hopeful. Okay. Fantastic. 
Uh, do, do we see any other opportunities for the city to support that ecosystem, though, and, and, and create even not garbage bins, but you know how we have the sort of recycle spots on the garbage bins? Do we see any opportunity to help support a more universality, working with all the various players? I, I think that's why we have the recommendation to um, look at low barrier programs for the uh, cup share programs for those that are economically disadvantaged. And I, and I think, you know, the idea there is that we find ways of supporting the, uh, the cup share programs in a fashion that allows them to be delivered in a more universal fashion. It also provides an opportunity that we may find you know, from an imagination point of view, as you, as you mentioned, that the larger businesses, particularly the multinationals, are looking for opportunities to support low-income community. They may participate in that. Do but I think it would be challenging for us to develop a voluntary fund at this point in time without further investigation and, and consideration of how it could happen. Yeah, I think other types of support are in-kind support, for example, for space for bins. I keep losing you guys cut out. but So we do have the capacity to do this if we had a bit more direction and, and that kind of thing, though. Ten seconds to answer. Something that could be definitely considered, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to follow up um, the question around public awareness. And um, there's a couple of us here on Council that serve on uh, both zero waste and liquid waste committees with Metro Vancouver. And, and one of the focuses there has been around uh, public awareness, whether it be um, related to um, clothing disposal or in the case of liquid waste around um, educating the public about things that shouldn't go in your toilet or things that shouldn't go down your drain. And I've heard from industry that there was an appetite to engage in uh, public awareness campaigns. And I'm curious if that ever came up in our initial dialogue around dealing with the waste, because we all know fundamentally we have to deal with it, but around shifting consumer behavior through a very strategic marketing campaign around, um, you know, use a, get into a reusable cup, engaging industry around the cup share programs, but doing it through um, education proactive. And, and did that come up? Was that considered as a part of a suite of options? Yes, and it's actually in development. So we started a public awareness campaign in November about these bylaws coming into effect and, it, and the first phase focused on here, the fees are coming, bring your own cup, bring your own bag. Um, and then uh, starting this spring, we have the second phase and it will be really focused on that behavior change aspect of bring your own cup, bring your own reusable bag. Thank you. But did, I guess to be more specific, did we consider doing that in advance of the bylaw without a cup fee? So did we consider here, let's try to bring and shift that behavior by education and making people more aware? Because certainly for me, that was a good big compelling piece to start carrying around my own um, reusable mug every time I went out until the pandemic and then they wouldn't, retailers weren't taking it for a time, but it was through education and increased awareness. And so I made that change myself um, without a cup fee. So that's what I'm getting at. Did we consider that as a tool regardless of the bylaw? A uh, simple answer to that is yes. We do a lot of public education uh, geared towards behavior change and Prior to the bylaws coming to an, into effect, there was a lot of effort put into the development of our Zero Waste 2040 plan that involved extensive public consultation, business consultation across the board, and, and included in that was a significant amount of public outreach. Uh, I would say since the pandemic, we haven't done as much. We do as much as we can around these sorts of things, given the restrictions that we're faced with. Uh, but it is a, a regular part of our programs. We have a public outreach group within solid waste that also goes to schools and provides a lot of information in, on zero waste and waste reduction and reusables directly to kids in the school. So it's an area of significant focus uh, uh, for us. So I often say we, we are no longer in the business of service delivery, we're in the business of behavior change. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Kirby Young. Can I move for a third round, Chair? Uh, that's so been the rules to move for a third round. Let me just check. Um, I there's a, a different vote on that. It's not just can, a, okay because I have limited time. A clerk, maybe you can respond if there's a possibility of this. Okay, there. The third time we have to have a motion. Yeah. Okay, and it's a simple majority. Okay, so you're moving for a third round. Yes, it's a simple Thank majority. You. I'll just test first. Yay, 
Um, if you would like okay. to third round. Any nays? Okay, you have a third round. Okay, yes, thanks. go ahead, Councillor, because you only have 15 seconds on the second round, so go ahead. We'll reset your... Um, well, you have... Okay, I'll just reset that timer. Can I start now, Chair? Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the questions I have is with respect to consultation, and I'm wondering um, if staff can speak to if the BIAs were consulted and which BIAs. Yes, they were, and I think Monica has some more detail on that. Oh, you're muted, Monica. Yes, we did consult BIAs. When we developed the bylaws, we um, we did uh, have to select um, or sample select uh, different groups of stakeholders because it was such an in-depth consultation. Um, my recollection is it was, uh, I think, six BIAs, but I'd have to go back and check the list for which ones. Are we able to and get that? And then, uh, yes, we can. And uh, And then we shared the report with everyone. Okay, because if we can get that information, it would be really helpful because I'm hearing from a number of them that they were not and they're not aware of their peers that were consulted. So I'm wondering, what did we actually, it would be helpful to know how broad that consultation was and who was consulted, but what did we actually hear from them? Well, we've seen BIAs get more involved in the programs. We see the downtown BIA, for example, getting involved in the cup share program. Now, bear in mind that a lot of this consultation before the bylaws came into place was in 2018 and early 2019. So, you know, it could be that uh, that long ago there may be different staff there now um, at the head of the BIA. And okay, so but, may but not it, be in, aware in general, that. what I'm hearing is that the BIAs were not supportive of the bylaw, and I think that they are supportive of proactive measures like encouraging their businesses to start um, cup share programs such as the DVBIA and capitalizing on that consumer interest. But I, I'm really wanting to drill back into, did you hear that the BIAs or the few that you spoke to supported the bylaw? Back at the time, from what I recall, we didn't hear any objections, uh, but we'll look back and come back to you with some more information. If we could get some more information, that would be great because I'm hearing differently. Um, I'm, uh, we, they're pretty active in engaging with council and we chat with them all the time. So I would yeah. really appreciate getting some clarity on that. That would be helpful. Um, and then on the education piece, I'm wondering, you know, and I'm asking this question following up on Councillor Dominato's, and as the former VP of Communications to the Vancouver Aquarium, um, all everything we did to sort of change minds and hearts and behavior was done through um, education. Um, for example, whether it was our cafe and leading with having, you know, compostables well before it was required. The fact that we know stats, like in the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, which is an initiative the aquarium started, now goes nationwide. So I'm really wondering if there's a broader opportunity that isn't captured in this report for education, not just with consumers, and Councillor Dominant touched on that, but with small business. Yes, definitely, and we, we do a lot of that already, and, and we work very closely with Metro Vancouver, and Metro Vancouver is very good at doing more of the proactive communication around different things. We do um, a lot ourselves, but working directly with Metro Vancouver, we share information, we share our... Um, our graphic information and work together with them to get broader representation, not just within Vancouver, but around the region. Okay, um, I'll leave it. I think that that's an untapped um, and there's more potential there. Um, another question I have in hindsight, do you think we should have just waited till after COVID? Well, I think we, we provided recommendations last year to delay it by a year and council directed us to bring it in January, 22, January 1st, 2022. Um, the question of whether we should delay it or not, I think it's kind of a moot point. The bylaws already in place. Do you think, following up on that, do you think it's a moot point now since we're hearing that there are a lot of staff that are still, and small businesses that are still really reluctant, regardless of the health directive, but just because personally people have been through such a lot with COVID and are fearful that, it, you know, we see 60% of people don't necessarily want to go back out socializing into a restaurant now. They're not sure, they're worried when mass mandates are going to come down. This, the human reality and emotion and psychology of it. Do you really think that we're there yet? I think the, at this point, we're just following the direction provided by council. Um, you know, it's council's discretion, should you choose to recommend a delay um, for, for those reasons. But at this point in time, we were just following the direction we gave, or we were given rather. Okay, and I think I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, I appreciate all the responses. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, staff, for um, your uh, diligence in answering all those questions. That was a, that was a lot of questions. Uh, we are now moving on to speakers. And um, 
Our first registered speaker is Sean Miles, the director of the Binners Project, and he is joining us in person. Uh, welcome, Sean. Um, uh, I'll just let you know you have up to five minutes uh, to address a council, and councillors have up to three minutes each to ask you questions. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Chair Carr, and thanks to the councillors. Uh, my name is Sean Miles, and I'm the director of Binners Project. We are a charitable social enterprise that works to destigmatize the work of binners, uh, also known as waste pickers or dumpster divers, as well as provide them with opportunities to earn more income. You might also know Binners Project from our annual Coffee Cup Revolution, a one-day depot providing a refund on coffee cups that was first started in 2014 by the late Ken Leotier as a way to demonstrate Binners' readiness and eagerness to participate in reducing the millions of coffee cups that end up in landfills uh, each, each week. I'm here today as a representative of the more than 150 members of Binners Project, as well as many others experiencing poverty in this city, to request that the 25 cent fee on single-use beverage cups be removed while we work together with city staff to find more equitable solutions to the city's massive coffee cup problem. Uh, in our own consultations with binners, we have heard that adjusting to the new fees on cups was much more difficult than adjusting to the plastic bag ban. Uh, this is in part because of the expense of obtaining reusable coffee mugs or cups and also because of the difficulty in, in keeping them clean. Tote bags, on the other hand, are easier to come by through donation centers and don't require daily cleaning and maintenance. As you might imagine, living in poverty can limit a person's ability to be an environmentalist, given that this often means spending extra money on more expensive alternatives. The same goes for not only bringing in a reusable mug, but also for the ability to participate in a mug sharing system. These systems, as they exist now, are less accessible uh, to those with lower incomes because of the cost up front, uh, along with the stigma that's associated with having lower income. When I was reading this report, I saw that the cup fee was being absorbed completely by the businesses with the intent that it could help fund coffee shops' participation in alternatives like mug sharing programs. However, what this means in practice is that people who cannot access alternatives to single-use cups will be almost singularly responsible for paying into a system that they will never be able to participate in. I also saw in this report a broad assumption that the general lack of complaints should be interpreted as acceptance for the bylaw. As I mentioned, I'm here today uh, representing over 100 binners who strongly oppose this inequitable policy. I may be one voice, but Binners Project works to amplify the voices of folks who often go unheard when these matters come about. Binners are a vulnerable population with a range of uh, features that lock in marginalization, poverty, and political invisibility. Most are dealing with or have previously dealt with addictions, mental health issues, physical disabilities, abuse and or homelessness. They have also been subject to decades of disenfranchisement by inequitable policies. These factors keep in place barriers to full political and social inclusion. The absence of these voices in the development of this policy was a great oversight. However, the absence of them now in your email inboxes and your phone lines should not be taken as a measure of their apathy or acceptance. It should be taken as a measure of their learned helplessness. Even still, this council has an opportunity today to rewrite the script on how policies are implemented in this city. We have seen great strides in the last few years uh, in our community's voices being incorporated into policy development, and we have hoped that more innovative solutions can be generated together. Uh, however, in the interim, while these solutions are developed through community and evidence-based research, we urge council to revoke the fee on single-use cups and by doing so, reverse the unintended harms created by this policy. Thank you. Great. You wouldn't mind staying there. You have a number of councillors um, with questioning. Um, and Councillor Weep, you're first. Go ahead. Up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks, John, a lot for coming to speak today. Um, one of the questions I was asking the staff is that there will be a lot of the cup shares that will be scattered around the city. People forget them. 
do you see a opportunity to be part of that circular economy for the Brenner's project to be able to collect these and return them for a pretty sizable deposit so that we can create an economy that recognizes that we don't want to have a million of these thrown away because it'll actually cause more harm, but have the Brenner's project involved in something like that? Yeah, I, I could see there being potential for that. Um, we have had conversations with organizations like Shareware. Uh, yeah, Shareware's that does do the the, the cups, uh, a, a cup sharing program, and and there could be potential. I think there would be a, a, some work required in determining how that kind of was rolled out. But uh, binners have always been a group that has adjusted to changes in, in kind of what they can collect. And, and you look at milk cartons recently being added to that system. We're already seeing that have an impact positively in the binner community. So if there if there could be potential, and I know there would be willingness on the part of binners to, to be a part of that solution if that was possible. Yeah. Okay. So we have three companies coming today. So it would be helpful if the three of them were to work with binners to look at Absolutely. opportunities. Yeah. Um, the second one is there was a conversation in the report today talking about piloting low barrier cup shares. Um, how do you see your community being involved in what that policy looks like and how do we get members of the public who don't see themselves included in this policy currently involved in a low barrier cup share program? I think the, the first off is in, in trying to consult with those groups directly. And, and we've done, the, the project has done a lot of work in, in helping to facilitate those kinds of conversations with binners, um, with the city with and with other groups that are looking to initiate new policies. And um, so I see that being a first step is, is hearing directly from those individuals on what would be a, a, an effective way to do those things, um, as well as ensuring that uh, whatever that is, is... is uh, widespread enough that you're going to see the uptake you would want on a program like that and, and again, accessible enough. Um, so I think there's a lot of room to, 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 to go with how that might look and, and the, the concern we have is that the work required to put into that until that's in place is still going to mean that those people who can't access a system like this are going to be paying that 25 cents until that, uh, until that is kind of done, until that's a kind of up and running. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Councillor Wee. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, up to three minutes. Hi, Sean. How are you? Thanks, Thanks for being here. Um, do you think? I, I really appreciate you being here to speak, and it's an important, really important perspective because, from my view, the free vouchers doesn't deal with the low income issue sufficiently, and I think that's what you've touched on. So, do you think that two two questions I want to ask you? The first one is: Do you think this is a situation where you see climate initiatives butting up against equity, and we're not considering the equity lens sufficiently? Yeah, I, I, I do think so. And I would also say, and this was noted in the city's own report, um, that the consultation done on this project, uh, this bylaw was done prior to even the equity framework that the city now abides by and tries to follow. So I think if you were to go back and look at how that was even done initially, it probably wouldn't meet the, the city's current standards. And so that's part of what we've seen. And we have seen really great engagement with uh, with the city staff in recent years that, that follow along with that equity piece. Um, and this is where an area where we feel that that maybe has been missed. Yeah. Okay, and you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there are phrases that kind of leap to mind for me is like, if we move to your point around not doing more harms, this feels a bit like sort of champagne environmentalism to me because you are, do, those harms are being felt. And to your point, and I was really struck by sort of what you said in terms of the learned helplessness, I think is how you phrased it. Is, is that what the community is feeling? I, there's, there's a sentiment from vendors that we speak to around, uh, you know, well, uh, there's nothing I can do about this. Like, I have no voice or no way to, to speak out about my, uh, you know, the, the impact this is having on me, which is part of why I'm here today, right, is to help kind of uh, share that, uh, that point of view. And, and so I think that this is an opportunity where seeing that, you know, the, these, uh, this voice being heard and these words being heard may have the impact that, that will help them see that there are, these are, things aren't futile, that there is potential for change and for their voices and their, uh, their viewpoint to be considered in these types of policy development. Okay. Um, and then switching gears, my last question, the time I have is, can you just speak a little bit more about the coffee cup 
Revolution is reading a bit about on your site, but just describe that for people. Yeah, uh, one day depot we typically do in uh, Victory Square. Uh, we fundraise for uh, providing a 10 cent uh, deposit on coffee cups that day, and essentially any any binner, anyone in the community can come, providing any uh, used uh, coffee cup and receive a 10 cent deposit. We then engage with uh, a local um, organization, Recycling Alternative, who deals with um, the recycling of those cups, which is a, a process that is in place. It is possible to recycle coffee cups. It's just not generally um, something that is uh, easily done in, its, in the way it's kind of currently. And probably an area we really need to push on is the recyclability component too. Would you say that's an important component? I do agree that that's an important component, yes. Okay, super helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. More questions still? Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Sean, for being here. Um, really articulate. And I just, I have one question because you, you honed on the, in, in on the issue of inequities. And um, I noted in the staff report as well, on page 12, it talked about how some food vendors are taking it upon themselves to cover the cost of the cup fee um, when someone's indicating they can't pay and what struck me when I read that is that have we essentially are we supporting stigmatization from your perspective? Is this stigmatizing in some ways? And um, yeah, and I've heard I've heard have heard accounts from binners who have yeah had you know where they every day had the same amount of money ready to go to their coffee cup January second hits and suddenly they're short twenty five cents and those acts of goodwill. I, I think. What I would probably highlight more is, um, and when you come to like extended producer responsibility, EPR practices, best practice is always incentivizing the behavior you want to see. And frankly, this currently in its current form is, for most businesses, penalizing the behavior you don't want, which is to the, re uh, the disposable cup, right? So I think you look at some of those businesses that have, as, as was noted, reduced their fees to accommodate that so that then if someone is bringing a reusable cup, that means they pay 25 cents less. Right, so there, there is that piece I think that is all, is important that um, I think would be good to do. I, I, I think there's a piece where, yeah, of course, there's going to be that stigmatization if uh, an individual had, you know, just didn't quite have the money um, uh, and there's concerns there and that's a, obviously extends to a, a variety of ways that uh, people with low income kind of been work in the, uh, the society. But uh, yeah, I think that's for me where the, I think and I think number the, the, the work we've done in this area has been is that incentivizing what you want to see as opposed to penalizing what you don't. Super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Just say, um, Councillor Weeb, you have 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, one of the other questions, recognize that when you do bring one of these cups into a large chain, they give you a 10 cent discount. And so do you see it's an opportunity for finding ways to get cups into a population so they actually are discounting um, because they're not paying that fee? So it might be a way to actually make it more affordable in the future. Well, I believe it's actually because of the way the, the bylaw is. It's actually a 25 cent. They wouldn't be paying that 25 cent. No, like some of the, like but. Starbucks, if you bring your own cup, they give you a 10 cents and you don't pay the 25 cents. So it's actually a 35 saying, yeah. cent discount. So yeah. there is an opportunity to actually reduce the fee because we're not paying for that. Uh, yeah, I agree. And, and so I think that's exactly yeah what I was saying about in, instead of incentivizing the behavior you're wanting, and but you have to provide options that are accessible to individuals who might otherwise not have the means to, to be a part of that participatory system of cup sharing or even just having a reusable a mug that they can hold on to and, and reuse uh, effectively. Great. Thanks, sure. Thank Appreciate you, Councillor Weeb. Um, Councillor Fry. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And, and just to clarify, you're, you're more speaking from an advocate for low-income folks' perspective than a binner's perspective. A little bit of both, and I mean, the reality is, is most of, if not all of the binners we work with are in that low income bracket and, and people that are, mo I think, more significantly impacted than those uh, with higher incomes, for sure. Yeah, and, and, and I totally appreciate both advocacy on both fronts. So looking forward, and, and, and as you know, and of course, through the coffee cup revolution, you see the volume of coffee cups and you... And, appreciating that that's a heavily subsidized approach that is, isn't really sustainable as it is. What would a, moving forward, and I really appreciate your willingness to work with staff and come up with the solution that would work, what, what does that look like? How do you, do you imagine a, a, a future where cup share and stuff can integrate with the binners program? And, yeah, and I, I do, and I hope I hope for that. I also, and this has come up already around um, a deposit uh, system for cups is not necessarily a tool for reducing, but at least a tool for ensuring that they're not entering the the waste stream. Um, and that is something that the coffee cup revolution has uh, has advocated for over the last uh, this seven years, eight years that it's it's uh, been in operation. 
And uh, that would be one piece where, again, that's allowing for that opportunity as well for binners to, to, to potentially gain income from that. So I think a model that allows for potential for um, circularity and income generation would be something that would be more... But you're not talking about a deposit system on the ubiquitous poly paper cups. You're talking about a specialized cup? Because obviously... Uh, could, uh, or, I, I mean, the, that... As far as a broader kind of on the paper cups or some version of that, that obviously is something beyond the, the purview of the city, and, and that's where the federal and municipal or federal and provincial um, uh, kind of insight is needed, and obviously uh, funding is needed. Um, but I do think that there is potential for things like um, like Councillor Weeb is mentioning around being a part of that collection system for uh, for those cups to ensure that if they do end up in a in a bin that they're not going into the landfill and that they're actually being brought back to to that. I think there would be a need for city infrastructure and how that would happen, especially if you're dealing with multiple sh uh, cup sharing programs and systems. That, that, that there was some way that that could all be done, uh, where there would be central locations for for binners to be able to say bring those in. Um, to then be redistributed into the community. Yeah, awesome. I'm almost out great. of time, so thank you. That's great. That, that is it for your questions. Thank you so great. much for coming in and, and really all, all your good work in the community. Yeah, thank you. thanks so much. Okay, we are on to speaker two, Greg Wilson. Greg Wilson. Good morning. Right? Yep. We can hear you. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Good morning. My name is Greg Wilson. I live and work in the city of Vancouver for the Retail Council of Canada on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. I'm speaking today on behalf of the retail industry. I note that I've spoken to Council on these issues five times already, going back to 2017. Retail businesses haven't felt overly heard. This means as I ha that I have some skepticism as to whether we will be heard today. I note that you have all received an email from my colleagues at Restaurants Canada who wasn't available to speak today, but with whom we hold similar, similar views and have similar concerns. I want to commend staff for their work and their report. Although I found the oral presentation was overly rosy vis-a-vis -vis the availability of shared cups and, over, and also dramatically underrepresented the business impacts and concerns. Particularly, I must say that I'm disappointed that there aren't recommendations in the staff report regarding addressing income inequality with respect to bag and cup fees, promoting the, reuse, the use of reusable bags, addressing bumps related to orders and deliveries, and small paper bags. Specifically, in regard to small paper bags, the current City of Vancouver definition is 15 by 20 centimeters when flat. Most bags for a greasy sandwich or a single burger come in 25 or 30 centimeter sizes. Accordingly, customers are paying a bag fee for these items, which we feel are clearly not an intended target of the bylaw. Secondly, we think there could be a better effort to promote the use of reusable bags. There is no ability provided in the bylaw to allow us to promote the use of reusable bags. We cannot discount reusable bags, put, i.e. put them on sale, or provide them free on Earth Day, as examples. That is an error in our view. Third, the bylaw parameters do not work well for orders and deliveries, whether takeout, internet, or app base. This needs more study by city staff, and the wrinkles need to be removed as solutions are identified by both business and city staff. Fourth, while we're pleased with the staff report recommendation that a free drink means a free cup, but we'd like flexibility, which we are con convinced can come not through a bylaw change, but even through written guidance, that we are able to use the proceeds of cup and bag fees to address income inequality as well as environmental goals. Our position remains that retail workers should not be put in the position of having to charge a consumer who cannot, uh, who can clearly not afford the bag or cup fee. I worry today that council will make a rash decision. I think that this is the time to ask staff to monitor the bylaw, identify issues, and perhaps come back after the election next fall with recommendations. Programming changes and other costs for cash receipts, point of sale systems, menus, menu boards, and signage have been significant. Essentially, no business has likely made up the January 1 cost with fees paid up to date. Undoing that would result in another whole set of costs for business. 
it is our informed view that removing or reducing the bag fee will or cup fee, sorry, will significantly undercut share cup share program developments. I'm certain this is not council's wish. Likewise, our position is that it is premature to require all businesses to adopt a cup share model in 18 months. This is a pilot project. It has not been done on this wide a scale before. There is a lot to learn, and the business and non-profit businesses and nonprofits that are creating the cup share pilots all tell me that they don't know enough about the operational parameters at this time to have good information about how to operate an efficient and effective cup share program at low cost to consumers. One recommendation to Council is that you allow more flexibility for businesses in complying with the bylaw, that you make changes to allow businesses to provide free or re discounted reusable bags to promote their reuse, to make changes to address the small bag definition and the free beverage situations, and that you ask staff to monitor this which is a precedent-setting set of bylaws, and report back regularly to Council to ensure that you can make changes in the future that provide businesses with certainty, frontline workers with flexibility, and the best environmental outcomes. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, Well-timed presentation. You do have questions from councillors. Go ahead, Councillor Weep, up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, so one of the things you talked about is on Earth Day and other days, be able to provide reusable bags or having a promo. Can you talk about why that would be beneficial and how you could be part of the kind of marketing of this shift and making it sure it's a just transition? So, I mean, our understanding from particularly small businesses is that the ability to um, influence consumers is a consumer by consumer conversation. And, you know, it's useful to take advantage of opportunities like Earth Day. And, and, you know, there are other days on the calendar where that applies too, to encourage people to use reusable bags. And it's, in our view, a better outcome if we can give the, give the customer a free reusable bag if they're going to reuse it. You know, a number of us who've used reusable bags going back for 20 years have collections. But there are still there's still a large portion of the population that is resistant to carrying a reusable bag and to the use of reusable bags. Okay, thank you. You also talked about having staff be able to have the flexibility if they feel that someone does not have the ability to afford the cost. Can you talk about how you think that could be not abused and how it could be a system that would be um, in place that could provide this service? Well, I worry that it is open to abuse, but I'll highlight for you a different situation where we came up with a, uh, had a discussion with staff and uh, there is an acceptable outcome. In an instance where a, where a frontline retail worker is, um, is threatened with violence or there's intimidation, um, staff's view was that we can provide the bag without charge or for free. That's clearly not an advertised exemption, but rather a addressing a situation where there can be harm. Likewise, our view is that putting retail workers in the position of having to charge somebody who, you know, either evidently or says they cannot afford the fee, you know, and some of these people present with gift cards, which would be covered, but many don't. We don't, our workers don't like being put in that situation. They'd like to have the ability to not charge the consumer in that occasion. Okay, thanks, that's helpful. And last question, um, what, what size bag do you think is appropriate? Um, you talked about the 15 by 20 centimeters being a little small. Can you talk about what you think would be appropriate guideline? Um, most of the bags fit one, one dimension, but virtually none of them fit the second dimension. So people are paying for the bag fee for uh, a fee for a greasy uh, burger or sandwich, um, which they obviously don't want to have in their hands. And those bags are generally under 25 or 30 centimeters on the longer um, direction when laid flat. Okay, so thanks. just increasing it by 10 centimeters. Okay, thanks a lot. For thank you so much. You have more questions. Councillor Hardwick, go ahead, up to three minutes. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, 
I just want to clarify, I'm looking at the recommendations in the report, and this is exclusively talking about the cup bylaw, not about bags. So I just want to confirm we're, we're talking about the single-use cups here in this uh, recommendation. Same page? Yes, but, uh, uh, you know, staff were asked to report back. They did not make recommendations in respect of bags. Our view was that they could have made recommendations in respect of bags as well. There is a clear, particularly income inequality issue with respect to bag fees as well as cup fees. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. So in, in any case, as we look at these recommendations, we will be asked to either um, approve them, oppose them, or potentially amend them. Um, what would be your recommendation to us? Should we uh, oppose it outright, or would there be specific um, amendments that you would recommend? I mean, I think we're generally pleased with um, with recommendation number one, or A. Um, our feeling might be that it doesn't go far enough on income inequality, but we're happy with that. Recommendation two doesn't, in our view, adequately um, address the income inequality issues, but we're happy for, you know, we think discussions with nonprofits and those involved would be helpful here. Um, on three and four, we don't think that this is the time or place for that. While there might be that down the road, we think three and four should be delayed. Consideration on those recommendations should be delayed until later when, you know, there's been better ability to study the impacts, particularly of cup share programs and the costs to small independent businesses of these programs. So overall, that's really a question of sequencing and rollout. Well, 18 months may or may not be um, adequate for most businesses to uh, adopt a cup share program. We're not, we don't have the answer to that at this day. But our feeling is that once the large cup share programs are in operation, within six to nine months, we'll have some sense of the costs and the impacts. Thank you very much. That was helpful. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Mayor Stewart, up to three minutes. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for coming in uh, today and uh, being the voice for, for uh, an important industry in our city. Um, I was just wondering if I heard you right. Uh, were you saying that you didn't want us to bring any changes into the program, but rather just continue to uh, keep it as it is and to monitor it and report back? Uh, or are you asking for minor changes? I think we'd like minor changes to address promotion of reusable bags, uh, small paper bag size, and the provision of um, free uh, cup fees where there is a free drink or um, in respect of income inequality. I think it's premature for to make the other changes recommended by staff. Okay, thanks. And your primary concern were essentially the transaction costs for businesses. Is that change is expensive uh, and too many changes, uh, you know, in series uh, can be can be really hard for businesses to absorb. Is that um, is that the point you're making? Yeah, these costs are much more impactful to small businesses in Vancouver than they are for large businesses. So what will happen, uh, what had to happen on January 1 is that all small businesses had to reprogram to have a cup fee and a bag fee and display and print those both on menu boards and on cash register receipts and what have you. So that costs those businesses money to make those changes. That can be from a small amount if it's only your own staff time to more than $1,000 if you're having to pay a contractor to do that work for you. So when the bag fee rises again, or the bag fees rise again, next January 1, those businesses impact will also have to make those changes again. If you were to repeal or change any of the fees now, there would be an, a cost. To, and as I said, these are more impactful to small businesses than they are to large businesses. Right, and so that the money that the uh, business is collecting when uh, you know a customer uses a paper cup actually can can offset some of those costs as well, I guess. Yeah, and you know, 
I heard some descriptions about the amount of the cup revenue, the cup fees, but you know, my understanding of based on a good understanding of what business, some of these businesses are just are spent are spending on cup share programs is, you know, one of the large chains is spending significantly more on the development of their cup share program than the cup revenue could possibly, you know, cover right. from this year. You know, one year's cup revenue is a fraction of the cost of that of development of that cup share program. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's really important for us to understand this. I mean, it's we all are all trying to to tackle um, our close to full uh, landfill in Delta and the cost that 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 uh, you know addressing that will also incur by reducing waste. So I, I really thankful uh, to you and your organization and businesses for for uh, rolling with the punches as we move forward here um, and also bringing the detail that's required for us to make proper decisions. So thanks for coming in today. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mayor Stewart. I'm just reminding all councillors, you have three minutes to ask questions of speakers. Councillor Kirby Young, you're next. Yeah, Apologies. thanks. Sorry, Mary, are you finished? Um, you're, uh, I'll okay. start your timer again. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for speaking, Greg. I have a question. You said that you, I think, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, it would be helpful to have more flexibility on waiving the fees, but I, I guess I'm wondering how, because bylaws by definition are not flexible. They're actually intended to be very inflexible and be black and white so that they can be consistently applied across all different outlets and on, you know, on each occasion. So how do you sort of respond to that? Have you known bylaws to be flexible in the past successfully? Municipal bylaws um, sometimes have flexibility built in in the wording, the, but I'd say here the better example, I'm remembering that this is the first year of particularly the CUP bylaw, and this is not done anywhere else in the country. I think it's appropriate for the city to have communications on their website and um, guidance, printed guidance material available that is, um, you know, tells business how to operate within the bylaws. I think the um, issues surrounding income inequality are not easily addressed in the writing of a bylaw. I recognize that staff will struggle with that, but perhaps you know a year's worth of experience on that and on delivery apps and on pickups will provide staff and businesses with more information that will be useful to better um, develop bylaws. Right. So. If I can reflect that back to you and paraphrase, we don't know what we don't know yet, and taking some time to gather that information would actually be helpful in crafting a better bylaw. Exactly. Which, okay, so kind of cart and horse sort of scenario here, right? Greg Wilson, are you um, yeah. still there? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. I'll leave it there. Okay, you do have more questions. Councillor Dave Genova, you're next, up to three minutes. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Greg, for your comments. I just wanted to, to ask, I mean, you had said that there were certain recommendations here that in speaking for your members that they would be okay with, but ultimately we're here today because there were some problems in moving forward so fast with this and we're seeing those problems play out and actually hurt people who weren't intended to be hurt by this people who have to pay that 25 cent cup fee um even if they get a free beverage that's what we've seen so far so would would your members like to see a regional or a provincial approach to this instead would would that be better just to kind of press pause on this until that's considered the high costs, what this will do to mom and pop businesses, or would you rather well, just see us vote for some of the recommendations? I'm just trying to understand if that's something you could live with, some of the recommendations, or what you'd like to see is us press pause on this and work with the region. So firstly, um, with respect to the bag straws utensils, these are items where the federal government will likely take action and the provincial government will likely take action within the next year. So I do think there's limited need to spend time, although I think that there are some short term fixes that could be made to that will improve the situation until the federal and then the provincial rules come into place. Um, 
In respect of the cup fee, this is an area where the province and the federal government is not going. Um, you know, we very much support the principle of cup share and reusable cups in store. However, you have highlighted in your questions to staff concerns about the dishwasher. There is a requirement in a Ministry of Health guidance document that the dishwasher be of a certain quality. And this means that those businesses would have to get approval from local public health and have the money to spend on that on that improvement if they are to have reusable mugs or cups or glasses in store. Well, we also because have my the time is very outcome. short. Yeah. I'm yeah. so, so mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt. Because my time is short, I'm being told by our staff they don't need dishwashers if they're participating in a cup share program. Is that a concern? And, and do you um, ultimately think that we need to press pause on this and consider a regional approach? Or do we move forward and it, try it, and make, keep making changes to it? I think that depends on the configuration of the cup share and the independent business. Some businesses want to run their own cup share because they have a dedicated customer base. And for those businesses, they would be required to have dishwashing. I mean, I think so, that's one fine point. Yeah. I'm out of time. So I will, I'll, I'll, I'll hope Councillor Dominato asks some of my other questions. But right. thank you for, for your presentation. Thanks, Councillor Dijanova. Councillor Dominato, up to three minutes. Thanks, Chair. Hope I'm a mind reader. Um, a couple of quick questions, Greg. Um, we heard from Sean Miles before you. Um, he talked about that uh, from the research he's done, and, and I would concur from my psych degree, that typically um, incentives get you to the behavior change you seek more than penalties. And he had pointed out to potentially um, in incentives where you bring your reusable cup mug and you get a discount. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that from uh, your position in, in supporting the retail industry. Yeah, I mean, look, as a customer, I choose to go to a coffee shop most regularly. Um, the chain that provide there are two cha chains that provide different cup discounts in addition to not charging the cup fees. I choose to go to them, and that is my way of expressing an opinion on their environmental practices. So I do agree with him and with your assertion that it is better to offer the carrot, um, and I think that's why I would prefer that we incent cup share rather than requiring cup share. Okay, thank you. That was succinct and clear. Um, and then my, my second question pertains to what I believe Santa Cruz is doing. Santa Cruz uh, implemented 25 cents, but have moved in the direction and bringing a decision to uh, cost share. So the 25 cents was going to businesses, but now the county actually wants the half, 50% of those revenues to come to the county to support environmental initiatives. I understand from our legal staff that we're not able to do that, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on that in terms of uh, half the revenues coming to the city to support uh, environmental initiatives? Yeah, uh, well, so I have heard a question from one of the councillors in respect of um, requ requiring this of businesses or even voluntarily asking this of businesses. It's not my view that that would be a successful approach. Um, you know, the difficulty here is that the City governments have a, have a limited set of taxation powers, and city staff have had to develop a bylaw within those limits. Um, honestly, most of my members do view this as a municipally imposed tax, even though staff have done a very good job of, of writing the bylaw in compliance with provincial legislation. Thank you. That's my time, Greg. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and over to you, Councillor Fry. Three minutes. Yeah, and thanks for uh, all these questions, Greg. Um, curious, I, I just want to pivot a little bit because one of the things that we, we hear about, especially in the context of COVID, is the, the concerns around the handling of reusables. And I was uh, did some work through National Zero Waste um, and, and the Toronto School of Public Health on, on the transmission of fomites. Um, and, and, and which really pointed to the notion that, in fact, COVID-19 transmission, you're at more risk of, of, of getting E. coli or fecal coliform from the hand, uh, unsafe handling of, of uh, shareables than, than COVID. I'm wondering where you see the role in, in, in better informing uh, retailers and, 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 and the like 
on on that. Is this is this really something that has to come back to coastal health, or is this something that that the city should take an active role, or, or is this something that that the retail council could take an active role in? Well, so first, uh, RCC is a proud founding member of the National Zero Waste um, Commission uh, Committee, and we're very proud of their work. Um, what I'd say with respect to the transmission is, look, I think most public health guidance is very clear in this respect, but um, individual consumers and workers have been slower to understand the shift in, in public health guidance. It's very clear that uh, only for about a month was uh, their guidance out that you shouldn't handle reusable cups and 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 bags and yet here we are um, nearly two years later and there's still an amount of unfounded in my opinion fear we and public health and the bc center for disease control have worked to try to improve guidance and improve communications but you know our experience with with our employees indicates that this is going to have to be allowed to take some time until they feel comfortable in handling those containers as much as we might wish it to be otherwise. It's an educational and and um, slower transition, I'm afraid, than we'd like. Okay, um, that's helpful. Is, is, is there an opportunity for the Retail Council to, to help in that capacity? And I, and I do appreciate that you're a member of the National Zero Waste Council. So we have worked. Um, we have worked very hard with our members, particularly with grocers, in respect of reusable bags and reusable containers. I think there's been a lot of progress there. Um, cups are a bit of a different, um, a different beast. There are just an awful lot of independent um, stores. Um, I've watched even in the last two months since the city's, I mean, firstly, the city's bylaw coming into force did make some difference, measurable difference in this regard. Um, and I've watched as it has improved, but I think I'd be the first one to acknowledge. Uh, Councillor Bly pointed out a couple of instances where this is the case. Um, there are still problems. And, but, you know, it requires workers to become comfortable and workers do have the right to refuse unsafe work. And I don't think we should be asking employers to ask workers to do work for which they feel is unsafe. So it's a bit of a conundrum. I wish it were different, but that's the circumstance. Thank you. And that, and Councillor Fry's well over time. Again, Councillors, just time your questions to um, ensure that you can end within the three minutes. Um, Greg Wilson, uh, very uh, good of you to stay on the line so long to answer all the questions and just speak to Council. Really appreciate it. Um, our third thank speaker. You. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Our third speaker, Zach Berman, co owner of the juice truck. Is that, Hi, guys. Yes. Are you on the line? Great. We yes. can hear you. And I'm if you could just, just first let me know if you are um, a resident of Vancouver. No, I'm not. Okay, no problem. Go ahead. You have up to five minutes to address council. All right, I'm just uh, catching my breath because uh, I've been on here for two hours, so I decided to go for a run while I was listening to all of you. So took a break to, to, to jump in. Um, I thought I could offer some insight from, uh, from a small business in Vancouver. We have uh, six cafes in Vancouver. We sell smoothies and juices, so our predominant uh, use of packaging is biodegradable plastic cups. Um, I applaud the city with their intention with this bylaw, but I uh, feel that it has uh, fallen short um, beyond intention. Um, some of the issues, um, I think the systemic issue that's being walked around and not discussed is that the city does not have proper facilities to deal with biodegradable packaging. Uh, if the city's intention is to truly be green and environmental, uh, instead of um, charging and basically penalizing customers that are, are trying to support customers that are using biodegradable packaging, uh, it would be of the city's interest to invest in systems that can process um, these biodegradable packages. And I think if, if the city is... Um, 
Yeah, and just greenwashing and, and uh, you know, making marketing attempts to to uh, appeal to environmental movements. I think if they took uh, genuine steps to better the city's uh, environmental impact, I think the first step, one of the first steps would be to invest in facilities that can actually um, deal with biodegradable packaging because the customers are demanding this of small businesses and the small businesses want to have packages that packaging that, that can be sustainable. Uh, the second issue, uh, COVID has been brought up by a lot of people. Um, it's great that uh, it's been re recommended that customers bring in their own cup. The reality is that customers are bringing in dirty cups and uh, it's putting our staff in a place that they feel unsafe uh, to be handling um, cups that are not properly sanitized. Um, and then when this is shared, it's just putting our staff in uh, situations where they are confrontational with customers. Um, a lot has been asked of staff already during COVID, having to monitor uh, vaccine passports and just the general safety as frontline workers has been uh, at best, you know, challenging. Um, so to put uh, additional uh, areas of, of conflict with customers has just made uh, the job uh, that much more taxing. Um, can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can. Go. Yeah, you've got um, okay, great. a bit of time. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and then, uh, in addition to that, um, I, I know you guys mentioned the BIAs. We're we're a part of uh, three different BIAs in Vancouver, and um, you know the majority. Uh, feedback from the businesses that are involved in the BIAs of uh, the areas that we're a part of, we're all an astounding no against these policies. Uh, we all wish for, for green initiatives, just ones that um, are set up to succeed. And I feel like the, the necessary steps to make this succeed were not taken. Um, beyond that, um, I mean, I think there's a lot of other potential issues, even with cup shares, um, I think we fall into the possibility of greenwashing once again because of the carbon impact of having to transport cups back and forth from various places. Um, unless it's done by bicycle or by foot, I believe the carbon impact uh, will be, um, the additional carbon impact will be larger than assumed. Um, I, I think if the city wants to um, encourage environmental uh, practices like our business, we've taken it on our own. Uh, we're 100% plant-based. We feel like this is the, the best way to be a, a positive uh, environmentally impacting business, both for our consumers and for um, the, the footprint of our business. And I think uh, businesses such as ours uh, should be encouraged. Um, rather than um, finding additional ways to to uh, kind of tax uh, what we're doing. Additionally, the, the 25 cents, um, again, that's like another point of contention with customers and their staff. Uh, you can you can understand that it's taxing for, for staff to have this conversation at, you know, hundreds of times okay. with customers explaining okay, Zach, where the 25 cents um, is going. Zach. Zach, yeah. you're, you're out of time. However, um, you do have some questions from councillors, so just stay on the line. Councillor Fry, up to okay. three minutes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks, Zach. Uh, I enjoyed one of your products just yesterday, and I just want to compliment you on a great product and a great team. Really fantastic staff you got there, too. So kudos on that. Thank you. Um, so on the biodegrade, and I ap appreciate the intent behind the using bioplastics, um, where, where, where are your plastics certified? Because one of, one of the issues that we have with bioplastics is there's no standardization. We have PLAs, PHAs, we have lingam, we have cellulose, we have, and those are just the bioplastics, and we get into the petroleum-based compostable plastics. Uh, what, what, what certification did you seek out when you looked for your bioplastics? So we, we lean on our suppliers, so BSI is our supplier. Uh, so we're obviously not in the manufacturing business uh, of, of biodegradable plastics, so we, we depend on them. Um, so they're corn-based plastics. Um, so that, so that's, that's, that's PLA. Kind of, 
polylactic acid. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so, I mean, and this is the challenge, and I'm just curious if, if you see that that is a, as I see it, is a somewhat insurmountable challenge is for us to, to pursue certification of, of bioplastics for the city of Vancouver. That's really a national conversation that's yet to happen, in my opinion. Do you see that it was within our ability to even... Well, I, I, I feel um, that if the city is genuine and wanting to be green, most businesses are moving towards biodegradable solutions. And if the city wants to be part of the solution and sees itself as a green player in the future, it has to evolve. And part of that evolution is, is having facilities that can properly manage biodegradable products. Okay. Um, all right. And, and so you're... But you don't see a role for cup share in your business model at all. Well, there's multiple issues. One, coastal health uh, has been problematic. Uh, when we've had cup share in the country inspection, uh, they've they've deemed that our facility does not have um, is not set up uh, for to be receiving and storing dirty cups. Um, so uh, another issue is that coastal health has to be in 100% alignment with the city because um, the truth of the matter is coastal health will come to our facility. Uh, if we have reusable cups or cup shows, uh, we will be documented negatively for having these things. So um, coastal health and the city of Vancouver in, in truth are not in 100% alignment on these things, or at least it has not been acted on the coastal health uh, officers that are inspecting the facility. That is a very helpful and salient point, but I am so out of time because I would love to explore that further. You're actually perfectly on time. Thanks, Councillor Fry. Councillor Kirby Young, up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks. I'm going to pick right up on that, and also because I had, didn't hear you cutting out a little bit for me, so I just want to clarify what I heard. You said Coastal Health and which group are not aligned? Uh, coastal, the, the City of Vancouver, uh, because Coastal Health, Depending on your, your zoning and your permitting, uh, we've had issues with uh, to stay cups. We've had issues with um, shared cups from uh, various companies in the past, um, storing them on, on site. Uh, in our coastal health report, it was, it was shared that we had dirty dishes that were to be picked up by a shared program and that they were not to be, um, we're not to have dirty cups on, on site, basically. Uh, when we had uh, to stay cups uh, in the past, even though we have dishwasher in the facility, it was deemed that the dishwasher was not close enough so that we weren't allowed to have to stay cups. So it just is important that Coastal Health and the City of Vancouver, uh, before making these things bylaws, are actually in alignment with the practices. So what you're talking about really is the City of Vancouver's kind of other area of responsibilities, which is all that permitting piece that comes in when they're looking at your facility and making sure that you're meeting health guidelines and all of that, and you're seeing potential for a whole world of hurt, basically, um, in terms of those pieces butting up against each other. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, basically, uh, like we've tried multiple times to have cup share programs and uh, to offer uh, cups to, to stay uh, in store, and uh, Coastal Health has been difficult uh, at best uh, with both of these initiatives in the past. Okay, so in summary, just to be super clear, you don't support the cup by law. Is that correct? Uh, as, it, as, as it stands, uh, no. I think if the twenty five cents, for example, was was ensured that it was going to environmental use, um, I think I would would support it uh, on the environmental impact alone. But um, to have uh, small businesses kind of police themselves, I think, is wishful thinking. Like I, I can speak for ourselves. Like, sure, we will probably use those funds towards a green initiative, but I think the majority of businesses will not be. Okay, and I wasn't sure if you, you probably didn't, don't have time running a small business day online, but I don't know if you heard earlier when we asked staff the question whether or not the city, for example, to your point around the fee, could collect the fee and make sure it went to environmental initiatives. The answer was that legally we can't. So knowing that and your point yeah. around, that kind of reinforces your point around small businesses policing themselves and trusting that's going to happen and not think it's going to happen consistently, right? Yes. It, it, honestly, if the city was taking the 25 cents and putting it towards building a facility to 
uh, properly processed biodegradable products, I would be 200 percent. But I think uh, I think 99 percent of businesses are not going to use this 25 cents towards any green initiative. Okay, I super appreciate your honesty and your perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor DiGenova, up to three minutes. Thanks very much. I really appreciate you taking the time, and I'll try and be quick because I, I understand that it can be difficult when you're a small business owner to, to be here at Council. I'm just wondering if, if you can share, and it's a tough question to quantify, I'm sure, but do you feel that you've actually lost business since this has come in? Um, I would say no, we have not lost uh, business. We have um had to deal with a lot of upset customers which is taxing on our, our staff um you know we get a lot of anti-vaxxers already in our establishment so i think just having to deal with regular conflict um beyond the job description that we have asked of our staff is um taxing on their mental health and their longevity in the job and do you feel that you already have trouble finding and retaining staff to work in Vancouver? That's what we've heard from other small businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we have had an extreme staff shortage. Uh, we're operating at best at um, kind of 80% of the staff that we need, and that reflects in us having to close early uh, and uh, adjust our hours on a regular basis. So, um, so just perhaps having, if your staff... Uh, if you're if your staff decide to throw in the towel or quit, it's not going to be over the cup fee, but it could, you know, it could escalate considering the arguments that you've, you've mentioned, the customers, the frustration that they might take out on your staff. Is that correct? That, you know, it, it is taxing and wearing on your staff and it does contribute to um, the overall morale of your staff? Oh, 100%. I think, uh, I think our staff as a whole has been in mental health. Uh, crisis in the last couple of years, and we've done our best to support them. But uh, additional um, opportunities for conflict have not been welcomed uh, by, by the team on the front line. Okay, and and do you think that the city has done a, a good enough job, and council has done a good enough job of of communicating uh, this to uh, the residents and people in Vancouver uh, who frequent? I you know, your store and others? I mean, I, I do believe the city has great intentions with this. Anything that is for the environment, the intention is great. Uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, the, the frontline workers have, have been the communicators, have been the PR uh, for, for the city. Uh, the majority of customers don't understand the changes. Uh, as you know, I can't say where they get the news sources, but most, the majority of them have been uninformed, and it's been up to us to educate our customers on what the 25 cents is for. Thank you. That's my time, and sorry to be so fast, but I only have three minutes. But appreciate you being here today. Great, thank Great. you. Thank oh, you. and you do um, just stay on the line. Yes, you have more uh, questions. So, Councillor Weeb, up to you. Yeah, thanks for coming and to speak today. I was actually surprised that you thought the 99% of other small business owners wouldn't be utilizing this for environmental uses like plant-based takeout containers, composting, and other initiatives that have increased the cost of small business. So can you talk to me about why you think 99% of other businesses wouldn't use this for environmental purposes? I, I think currently the majority of small businesses are still in survival mode. I can speak for ourselves as well. Uh, our businesses have not uh, rebounded uh, from COVID. Um, so uh, we're still in a, a state where we're trying to survive. Uh, we're not in a place where we're thriving. Uh, I've speak, uh, spoken to, uh, you know, probably close to 25 small businesses and, and beyond ourselves. Um, we're the only one that I know of that has put any of this money towards uh, environmental initiatives. So uh, from the from, from who I've spoken to, uh, we are the only one doing such. So they're using this money to kind of stay afloat and ensure that their business can yep. survive. Okay. Um, and I really appreciate the comments you made about how we're making frontline staff do the education um, and as well the mental health of having to police this as well as some of the COVID stuff. So really appreciate that because it is a huge burden on our small business and our frontline workers. And so... I think that perspective was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks, Councillor Weeb, and uh, thank you, Zach, very much for taking the time to speak to us and um, uh, answer the questions. Um, yeah, that's that's it for questions today. Thanks so much. Thank you. So, Council, um, it's just a few minutes before 12. We don't have enough time to start another speaker, so uh, we can take our lunch break now, returning at 1 o'clock, and we will uh, start with speaker number 4, Jason Hawkins. Um, speakers have been informed to call back at 1. Have a good lunch, everyone.
Welcome to TELUS Conferencing.
Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, we'll continue on with um, the item one, revisiting the city's single-use beverage cup fee policy. We're halfway through our speakers list and so I'm hoping that Jason Hawkins, uh, co-founder and CEO of reusables.com is on the line. Jason, are you there? Yes, I'm here, thank you. That's great, we can hear you clearly. You have up to five minutes to speak to council. Thank you. My name is Jason Hawkins. I'm the co-founder and CEO at reusables.com. It's a pleasure to be here today on behalf of our team and growing community of reusers who support the recommendation on the basis that the bylaw has had a net positive impact on the problem of single-use packaging waste in Vancouver. And we've witnessed a heightened sense of awareness among businesses and consumers since the bylaw came into effect in January. Reusables.com is a for-profit social enterprise based in Vancouver, and we're on a mission to replace single-use with reuse. We've been in operations for over a year and started during the pandemic with a focus on reusables for takeout and food delivery. Today, we have over 50 cafes, restaurants, and grocers offering reusables through our platform, and we're rapidly onboarding more. So this includes stores with one location and then others with larger uh, presence, and, and including chains. Um, although we support the recommendation, there are issues that need to be addressed. Um, we, you know, we're, we're coming from this being on the front line, working with many um, retailers every single day. Um, specifically, we have experienced a misunderstanding among retailers about how the 25 cent fee should be spent. And in most cases, we haven't seen um, that fee being used to cover costs of reusable alternatives, such as our cup share service. Um, this, you know, adversely affects our ability to create a sustainable business model um, and in, uh, for this particular vertical, um, since we require revenue from retailers in the form of per-use rental fees. Additionally, it pushes us to charge, um, you know, more uh, to the reuser uh, or, uh, in a, you know, put otherwise, uh, place a, a higher burden of cost on the reuser, which is actually the opposite, opposite direction of where we'd like to move. Uh, so today I can share my perspective briefly um, as one of the cup and container sharing platforms working with retailers to implement these types of reasonable alternatives. And I can also share how small tweaks to the way the city communicates how the 25 cent fee should be used by retailers um, can help to accelerate the adoption of reuse. Um, I think it's also worth noting that from our perspective, removing the fee would not negatively affect our business or our ability to address the problem of single use packaging as it was laid out in the report. So, uh, having offered our services to cafes and municipalities that don't have similar bylaws, like the um, City of North Vancouver and the District of North Vancouver, uh, where we have you know, over 10 cafes and restaurants using our service today, and that were set up prior to the bylaw in, in, in 2021. Um, following the bylaw, we've had you know, a frontline perspective of, of many of these issues, um, and it's clear that you know, from the discussion today and the, and the report that cup share programs like ourselves and others are expected to play a role in the overall solution. So for an illustrative example, I'll just highlight how conversations go with cafes on the North Shore, as, a, as well as with those in the city of Vancouver. Um, so just for context, we need to generate about 50 cents to a dollar in revenue per cycle. That includes whatever we'd get from the end user, but also from the cafe. Um, so currently we split the burden of cost about 50-50 between the consumer and the business by a monthly consumer membership for the end user, and then a pre-use rental fee for the retailer. So when we talk about in scale, you know, scaling our solution, we encounter sort of that common marketplace chicken or egg challenge, um, that being, where, you know, do we focus on the supply or the demand side first? So our approach is being to build the supply side first by partnering with as many restaurants as possible, uh, restaurants, retailers uh, as possible. Um, and to sell a retailer like a cafe, we usually need to match the cost of their existing single-use cups, right, uh, to be competitive. So on the North Shore, that conversation is fairly um, seamless. We, we simply ask what is their cost for their single-use alternatives, like compostable cups, and usually it's about 25 cents. And then we say, great, well, we can, you know, offer you something a little bit more competitive. So in most cases, we can actually offer a cost that is even cheaper than that for our reusables, which are double-walled stainless steel um, cups. Uh, in the city of Vancouver, following the bylaw, we've had a more difficult time charging stores anything for our cup share services. Um, and this is because, in practice, the 25 cent fee is offsetting, um, or in some cases, creating a profit center on single use 
cups and coffee, um, including compostable cups. So, you know, the communication for how the fee should be used is not clear enough, and it doesn't tie directly to subsidizing or supporting reusable alternatives, specifically the cup share programs, which I understand are um, expected to, to provide a significant part of the solution. So therefore, we're, we're being told by cafes that they cannot take on the additional cost of cup share programs for multiple reasons, given our current economic climate, but also because you know, the, their best alternative, i.e. compostable cups, are effectively being subsidized. So in conclusion and on a positive note, I think there's some small tweaks to the communication about how to use the 25 cent fee that can be made to um, incentivize cafes to use some of that money to offset uh, the cost that is required to participate in a cup share program. Great. And that is it for your thank time, you. but thank you very much. But you do have some questions, if you don't mind staying on the line. Uh, Councillor Bly, yeah. over to you for th up to three minutes. Uh, thanks very much. I, I do have a number of questions, but we only do have three minutes. So uh, if you can keep your answers as tight as possible. You, you did say that it works well with food delivery apps. Could you just quickly high level walk through what that looks like in the moment for the consumer sort of end to end? Yeah, it's quite simple. This is actually where we started. So as a consumer, you'd go onto DoorDash. Um, the store would set up a, an attribute on the menu. You would select reusables. You would enter your um, user order code or your phone number, and then you would get it delivered to you. And then on the store side, they're entering and tracking that um, by assigning the container to you. Okay, but I don't have an opportunity to give back an old container, for example. So you're paying a fee every time you get a container, but you're not actually able to return that container to your delivery driver. You have to eventually at some point go back and get them all returned. So um, we don't do a, a fee on the end user. It's a membership uh, based on also it's five bucks a month and that gets you unlimited access to reusables. So you can get 10 containers, you can get one container, you get 100 containers per month. Um, and then currently you can return those containers, whether you get it from a food delivery app or in person at a, at a store, you can return them to any of our participating locations um, or any of uh, other drop off locations, right? So um, our goal is to try and make this as easy as possible for people to return. And we're also working with some of the delivery apps to um, create a logistics network where they could actually pick up from your house as well. It just requires some um, additional lift on their side. That the delivery app will go pick up. So you're not concerned at all at $5 a month if I'm somebody who eventually has 100 containers sitting in my cupboard? No, so the way we do it is uh, it's like a library system. So um, you pay your, your membership, but if you don't return any container, then we charge you. So we've kind of uh, taken inspiration from um, more progressive so models in Europe that go beyond the deposit system. And um, we charge them if they don't return the container instead of upfront, just to lower that you, barrier for what you charge? And how long do they have? So they have 14 days to return the containers. And then it depends on the type of container, how much we charge them. But typically we charge well under what the retail value of one of our containers would be. So you can expect it to range from anywhere from $5 to $15 for the container. And that includes cups and uh, food containers that are stainless steel. Okay, but if the door delivery guy comes and drops it off to me uh, and I've got 10 containers, I can give it to the door delivery app guy and he'll figure out where it's supposed to go? So we're not doing that today, as I said. Today, you only can return in person to any of our participating stores. However, I would love to work with DoorDash and Uber Eats and Skip the Dishes where people can just place their container on their doorstep on the next Friday and get it picked up. That's very familiar to me as I uh, spend a lot of time working at spot.ca and that's how you that's how you do it in CSA models and it's uh, very, very familiar for people. So yeah, I would love to move to that direction. Great. Okay. Thanks. That's my time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Bly. Councillor Kirby Young, up to three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, you uh, two questions I want to fit in in the time, three minutes I have. Um, the first one is that you said, well, let me start on the first one. You said the 25 cents, and I think this is what you said, is creating a profit center for the business. And we certainly heard that um, from one of the earlier speakers, from the, the gentleman from the juice truck um, that said, I wouldn't trust um, the, necessarily all businesses. Um, paraphrasing more kindly, um, in terms of how they use the fee. So you do think it's a profit center right now? Do you think that's just a general thing? Do you think it's because of COVID? Do you think that's just how it's viewed? Well, yeah, it, it, look, it just depends how much their current packaging costs are. 
So if it's a, if it's a compostable cup that's really expensive and high quality and has a premium on it, um, then you know it might offset it more directly and not be a profit center. It might just be twenty five cents for a twenty five cent cost. But if it's a you know more if it's a cheaper cup, paper based cup, sometimes you know those on a per unit basis it can be ten fifteen cents okay. um, per cup. So in that case, it would be potentially a profit center. Yeah, sorry, we have limited time, so I'm not trying to be short. Um, but then you sort of suggested, and I appreciate your point, that it would, the bylaw would be stronger if it gave guidance as to how the funds were spent. And I don't know if you heard earlier, but we understand from City Legal, we can't do that. The City of Vancouver can't collect the fee, nor can we dictate to business how they spend it necessarily. We can require them to do other things. Um, right. So does that change your perspective, knowing that we can't dictate that per se? that you must spend the equivalent, like if you could collect 25 cents and it equates to $10,000 for your business, if you're a small business or a million dollars for, you know, a multinational chain that you must spend the equivalent of what you took in, that we can't actually dictate right. that. Right. Yeah, no, I understand that. Um, I, I'm more referring to the actual language that's used in um, some of the FAQs. So for example, um, some of those points are invest in reusable alternatives or cover costs of complying with bylaw. And then there's another point for participating in reusable cup share programs. So sure. I think it should be more specifically called out that um, the cost should be used to offset any reusable cup share program cost. I, I hear you, but apparently legally we can't do that quite that way. Um, the other point that's, and I thought it was really interesting when you raised the library model, because it's super interesting. So we're actually having a conversation now, and the, our libraries have been advocating saying that fines don't work, and if you levy fines, people actually stop using services. Because And so they've advocated for fine-free libraries to say that it actually keeps people away. Do you worry that the same thing would happen with reusables? Because people are like, oh, I have a fine. I'll just go use a different service or I'll just pay for my things because now I've got this fine and I don't have time to take them back to the store. Because the, the library model is actually being, advocates are advocating against that now. Saying fines are punitive yeah. and they dissuade behavior. Yeah, just 15 seconds if you don't mind you didn't answer. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we don't want to be the uh, the blockbuster in this uh, in this scenario. We don't like fines either. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Councillor Fry, on to you for three minutes. Thanks. <clears throat> and thanks, Jason. Um, so uh, uh, extrapolating from the city's figures of 82 million cups a year, that's like a quarter million cups a day. Uh, realistically, what's the capacity for uh, reusables and, and share cups? to meet that demand, assuming the demand stays steady? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think today we wouldn't be able to meet that demand, but um, we're, we're, you know, taking steps to um, be able to meet that demand. One of the, one of the main constraints is, um, you know, financing the inventory. Uh, our business model is currently built on us buying containers and renting them out. Um, so just really from a capital perspective, that's one of the main constraints. Operationally, I think we can solve it. Okay, that's, that's, that's more what I was looking for. Yeah, I totally appreciate that you're not there right now. Um, we heard one of the earlier callers uh, from Juice Truck talk about challenges with coastal health and the storage of dirty cups. Um, can you expand on that? Have you had conversations with coastal health? What, is that a barrier that we're dealing with? Um, the, the storage of dirty cups, I'm, I'm not aware of exactly what that example is referring to. Um, specifically, uh, for our model, uh, we, we recommend that our, um, retail partners update their, uh, food safety and sanitization plan, um, with, uh, you know, with, with those that they're working with to incorporate reusables. And then our understanding is that they can continue to be in compliance. So, but, but you do offer a, a washing service, right? That's correct. We offer a washing service. It's just not a mandatory washing service. So um, we have a decentralized model where stores can clean themselves if they have the infrastructure already. And then that's a cost benefit for them. And there's also um, environmental benefits in terms of less trucks and carbon emissions. So, uh, but if they can't clean themselves, then we do have a centralized cleaning facility as well. Currently about 75% of stores are cleaning themselves and 25% are using our cleaning service for context. And so for that 25%, as far as you're aware, there's no issues with the storage of dirty cups waiting for you to pick them up or have them delivered or whatever? Not, not that I'm aware of. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. 
Thanks. Okay, thank you. That is it for your questions. Thanks, Councillor Fry. Thanks so much, Jason, for uh, taking the time um, to answer our questions and be here uh, to speak with us. That's great. Really very, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Moving on to speaker number five, Council, uh, Sue Maxwell, the chair of Zero Waste BC. Sue, Sue, are you there? Yes, I am. Great, we can hear you uh, just fine. Up to five minutes to speak to Council. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm the chair of Zero Waste British Columbia, and although a former uh, Vancouver resident, I am now grateful to be on the unceded shared territories of both the Squamish and Lilwat peoples. Um, we are really grateful that the city has taken the lead on pioneering this uh, action on single-use cups in BC and Canada. With any new system, we know that there's going to be challenges, so we are pleased to see these recommendations that have been brought forward today that are helping to address some of the equity concerns and to work with the people who are impacted by those. We also hope that further in the future, the city will follow the path that some of the U.S. communities are taking in terms of ensuring reusables are offered for dining-in experiences and for food services to have dishwashers. Um, in on-site or available to them. We are also happy that in response to the pressure from the public and the city that the national chains are starting to move forward on offering reusables, and we hope that this will also change their practices in other communities as well. That and the fact that there is an increase in cup sharing systems are the kind of changes that we hope will arise when policies are brought in to address single-use items. We are also supportive of the actions around myth-busting um, about compostable plastics as well. Overall, the focus on reducing the material use and single-use items is really important. Um, and I think as people have alluded to earlier today, um, because the federal and provincial government so far have focused more on just looking at plastics or just kind of focusing on recycling. So this policy is a really important beacon for future changes, both here and elsewhere. And this can really help to work on shifting our culture away from disposable to a more sustainable and reusable system. Uh, our organization was part of a report um, that found that despite the many achievements uh, across BC to expand recycling and composting services from 2010 to 2018, that the amount of waste actually still going to uh, landfill and incineration remained the same because we were consuming more which really shows why we need to focus on reduction and reuse and changing how we deliver services and products. Uh, often the cities are where we're seeing the innovation happening, but I'm hoping that the city of Vancouver will not remain alone as uh, uh, and a great example in BC and Canada. Um, on Monday, the UN, UN Environmental Program and um, WWF and the World Economic Forum hosted a session on how to embed reuse as a solution to plastic pollution, um, and they had announced their a reuse portal where um, people will be able to build and share tools to move from reuse to single use. And that's a side event to the UN Environment Assembly meeting that's happening this week in Nairobi to try to develop a plastics treaty. So the city of Vancouver has shown real leadership and it's through, I, I, I hear all your questions and, and all the different points and it's really through that patient, responsive, careful action that we're all gonna move forward towards zero waste. So I just wanted to uh, say thank you to the city of Vancouver for uh, champion, championing this. Well, thank you very much. Um, you do have some questions. Councillor Fry, up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks. I just want to expand. You mentioned myth busting around uh, uh, compostable plastics. And I'm wondering if, if you can expand a little bit on that and, and where you see further advocacy needs to happen on, in that capacity relative to this recommendation. Yeah, um, compostable plastics, um, and I've bought them myself, um, are are often seen as, oh, well, great, we will just move from this single-use item in plastic or paper to a single-use item in a compostable form. Um, so the challenges with that is that uh, right now, even with the certifiable, certified compostable plastic, um, that most of our municipally built um, or run systems, uh, or even the private systems, do not hold the materials long enough um, to meet the same conditions that they have in the standards, which means that the plastics don't necessarily break down. Um, However, if they go in the recycling stream, then they also contaminate that stream. So they tend, from a waste management perspective, to be seen as a contaminant. Um, 
if if producers were to take them all back and then develop their own systems at their own cost through an EPR program, then perhaps they could be a solution. But right now, um, it, it shouldn't be up to uh, municipal municipalities to be building and servicing product material types that have been um, released by producers without kind of that concept of what will happen to them at end of life. And this item has also been flagged when um, the federal government's been looking at uh, plastics and how to deal with it, and they flag the need for standards so that something that is uh, identified as compostable would truly break down. But the other issue is it's still a single-use product, and we are consuming more resources on our planet than we can uh, sustainably manage, particularly in North America. We are, uh, I'd say we're over-consuming our share by quite a bit, so we need to move away from single-use items. Great. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. And um, we have more questions. Counsel Councillor Weeb, go ahead. Yeah, I follow up on that. Looking at the zero waste hierarchy 7.0 that uh, zero waste PC supports, it really focuses on rethink, reduce, reuse, um, and separates recycled compost. Because what we have heard is that these cups are compostable anyways. Why do we need to move forward with this circular system? So can you talk a little bit about why you're supporting a program that really moves away from the idea that we can recycle and compost our way out of this? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and it really is because um, uh, we're we're lucky that the concept of the ecological footprint uh, arose partly uh, with work done in the city of Vancouver at UBC, um, and uh, and so it's really about. How do we um, ensure that the systems and products and the way we get those products is done in a sustainable fashion, that we're not over-consuming the amount of resources that we use? So um, it still takes a lot of um, resources and energy, and with that energy often greenhouse gases, to make any of the material. So if we're only using material for a very short period of time, um, then that means that we are likely to be over-consuming our share of the resources. And so it's about um, thinking about how do we, uh, I mean, for, for beverages in particular, you know, if we wanted to rethink it, um, in Italy they have very few to-go containers because they like to enjoy their beverage in the uh, cafe that they purchase it in. Could we try to shift our culture to be able to um, have that kind of experience when we're having a beverage rather than chugging it back as we're in our car or on our way somewhere. Um, and then if we are going to bring it somewhere, um, then, you know, could we have a reusable cup that we bring ourselves that's part of the share system or that may be part of uh, uh, a broader system as other communities uh, start joining in as well. Um, and so that can help to reduce materials use the greenhouse gas impact. Um, and when we look at materials use, then it's all of the upstream pollution as well as land use change that is associated with that. Okay, and has the pandemic made a pretty big um, impact on the amount of single use items? Uh, I think we can say for sure, yes. <laughs> um, uh, initial, initially at the beginning of the pandemic, um, when it was less clear uh, how the, um, the virus was being transmitted, um, the initial recommendations were let's stop the reuse of, of things because perhaps it could be on surfaces. As the research came out, and I think Councillor Fry earlier alluded to the study done by the Toronto um, Public Health school there, um, it found out that that was not the, the, the big concern in terms of how um, the, the, the virus is being transmitted. But as we have also heard, it, it takes a while for that message to permeate out through all the companies that might be uh, serving customers. So, you know, every time a message like that happens, it takes a while for everybody to learn that, oh, it's okay. Um, so we see that the province has and the, the BC Center for Disease Control have put out those messages. Um, there was also obviously a lot more single use for other things that we didn't normally have as widespread, such as masks and things like that. And that is well over time on the, those questions. Uh, but you have more questions. Councillor Bly, go ahead, up to three minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and thanks very much for, for your work, of course, um, in the zero waste space, but also uh, for coming to speak to Council. I just am curious if you um, could help us understand what are some of those um, 
key drivers that change consumer behavior away from what would be considered um, maybe convenient or habitual and really creating that lasting change. And, and we see that around our, our grocery stores and, and um, bag use, although it's been slow. I, I just wonder if you could offer any insight in, in helping council understand um, how a fee or something like that changes consumer behavior or doesn't. Yes, it, it can. It, it, um, when you want to, when you're taking a look at behavior, um, it's about for the behavior, what are the barriers and benefits? So what you're doing for barriers, why, why doesn't somebody bring their own cup? Oh, I didn't know I could bring it. Um, so then that's an information piece. Um, or you're making it harder to do the action that you don't want them to do. So if you don't want them to have single use, be using single use cups, then you add a fee. For all of those, um, you know, you want to be monitoring to see what um, the results are to make sure it's having the intended benefit um, and or uh, desired behavior, as well as seeing what the if there's unintended consequences and then how you can address those. So, uh, when you have a monetary uh, fee to it um, or you know some sort of incentive, uh, it looks like it's important to make sure it's adequate to get the behavior that you need. So that's why the province raised the deposit rates on the beverage containers for being returned because five cents all of a sudden is now the smallest denomination we have and it wasn't necessarily uh, providing the same level of incentive as it did when it first was rolled out. So you need to uh, have the incentive, you need to maintain the incentive, you need to monitor to make sure that it is uh, effective, but also take a look within a whole suite of uh, barriers and benefits that can be put in place, as well as the key one, which is really making it the norm. We're a species that really likes to follow along with other people. And so the more we can see other people um, bringing their own cups or drinking uh, within yeah, the facility. I just have, mm -hmm. I did, sorry, we don't have much time. I just have one quick follow up. Um, and that is, it, I, we've, I heard a research, a behavior researcher on this topic on, on the, um, on a news program the other day talking about reducing the cost of something from what they would normally pay is far greater incentive. So we've seen retail chains, they would say reduce the coffee, let's say by 10 cents if you bring your own cup, and that that's more likely to produce behavioral change versus punitive fees. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've heard studies both ways. So, um. I think for that, I, there is a really good researcher, Dr. Doug McKenzie Moore, um, who has uh, a website uh, um, and uh, does a lot of talks. And so I think um, for for really in-depth information like that, I think uh, contacting somebody like him might be good because I have, as I say, heard uh, things uh, go both ways on, on the results. Right. Okay. Thanks. thanks so much. Yep. Thanks so much, Councillor Bly, and thank you so much, um, Sue, for, for uh, your work with um, Zero Waste BC and for taking the time with us at Council. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Is uh, Speaker 6, Brian Liu, on the phone? Yes. Hello. Hi. Yes. Uh, I hear you clearly. Up to five minutes. Go ahead. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I acknowledge that I'm speaking on the unseed traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salo-Tooth nations. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because this is my first time speaking at Council. Uh, I am a regular citizen of Vancouver, so I'm a Vancouver citizen. Um, and uh, basically, I, I've been educating myself on the plastic crisis, and you know, I've been concerned about the impacts of the plastic crisis, not just on the environment, but also on, on people. And um, so that drove me to want to find recommendations or find, um, try to find and understand the problem and the scope of action that we're taking as a city. Um, I've prepared some questions that highlight the concerns I have. However, I also acknowledge that I'm just a individual in an island uh, in this discussion. And I feel that a lot of my peers have already brought up really great, really great points. Um, so I'm really pleased by the report already trying to tackle some of the unfairness with the inequality that's been introduced with the plastic single-use ban. Uh, and, but uh, I also have concerns about 
some of the other aspects. So the first one is that I feel the 18 months um, deadline to provide a timeline for businesses to move to reusable cups to stay or provide the option of cup sharing. I want to understand like if that is if, if that can be shortened because it feels like this is a problem that is increasing in scope and we need to address it urgently. Um, I understand also that the city cannot collect taxes from single-use items, but I'm wondering what actions can the city use to hold the companies accountable to make positive changes towards the reduction of single-use plastics. And I'm also wondering if there's a way to incentivize businesses to invest that money that they collect into educating the public about the behavior change that needs to occur for uh, plastic single-use items to be reduced. I also, I also feel that consumers shouldn't really be the main bearer of responsibility to change. I understand that the city has their hands limited, um, but I feel, I feel that it's, it's an equity issue. Single-use plastics were pushed onto consumers intentionally by the plastic industry, I think way back in the 1960s. And so we are now expected to change our behavior for this problem that was not really our fault. And also I feel that relying on a consumer and de demand-based change, it seems like an unfair lever that you're, uh, not you, um, that is being applied to affect this change that's really needed. Um, however, I don't really have a alternative solution that I, I can come up with at this moment in time. I just really think it's important to emphasize the equity concerns of the population. Great. Thank you um, so much. I think you, your uh, comments, your concerns, and the issues you you um, have raised have been heard clearly by council. So very much appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Uh, Brian? Okay. Um, speaker 7, Alex Stein. Speaker 7 is not on the line. Thank you. Uh, Cody Irwin, CEO of ShareWares. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, perfectly. You have up to five minutes. Go ahead. Great. Uh, my name is Cody Irwin from ShareWares in Vancouver, uh, speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Uh, we're just outside uh, Olympic Village. A little bit of background of our business. Um, here we are, COVID Pivot, our small business uh, that was running for 10 years, uh, was almost completely annihilated by the pandemic. And instead of shutting up our shop, we uh, repurposed all of our resources to create a, uh, an impact venture. Uh, so we launched a clean tech platform that can offer cup sharing as well as integrate almost anything else designed to be reused. Um, Ours is an innovation on the age-old deposit model to be inclusive and also to be able to easily and effortlessly plug into existing city infrastructure uh, as well as business systems. Um, yeah, if we wanted our products just to flow just like single use right through the system so there's minimal habit and behavioral change. Uh, we, we even do all the washing uh, if the uh, business doesn't have uh, those facilities. So we can do uh, both model centralized or, or decentralized washing facilities. Um, all businesses, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, all, all the business has to do to, to sign up has pretty much give us uh, the go-ahead. Um, they add a few lines of text uh, that we've had approved. I mean, it depends on your Vancouver Coastal Health Inspector, but you just add uh, some lines of text to your food, is, food safety plan. Uh, and as soon as that's approved, you're good to go. It takes minutes to set up a program uh, because like, it flows just like single use. You charge a deposit just like you would like a, a can of pop uh, or something like that when you're uh, at checkout. Um, to answer some of the questions that were brought up, um, our, our product, our, our, our platform does allow for it in uh, stay in uh, reuse programs if a company doesn't have their own washing systems. So they, uh, that was one thing that was brought up. 
uh, there's uh, no up upfront costs for our cup sharing program, so it's really no barrier to really get started. Um, uh, uh, cup shares can work with delivery apps, uh, as was already uh, stated before. Um, and uh, the events, uh, events and concerts uh, are already, uh, what was mentioned as a low-hanging fruit. Uh, we've already just proven out this model. We were we did events with Vancouver Mural Festival in the summertime. Uh, we saved like 4,000 uh, units from going to the landfill, and then we just recently uh, finished up their their winter festival that was at the their, their hub at the Vancouver Art Gallery, uh, doing um, yeah coffee cups and wine cups and um, reusable uh, cocktail cups. Um, uh, our cups are also lighter weight. They're not uh, big, heavy units, so they they uh, they don't have throwing concerns at like concerts. So we could be in Rogers Center. We could be doing this at uh, you know any festival out there. Um, I see blizzards or like sorry, we we do uh, hot cups, cold cups, uh, and we also we're launching smoothies next week. Um, uh, blizzards were brought up. I think blizzards are seen more of a, as a food item, and I think that could be tackled with a, an evolution on this uh, into the, the takeout food uh, space, which, which we can also address. Um, Sean uh, from the Business Project, uh, I so appreciate him coming in and, and speaking. Uh, we've, we've spoken in the past. We were at um, some, uh, uh, yeah, we were at that, the last event with him. Um, and by him speaking and bringing up the concerns, this is going to be huge for, for the movement uh, so that we can uh, take more account of what's actually happening in the community and the, and the vulnerable community itself. Uh, but I do believe that this, our, our solution being a deposit model actually adds an extra uh, source of revenue for uh, for that. And uh, we, we haven't been, or for uh, like the binners, um, because everything does have value, so if it ends up in the environment or ends up in the you know a garbage bin or any anywhere, it still can be reclaimed and brought back to us uh, for for cash. Um, and yeah, that being that uh, increased revenue stream for them, um, we do need to like you know uh, lean into this sustainability effort, uh, changing and breaking down these these systems and, and starting again or. or you know, evolving it is going to take time and there's going to be some struggles doing it, but we do have to lean into it to be able to find out what those struggles are so that we can we can address them directly and, and solve them. Um, there's, uh, yeah, even with the hiring opportunities, we've just hired on a, a second person uh, with barriers to employment and we plan on um, expanding that because we, we see that our, our concepts can be a, a new utility for circular cities, uh, being that washing service that coordinates with all the other uh, municipal utilities, and, and this could be uh, replicated around the world. Um, uh, some of the, the you have projects that were brought up right? were... Oh, the vault. There's, there's. Uh, yeah, I guess the binners could also run a charity project to be uh, collecting um, maybe these fees if people want to do charitable donations or or organize the pass back program to actually make it more equitable. Um, yeah, ask me about marketing and ask me about uh, infrastructure. <laughs> okay. No, you. you yeah, you're at, you're at your time, but you do have some questions, so please uh, stay on okay. the line. Councilor Dominato, up to three minutes. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Cody, for calling in today. Um, I, I have a question um, uh, with respect to uh, your vendors, and, and you described sort of set, getting set up. Um, can you give me a sense of, of how many vendors, retailers uh, are working with you now and have programs in place? Uh, so we have 20 locations, um, and some go on and off because they're like, like a Vancouver Mirror Festival was just for two and a half weeks. Um, but so th those aren't accounted in the 20. But in the next, I think in next week, we'll have another 15. And then next month, uh, at least another 10. And that's not with our ongoing sales and our expansion into other areas like takeout containers and everything that's kind of in process. So um, it, it's moving fast and these fees are are amazing for getting on radars in the summertime. We could only get audiences of environmental businesses, and um, they're just super busy. And so, it, um, uh, yeah, until the fee came online, we were getting two to four uh, setups a week. And then as soon as this meeting was talked about that maybe there's a change to the policy, uh, taps are turned off on those small businesses. So it's really good at keeping them motivated to get going. No, it's helpful. Thank you. And, and when, when did you start the business? When did you have the first vendors come online? Uh, in the summertime, uh, was it, uh, or I guess uh, early fall, 
in September we did a I started a pilot. Well, actually, I mean, we had an office come on in like last spring, and then we did Vancouver Mural Fest in the in the summer, and then we had uh, five cafes start the pilots with our when our, we launched our technology in September, I think it was, um, and then uh, yeah, and then we grew from there. We grew quite a bit as soon as like right before the policy came in place. And um, what's your experience with um, was having some conversations with uh, some companies based in the UK and Europe? And what's your experience of what they're doing overseas? Are they further ahead uh, in terms of uh, uh, Sharewares Cup Share programs? There is some uh, wide scale um, programs in like in Germany um, that you know like hundreds and hundreds of locations. Uh, working on just like a, a euro deposit type model, um, I and yeah, this, there is some on that uh, like a fiat side or I guess a physical cash side uh, that are doing great uh, as things transition to digital. They they need options and innovation in that area. Um, I like there isn't really anything like there's two other companies that have a similar deposit system as us uh, that I know of in the world, um, but. I don't think either one of them is as 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 advanced, uh, and we beat out the biggest player uh, just recently for our contract. So, um, yeah, there's huge opportunity with what we're doing. Thank you. That's my time. Thank you. Um, you do have some more questions, Councillor Bly. Over to you for three minutes. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Cody, for being here. This uh, sort of get the sense of the energy behind you speaking. So, it must be a very exciting time for for you and your business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. So just can, in my internet cutting in and out a little bit there. So forgive me if I missed you saying, can you just take us back to when you started a cup share or sharewares and what your um, sort of impetus to do that was? We were doing a bunch of zero waste initiatives for corporate offices, doing bulk systems, sparkling water on tabs, flavored systems, kegerator systems, uh, and there was a big push to go zero waste in the, the technology sector. Uh, it was coming out of California. Some big CEOs were like, yes, this is where we're going to go. Let's get rid of all the packaging. So we designed all the systems to do that, and we started uh, yeah, setting up programs uh, around the city, uh, and then COVID happened, and we dropped ninety eight percent overnight, and then everything reversed back to single use, single use packaging. Uh, so we just continued down that zero waste role because we 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 knew that that's that's how we can uh, 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 to live sustainably on this earth. Uh, we can't consider continue the linear economy of, of take make waste. Uh, circularity needs to be implemented soon now. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that entirely. Um, so I wonder, you mentioned about um, that your your model is more deposit-based, and I've heard varying, I think, you know, I don't want to quote numbers, but I think yours is lower than others I've heard. Um, some, some sort of have touted the number around maybe even up to like $3 or something like that for um, a reusable cup share program. Do you have sort of a benchmark or ha like how are you gathering your data and, and informing your decision making around how to best set up your business that will drive the right kind of behavior from consumers? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't kind of get the question. Like how, how I'm 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 just hearing very like the speaker before you said that they charge five dollars a month and then you can take as you know you can sort of have as many containers as you you need and eventually I guess they'll they'll catch up with you and maybe you'll get charged ten dollars I don't know for the container I don't he didn't say that but I'm just um trying to fill in the gaps because there's some information we just have but for you it's it's a fee right like it's it's just a rental like when you go in you go to the coffee shop you go to the counter I want to use one of those cups it's like I don't know a dollar fifty or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, how did you land on that number and that model? That was to absorb our our, our costs to uh, and be able to make it um, affordable for us to lose containers if 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 they did fall out of the system. Um, okay. And and yeah and. We sourced out um, a, a very low cost model. We like cheaper, cheaper than China, uh, and but m way better. We our products are made, or our coffee cups are made by a B Corp uh, in North America, so it's you know uh, ethically sourced, uh, and it's all made out of 100% recycled content. And we're getting it cheaper than if we ordered it from overseas. So we were able to uh, keep those fees as low as possible. Um, and we're working directly with the manufacturer. That's it for your time, Councillor oh. Bly. Sorry about Thanks, that. Chair. Sorry. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I know it goes fast. Um, Councillor Weeb, over to you for three minutes. Yeah, thanks, Cody, for coming in. I just have one quick question, and that is we've heard that we're optimistic that there's enough capacity in Vancouver. Do you think that there's enough um, business in the circular economy or enough capacity to be able to handle the amount of volume if the majority of organizations switch over to a shared use system? If they all switched over today, nope, uh, but I, I'm a mechanical engineer. I love building and designing systems and robotics and machines and all that kind of stuff. So we are extremely jazzed to uh, to build out what that infrastructure looks like. I know that there's another um, a system in place that's looking at doing a similar thing locally uh, to meet capacity. So um, yeah, I, I am very optimistic and I, I'm not worrying about it. The amount of uh, th throughput right now relative to the amount of cups going to waste is, is very low um, and consumers right now are uh, they're all about convenience so like I'll pay 25 cents whatever it's just more convenient um, so having it at a low rate now uh, is is actually helpful for building out the whole infrastructure system with the delivery and the pickup logistics and partnering with other companies that are already delivering to pick up stuff for us uh, and, and have that already happening um, and then as it grows, uh, it will, yeah, I think it will I think it'll work out perfectly um, as, it, as it rolls out and people get more uh, aware of w why they should be using reuse and not that. And then the convenience will be increased too if we can work with the city on building infrastructure to help those reverse logistics, um, then it will be a no-brainer for them. So I, I think that it will all work out perfectly in line. Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great, thanks, Councillor Weeb. Councillor Fry, over to you for five uh, for three minutes. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Cody. Um, expanding on some of Councillor Bly's sort of questioning, given uh, you guys are a buck a buck fifty deposit on on a on a cup, do you see the opportunity for as you scale the operation to reduce that fee so that it becomes a little bit more comparable to the idea of well, I could pay twenty five cents for a single use cup, or I could pay say fifty cents for this reusable cup and then even sort of along the same lines as we have, you know, binners who are actively out collecting other refundable deposit items. You see an opportunity to reduce the price point as you scale up? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's always, uh, yeah, with growth and with the kind of scale, yes, you can always reduce costs. You don't want to reduce things so much that people don't see the value in it and so that you just throw it away. But in our case, if they did throw it away and we did have an active, uh, you know, collections or like if binners knew that people were throwing it away, then they'd start be going into garbages to, to pull out all of these items. Um, but most likely they put it into recycling because we're in Vancouver. Um, but yeah, there's uh, adjusting costs uh, is definitely there. But I think create, getting creative to uh, address the uh, people that maybe um, you know, don't want to spend the dollar fifty or can't spend the dollar fifty, like working with the city to be able to develop programs um, to make it easy and not stigmatize anybody. Uh, I mean, there's tons of young, hungry entrepreneurs uh, in you know in this space right now, and we all want to get creative and innovate. And so I, I don't see there being anything that we can't surmount from everything I've been he hearing so far. And so, how many times can that cup be reused? Shared. But it, it depends on the the use. If the like uh, if the people are kicking them down the street, then they're not not very long because the, a business won't want to you know fill them up uh, again. Um, but then people are disincentivized by you know they're going to lose their money if they do that. Um, so yeah, I mean it's a, it's like a, if you have any polypropylene items at home, uh, like your ticket or ticket containers or um, Tupperwares or something like that, you're washing those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Gotcha. Uh, okay. And last, and you're lastly, fine. I just want to I just want to zero in on one question because I just have a little bit of time. Um, we heard earlier that, that there may be potentially issues with Vancouver Coastal Health and how dirty cups are stored. Have you run into that at all? Nope, not yet. Uh, we just had to Coastal Health check our uh, our facility and approve it. Um, or give us a letter of no objection and told us that they just went by on, one of on our the clients side. and customer. On the, on the retailers? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, it, sorry. Uh, I expanded on my... Uh, yes, the, and the, the uh, rep said that they had just checked out one of our locations and it was, there was no concern. Great. Thanks, Cody. Okay, Ben, that's it for your questions. Thank you very much for coming, speaking, and um, answering those questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Speaker 9, Isalina Zazara, you? Hi. 
Hey there. Yes, thank you. Yep, go ahead. You have up to five minutes. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Isalina Zazariu. I'm one of the co-founders of Mugshare and a director of operations at Mugshare. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Solitude, and Squamish nations. I also want to say that I am grateful for all the work that the staff and the council have done to address this issue. I appreciate the challenge and the intricacies of introducing this cup fee to reduce single-use waste in Vancouver, and I appreciate everyone spending the time to review it. I'm going to share a little bit about our program. So we are a deposit return program. How our program works is you go to a participating location, you pay a deposit on your mug, and you can turn it to any of our participating locations for your deposit returned. Our system does not require an app or a membership or an account to use. And we're quite confident in our model as back when in 2019, we piloted our, our program. Um, our competition at the time, Copy, worked with a different system using an app-based program. After our respective pilots, we found that there was a significant uptake of our program on the user side compared to Copy's app-based program, which is why we are so confident in our deposit return model. And since that pilot have actually merged with Copy and we're working together um, on Mugshare to create this program that is accessible for all of those in Vancouver. We're constantly working to make sure our program is financially accessible while staying financially sustainable. And to ensure that this program is financially accessible, in addition to not requiring a smartphone to, smartphone to participate, we offer community mugs, which are designed for people who find the deposit a barrier. Um, this is based off of, an honor, uh, based off of a needs-based honor system. Um, and it was actually brought to our attention by one of our partner cafes who started to do this kind of honor system of a no deposit mug. Um, this is at Globe in Kelowna, um, and we have introduced it to our network. <clears throat> and I'm speaking today uh, to support uh, the recommendation B specifically. Um, we're eager to work with the city, nonprofits, and other organizations to further remove barriers to our mug sharing program to look at how we can further reduce single use waste in Vancouver. Uh, we did notice that the toolkits that were sent out by the city of Vancouver did increase uh, adoption of our program at different cafes uh, close to the end of December. And we are in support of additional information and education being sent to businesses to make them aware and encourage them to participate in luxury programs. That's all I have to say. I'm open to questions if there's any questions. I think you were very clear. Oh, there are questions though. Um, go ahead, Councillor Dominato. Yeah, three minutes. Uh, thank you and, and thanks for calling in today. And um, uh, Really appreciate your passion for this, and and I, I know um, it's been a learning curve for me. And a few years ago, I adopted. Uh, I was saying earlier, um, carrying my own little mug around, carrying in my my mom purse. I call it because it's huge. I have everything there for my kids. And um, but I'm curious about your experience of you started in 2016. You've grown. Um, it seems quite significantly uh, in the last couple of years. And and. Did you see that trend, like regardless of the bylaw, that was that trend there already? You were seeing increasing vendors coming online and interest in your program? Prior to the bylaw, we had about 20 cafes engaged. We were we started as a club at UBC and, and really UBC founded. We had a really great uh, success at UBC. And I think a lot of that had to do with um, UBC being forward thinking space, as well as uh, UBC introducing a, or we're looking at introducing a fee for single-use uh, cups. Um, but we were successful at and operating at 20 cafes prior to the City of Vancouver's fee. That's correct. That's fantastic. No, I think it's great. And my colleague, uh, Councillor Weeb, has his own here right now. Uh, so I see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thanks for calling in today and, and sharing a bit more about your experience. It's helpful. Okay, thanks, Councillor Dominato, and um, and thank you, Isalina. I really appreciate the work you're doing and uh, answering those questions and speaking to us. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, should I go back and see if Alex Stein is on the line? Great. Is Alex Stein on the line? That's speaker number seven. No, uh, speaker seven is. Uh, sorry, speaker seven is not on the line. Okay. Well, Council, it's um, what is it? Ten to two. And we finished speakers on item one. Um, so we are now going to move to um, uh, to uh, the debate on it, but I need someone to move a motion. Uh, that's Councillor... Um, what was that? That's that? Councillor... I'm sorry. Councillor Weed. Councillor Carr. 
Yes, Councillor Bly. Oh, I wasn't sure if you were referring to the queue. Uh, you or... are on the queue. Are you on the queue? I mean, I just had Councillor Weeb move this, but were you on the queue for a reason? I was on the queue to move uh, the report and also ask um, if uh, Council would entertain a short recess. And uh, there are uh, um, potential amendments, and because we're dealing with bylaws, they need to go through legal. And I have um, prepared some amendments, and staff do have them right now. Um, so I'm just curious if we would entertain a recess to allow staff the time required to ensure that they are legally sound. Um, yes, I've, um, actually city manager. Oh, he's not here. Um, so <laughs> I can't ask him how long would be needed. I'm sorry. Um, clerk, go ahead. If, yes. Uh, we're just going to get a, um, a timing on that from the clerk. So meanwhile, I'm going to move us to a main queue. Um, I've got councillors Bly, Swanson and Dijanova on, so I'm going to just put you all on again. Um, so, Councillor Dijanov, you could just not add yourselves. It was a different order. It was Bly, Swanson, Dijanova. So, I'm clearing the queue. Let me do it, please. Thank you. Um. Great. Okay. Um, so, I've um, yes, City Manager, the amount of time to, about. 10 minutes. Um, so we will take a 10 minute break in order to have, and councillors, if this is the time staff is reviewing things, if you haven't already submitted your amendment, do it right now. Um, I'd rather not take another break around this, so please do get your amendments in. Procedure. Thank you. So 10 minutes. Point of procedure. Oh, point of procedure. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I just wanted to make sure I don't have any amendments right now that I'm submitting because I think some of them will overlap. But I'm just wondering, do we have to submit our amendments? We we have every right to do that on the floor of council if we wanted to. I'm suggesting for the sake okay. of efficiency for this meeting, Thank all you. of councillors present and staff, that if you have one, um, please submit it now. Of course, you are always free to submit something last minute. No problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right.
Ready to start um, again? Oh, um, sorry, Councillor Kirby Young. We're, um, I'm going to ask you to just be quiet over there in that corner. And uh, we are ready to start. Councillor Bly, um, you are on the speaker's list right now. Uh, this motion has been moved. It was moved, um, um, I think just before you said anything, it was moved by uh, Councillor Weeb in chambers. So uh, motion is on the floor. Speaking to the motion, Councillor Bly. Thank you, Chair. And I, and I just know we were on recess to uh, hear from staff, and I do appreciate their quick turnaround. Of course, that means I only got it about 30 seconds ago. Um, so You can remove yourself and come back on the list. No, that's okay. I'm about to push send here. Ah, got it. Right? Like, I, I, I'm, I was waiting on legal to get back on the amendments, and of course, I want to send them to our clerks and to the rest of council. Okay, I think I have that there. So I'm going to move everyone to, I'm assuming you're sending an amendment and speaking to I it. Have. I will move us yes, to a, an you. amendment queue. Great, thank you. And I'll add you on so you can do whatever you need to do and I'll make sure that you're on there. Okay, great. So I've just sent in the amendment and um, I'll just provide some brief remarks. Um, First of all, appreciating staff's very quick turnaround um, on, on reviewing how the bylaw was landing in, in various contexts and appreciate the work um, required to, to do that and have that back before March 15th. And also to acknowledge the speakers for coming to speak to council today um, from every sort of sector that, that plays a role in reducing our single use waste, which I support wholeheartedly. Um, that said, and particularly our shareable folks at the very end there that bring a ton of energy and, and clearly have been working on this for, for some time, um, you know, at least a couple of years or more uh, around reducing um, single use waste and how it ties nicely with a zero waste initiatives for those organizations that have been working for years in that space as well. So it's all sort of happening. And um, if I may just introduce this, these amendments that specifically address the recommendations in the staff report. Um, and just to summarize, so we're, we're asking that the sections of, uh, we, I am asking that the sections of the license bylaw uh, number 4450 and the ticket offenses bylaw number 9360 in line with what was passed and enacted um, all the way back um, in, in 2020 that were previously amended to reduce single use uh, beverage cups be repealed so that the fee for the cups for the beverage cups the 25 cents be repealed we're also asking that council resolve to work with our provincial and federal counterparts to facilitate and enable prompt coordinated action on these single use items and create a more um, comprehensive regional provincial and national strategy and actions around dealing with single use it's clear that the bylaw amendments haven't actually been as effective as one had hoped uh, in reducing the use of single-use cups, and we've even heard from, from our, some of our speakers that it's challenging to get the businesses to get on board with investing in these reusable cup share programs because it lacks because they lack direction. Um, so various national, multinational corporations are really receiving millions of dollars in new revenue without any clear strategy to achieve the city single-use cup uh, reduction objectives, and I think that should be a significant concern to this council. The recommendations in the report have not sufficiently addressed the challenges that we saw with the bylaw initially that created the, the need for the review. Um, I think we need a complete rethink on a commitment to bring back effective solutions. And this approach is really top down um, and has not been met with the public support. Those that support have a vested interest, although it's credible and it's absolutely warranted, and we need partners to enable a, a circular economy and reduce our single-use waste. There's also a vested interest in supporting this bylaw. So in closing, we support the diversion of single-use waste away from the landfill 100%, one, and there are other ways to do it, especially given that the bylaw isn't reducing single-use cups in its, in, in, its, um, in, in its current form. So with provincial and federal governments that are currently contemplating significant actions to reduce uh, and address the use of single-use items, including beverage cups and plastic bags. So that's going to lead to the regional, provincial, and national strategies that are going to be much more effective and will supersede the individual actions of any city. 
Um, so as a local government, I think, you know, we have a tough job to do as city council, mayor and council, um, and that's really striking a balance and recognizing our limitations. Um, that means we sometimes have to make some tough calls and acknowledge when something isn't working. And at the local level, we've stepped out in front uh, of our provincial and federal partners on this one, and it's just added to the unaffordability of our of our city. So I'll leave it there. Um, and thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, to the amendment, um, Mayor Stewart. Thanks, uh, Chair. I have a question, a point of information to the mover of the uh, amendment. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Blyes, your intention is to basically scrap the whole program. No, it's not. Well, removing the 25% fee would seem to be the core of the entire program. And so. Well, I would disagree. There's a lot of education. There's outreach. There's a single, there's a plastic bag. There's still the paper bag fee of 15 cents. Um, so there's, I would say that the majority of the program in its entirety is intact. It, we are just addressing the various issues that come with the actual um, cup fee, including the, the equity issue, of course. Okay. And um, can I ask you what changed your mind? Because you said that you uh, weren't going to do this, but now you're saying you want to scrap the, the program. I don't know when I said I wasn't going to do this, and I'm not sure what you mean by this. Well, you're. Um, uh, through the chair that my point of information is previously you said that you support the program and now you're saying that you, you want to remove the core of the program. I would say that I don't know what you're referring to. If you're referring to the vote two years ago, um, yeah, a lot has been uncovered in this process. I think by many on this council have, have learned a lot in this process in terms of um, what we understood to be sort of the readiness of industry, um, the readiness of the consumer, uh, how it was actually going to roll out, and the nuances from the various types of beverages to the different kinds of service to the different ways in which it hits equity uh, groups. I think we had an inadequate um, amount of information to fully make this decision. So um, my bringing the review forward, Mayor, was the first indication that something's not quite right. And as I've already stated, uh, I don't think that those issues have been satisfied uh, in this report. Thank you. Uh, Chair, yes, I, uh, since this was just brought to us now, um, I'm wondering if we might have a 10-minute a, a recess for us to adjust the, uh, to just uh, look at the legal um, language here uh, and to, to think about what this means before we vote on, on scrapping this whole program. So I'd, I'd ask if we could have a 10-minute uh, recess. Um, Mayor, if you're, you're um, sorry, if you, um, just to, to not put words in your mouth, but if you want to review it, would you like, because law did look at this, would you like a report from staff on this? Or no. for them to speak I to us? Ten minutes is fine uh, for me. I just I just haven't looked at any of the text, and so I, I don't need any assistance. I just require, I think, ten minutes to look at something that's been sprung on us at the last minute to to reverse such a major program that's been instituted by businesses right across the city. So okay. Uh, okay. I request ten minutes. Sure. All right. Um, I like to have people vote that are informed. So we'll take a ten minute break. Thanks very much.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, Mayor Stewart, you have the floor. Thanks so much. Uh, after a careful reading of the amendment, I'll be voting against it. We heard clearly from the head of the industry, uh, Greg Wilson, said that small businesses have put um, uh, thousands of dollars into their uh, adjusting to our new regulations and that any major change would, requ would require them to invest thousands more uh, either reversing or changing. So he clearly said, don't make any major changes. Small minor adjustments are uh, what they would prefer. So uh, that's why I'm against this amendment uh, because it essentially guts our uh, commitment to reducing waste. Uh, which is bad for the planet and also hard on the city because uh, the the Delta landfill is uh, nearing capacity. Um, so um, that's my reasons uh, for, for opposing this amendment. Uh, we can't flip flop. We have to stay the course with minor adjustments if needed. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mayor. Um, to the amendment, Councillor DiGenova. I'm just having some technical difficulties here. Are there I see Councillor Kirby Young's on the queue, so I'll take myself off for a moment and let her go first. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, I'm just going to briefly offer one comment and maybe save a bit of time in response to the mayor's comment. And I acknowledge that we're getting a lot of uh, feedback that's coming at us from different perspectives. And I think we have to, you know, look at it holistically in a way that the feedback from the one um, representative of the Retail Council of Canada that the mayor cited is only one organization. We've also heard from Restaurants Canada, who I might um, offer and small businesses that have a different point of view that would support um, not having the fee. And I think that depending upon the organization, we have to weigh the totality and of the feedback. And so when I hear folks like the local entrepreneur from the juice truck that uh, says that this is a profit center for businesses or, you know, I think the restaurant sector as a whole, based on my conversations, whether it's with individual restaurants, Restaurants Canada and others, would quite rather that we didn't have this fee, feel that um, it's over-regulation, um, which is difficult. Um, it's imposing additional harm during businesses when it's a really tough time. Their staff are trying to get out of COVID. And that I think we're in a happy situation that this is happening anyway. We don't need to over-regulate it because it's gaining momentum in terms of the innovation that we're seeing coming forward from the sector. Um, but it isn't necessarily dissuading people from the rest of the fee. There's a lot that has to be done in terms of education here. Um, and I heard loud and clear that um, we're simply not ready. And what this is asking, let's not make any bones about it, is to wait a year and a half possibly before we might um, implement re a requirement for businesses to have reusable programs, at which point that profit center, some small businesses have described it by their, not my words, theirs, um, will continue to accrue in bank accounts. And so I think we've got to be pretty um, fair in reflecting all the different feedback that we are hearing. The one thing that I'm also really concerned about is what we heard from the Binners Project. And I think that, you know, kudos to staff for trying to deal with the equity issue. And they did, certainly, if it's with respect to free vouchers coming forward. But this really doesn't impact on folks that are just really low income or even middle income that are really struggling with affordabilities. And we heard that loud and clear. I think the representative, Sean, from Binners Project said that it's resignation and it's learned helplessness. And I think it's resignation in the city as a whole, too. This is one other thing in overregulation that has been done to them. And I used the term earlier. It has become like one of those examples where these, con these policies are tough because it's where climate butts up against equity. Everybody wants to speak to both, but we can't abandon equity and leave it behind. And I think I described it earlier as champagne environmentalism. So I'm going to leave my comments there for now and save some time. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kirby. Young, Councillor DiGenova. To the amendment. Thanks so much. Um, I'm prepared to support the amendment. I had actually drafted something that was quite similar, but uh, in in hopes for not duplicating all of this, um, uh, I'm I'm just going to support this. I mean, we still are on item one, and it's 2:43. So I I think that um, first of all, I want to thank staff. I do appreciate the work that you've done on this, and and uh, the troubleshooting that you've done on this. But I think that. You know, in some of the questions that I asked and others have asked today, there, there's still some unknowns, and, and that comes down to commercial dishwashers, cup shares, the cost of those cup shares, the cost of, you know, refitting a cafe or a small coffee shop, um, and and the 
the time. I also think that, you know, there were other things that were uncovered and that we heard, you know, from, from small business owners today uh, about um, things like staff morale and frustration. You know, we, we hear about this, you know, we, we think about, you know, Dr. Bonnie Hen Henry is saying, you know, be, be kind, be calm, be safe. I'm sure I'm saying that in the wrong order, but um, I think that in, in the times that we, we are still in COVID, in a pandemic, although hopefully we'll be out of that soon and restrictions will be lifted, uh, there, there was a lot of concern over this and the people that it hurt are the lowest barrier. I appreciate that there will be information that comes back on social enterprise, even if it does serve as a retailer, but I couldn't even get that question answered today. So I am concerned when it comes to gift cards, when it comes to uh, people who have barriers, when it comes to interpretation of this. Um, and it's not that I, I don't want to move forward with green initiatives, but where is this money going? Do we know it's to green initiatives? No, it's not. So. I also think we have to look at the fact that this isn't reducing single cup beverage use. People are just paying more in many instances, and we've heard that as well. Um, the fact that this isn't regional and we're going at it alone causes a lot of confusion also. And I don't want to add to the unaffordability in our city, especially if we're not reducing um, single use cups. I, I'd go farther and talk about bags in this report, but we can't, although, you know, the chair has allowed questions on it and, and staff have been kind enough to answer them. That's not what this report is about. I still am concerned. I hear from people with disabilities who can, can't carry a uh, paper bag um, unless they're holding the bottom if it has cans or tins in it. Uh, people who do take transit, who don't have other options to, to get their groceries home. I've heard how their groceries have ended up all over the street because they only had a paper bag. That was their option. They'd forgotten their reusable bag or the store was out of reusable bags other than paper bags. So for that reason, I am gonna support this amendment. And I think sometimes we do need to pause and look at the unintended consequences. And I think looking at this with, you know, uh, by putting a lens on education, um, is really essential and important, and I'll say it now, like I said it um, before, I think that we will get farther if we use carrots instead of sticks. So uh, I will be supporting this amendment, and I hope um, other colleagues will too, because I think we are even on council from the questions we've asked today, a little bit confused about how this will move forward. And although I, you know, I heard loud and clear, um, you know, from uh, Greg Wilson, as the mayor had referenced, that there are certain changes that they would make and businesses have invested several thousands of dollars. I'd rather that we press pause on this and consider what we can do before they continue to invest thousands more dollars and we're back here addressing more problems. I think we have to be proactive about this. So I appreciate the amendment that's been brought forward by my colleague and I will support it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Dalmanato to the amendment. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thank you. I echo uh, the comments of some of my colleagues to date. Um, and just a reflection on a, a couple of points that have been raised. Um, we're all in agreement here um, as part of members of council um, that we need to reduce and eliminate, eliminate single-use items. We all know and recognize the impact it's having on our environment. Um, I think often it comes down to it's the how and the approach that's undertaken uh, by the different levels of government and whose role that is. Um, we heard some fantastic examples of sharewares and mug shares today, and I've spoken personally about my own experience over the last number of years of educating myself and my family um, about how to do things differently and purchased my own uh, reusable mug, carried it around in my purse, and the only point I stopped was on the pandemic and, and there was concern about using those mugs. Um, now I have to retrain myself and get back into that as, as things have changed and we're in the endemic. But one of the things um, I have found and why I appreciated that Councillor Bly asked staff to report back to Council is that leadership is often recognizing that you haven't necessarily got it right. Um, leadership is not necessarily standing by things uh, because you put it out there and you tried it. Um, Leadership is actually about listening, responding to the public, 
to our residents. It's pivoting. Um, and that's how I have seen this conversation is that we went down a path. Uh, we rolled out implementation of, of this initiative and um, there's a lot of gaps still. We see that in the report. And one of the things that really stood out for me, and it stood out, and I spoke to this at the time when we voted on the initial report, uh, was the role, the intertwined nature of industry and the consumer and the opportunity for education. And what I saw there was an opportunity to really drive home um, educating the consumer about changes they can make. But I'd also been having conversations with industry, and industry was already going down this path as well, recognizing they need to do differently. And right now there's actually a, apparently a shortage due to supply chains of paper cups and, re and disposable co coffee cups. And so um, there's a lot of things happening, but um, I was really struck today um, was uh, by Sean, who spoke from the Binners, and around consumer behavior change and the opportunities there. And he talked about um, incentivizing the behavior you want to see versus penalizing what you don't want to see. And he spoke about revoking the 25 cent fee. Um, and, and it was in that vein, is there's ways to do this where you give discounts or you encourage. So I would like to see fundamentally is it um, uh, that this work continue in a way where we're partnering with industry, we're educating the public, we're educating uh, vendors, and, but I, I do support uh, the amendments that have been tabled um, and also working with the different levels of government who um, are, are stepping into this area uh, to deal with uh, zero waste. And so I'll, um, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Dominato. Councillor Hardwick. I have a, a, a question. Uh, point of information. Point of information in this. Is it possible to sever an amendment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's parts of this that I really like and parts that I'm struggling with because of, uh, I don't want to lose progress that has been made. Um, but there are, as I'm looking at A, B, C, D, um, I, I think B, C, D, E are, all, are and oh, i sorry, there was an E that was an, another amendment that I saw coming in. But I just, um, I wonder about throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater on this. And so I'm, uh, I might be asking to, to sever. Just be clear about which uh, clauses. They have to be separate uh, numbers or clauses. So um, just as long as you've got that in order for the clerks. Yeah. Now or later? Um, well, we can, you've, if you are ready now to state it, you would like to sever? A from B, C, D, uh, and A from B, C, D. So B, C, D can be together and then yes. A separately. Okay. They're clear. They're nodding. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Bly. Uh, thanks very much. I'll just offer a few um, remarks based on uh, the discussion, which I do appreciate um, hearing from everybody. You know, I, personally, I've worked in small business for 25 years, and fees and taxes do not inspire innovation. They don't inspire creative programming change. They don't inspire engaging the consumer to everyone get on the same side and do what's right. And in this context, for climate, for the planet, let's reduce our waste. It divides people. And in this particular circumstance, I would say unnecessarily. Cup share programs, reusable programs are well underway. We've heard that. We have great people coming to speak today from zero waste. We've got Recycle BC. We've got the Binners Project. We've even got small local businesses who are collecting fees saying this is not a good fee. This is not a good program. We have heard from representation, uh, retail council. We've heard from restaurants. Um, um, association, and there's mixed reviews, but we have to acknowledge the fact that in COVID, coming out of what's been an absolute desperate time with federal financial programs drying up for small businesses, this is an immediate injection of cash that is probably needed, but that's not what this is for. That's not what this is about. It's about uh, reducing single-use waste. So my concern, uh, and I've heard um, some of the comments initially to this amendment is that there's a lack of understanding in how businesses actually do innovate and pivot their programs uh, to evolve based on consumer demand. And I think at the end of the day that if we are going to come at these discussions, and Councillor Kirby Young spoke to it regarding uh, where climate initiatives push up against equity, Anyone can implement a fine to be punitive to people who are not conforming. 
I'm not sure that's inspiring the kind of conversation and behavior change that we really actually need to uh, do what's right by uh, our planet and, and the climate work that's required in terms of partnership at every single level of government. So what I see in this is we penalize people who are earning hourly wages. Um, we are penalizing people who cannot afford to invest in, let's say, a $30 gift card where they can loophole and uh, find a loophole and not have to pay the single use fee. We are, we are penalizing all of those that can't really afford the added costs that uh, build up over a period of time. Those people that couldn't care less about 25 cents can afford it, makes no difference. Um, they're not even batting an eye at this. And what we aren't doing is we aren't um, what I believe to be a fundamental um, um, a fundamental part of, of climate uh, policy change is, is lean into producer responsibility. We heard from our speakers that they are struggling to get businesses to financially invest in cap share programs even after this bylaw has been brought into play because there's no direction on how to use the money. So I think at the end of the day, we've got multinational you know, chains collecting millions and millions and millions of dollars with zero accountability right out of the pockets of the people that live in our city. That's what this has created. So we're not saying don't do it. We're just saying let's do it a different way. And if 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 council can't get around that kind of common sense, um, I think it's disappointing. And this is the residents of Vancouver, who many don't even know this discussion is happening, are relying on us to use better judgment. And so I hope that these amendments are supported to show that we are able to be agile. We have the humility to say, we've rolled something out, it's not working. We need to pivot slightly around the cup fee and uh, go at this uh, in a modified way. Uh, that's really all this amendment's asking for, and I hope that um, logic will prevail here. Great, thanks, Councillor Bly. I see no one else in the queue, so um, Clerk, if you could uh, move us to a vote, and I believe we're gonna vote on A first. Um, and is that up on the screen? So, Council, you can see the additional language and the strikeout in A. That's what you're voting on first. And that vote fails with uh, myself, Mayor Stewart, Councillors Fry, Swanson, Hardwick, Weeb, and Boyle in opposition. Great. Okay, we are now moving on to um, the amendment C and D. I mean, sorry, B, C, and D, sorry. Councillor Kirby Young. Oh, okay. And um, that vote fails uh, with Councillors Carr, Stewart, Fry, Swanson, Weeb, and Boyle in opposition. Okay, um, Councillors, we are back to um, the main queue. And um, Councillor Bly, do you have anything else to add on the main queue? I'll hold my comments for now, thank you. Okay, Councillor Swanson, go ahead to the motion. Yeah, I think it's good that we do this. Um, we, we need to reduce rate waste, it's pretty simple. I, it is complicated. We did have some glitches. I think our staff is trying to work it out. I think these recommendations will help them work it out. Um, I'm glad to have free stuff exempted, especially uh, free water. I think that's really important. I'm glad the staff is working with nonprofits. Um, I ho hope and I expect that this will include the Binners project in terms of coming up with a, 
with some new um, things to do around maintaining equity. I'm glad there's going to be a legal requirement to accept the cups. Um, it would be good if we could get the 25 cents ourselves, but I'm okay with leaving this in staff hands to see what they can do. The points made by the speakers were really interesting, and I'm sure the staff heard them. Um, I don't think the issue is equity versus the environment. I think the issue is equity versus trying to keep businesses from being regulated. And in this case, I think we can have the environment, and I think we can have equity if we give our staff a chance to do, do this work, and I think that's where we should go. That's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Councillor DiGenova? That was a holdover. Okay. I see no one else on the queue, so Claire, could you take us to a vote on um, BCD? Chair, what did you just say that we're voting on? BC oh, I'm sorry. We're on the whole, th I'm sorry. <laughs> We are voting on the whole thing as is. Sorry, thank you very much for that clarification. Oops, sorry, um, yes, point of privilege. It's the main motion, yes. So we're just putting, sorry, clarification. We're voting on the recommendations in the report right. as, they, as they are? Yes, okay. that's right. Thank you. It, it on, on all clauses, yes. Um, Right, okay. Uh, Councillor Dominato, do you want to just, we're in a vote. Ah. Okay, sorry. So vote is um, you're up on the screen. You're voting on the entire motion or on the entire recommendations. It's not actually up on the screen on WebEx here. That You're is a point of privilege and um, uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I tried to call one. Maybe I was still on mute. If we can get it up on the screen, that would be great. Councillor Hardwick? Okay, that vote um, does pass with Councillors DiGenova, Hardwick, Dominato, Bly, and Kirby Young in opposition. Oh, what time is it? Three o'clock? We have finished item one. So, but, you know, Council, in all fairness, this was one that we've received a lot of public input on. There was a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, I think, specific issues to debate, so... I, I, and we heard from a number of speakers, so um, I don't feel too badly about the fact that we took the time. We are now on to item number, just a second, uh, two. And great. So item two, I'm just going, is better together. Neighborhood Collective Action Pilot, um, and we have a speaker to this. Oh no, sorry, first of all, we have um, somebody to present a, pres a presentation from staff. Brooke Mellis, Director of Homelessness Services, Arts, Culture, and Community Services, to provide that brief presentation for us. Brooke, are you on the line yeah. there? Good afternoon. Um, maybe just before I turn it over to Brooke, it's Celine Mobilis, Managing Director of Housing and Homelessness Services. Um, I'd just like to give a little bit of an intro if I could. I'm joined today by Sandra Singh, uh, General Manager of ACCS, Brooke Mellis, Director of Homelessness Services, and our social planners, Andrea Young and Dustin Lupick, who are instrumental in developing the pilot and the recommendations before you today. Before I turn it over to Brooke, I'd just like to, to provide a brief presentation of the pilot. I want to acknowledge that being without housing or shelter and to suffer constant exposure 
to at-risk circumstances and the layer trauma that inevitably either underlies homelessness or results from it creates enormous, enormous difficulty for those experiencing it. A VPD report released in 2020 highlighted statistics that show that individuals experiencing homelessness are approximately 19 times more likely to be a victim of violent crime compared to the general population. While these impacts are most acutely felt by the individuals experiencing homelessness, there are also impacts on other members of the community as residents with no homes or access to day spaces congregate or sleep in the public realm, such as sidewalks, alcoves, and in our parks. As staff, we often respond to concerns about excess litter, needles, feces, safety, and concerns about people's well being and the need for more information resources that people can be referred to. Over the last two years, several council motions have pointed to the recognition that in, that in this complex and untenable situation, all community stakeholders need to see reasonable mitigations that address safety and security for everyone, that we do not criminalize poverty and mental health, that we build relationships between all of these diverse neighbours, and that we simultaneously need to advocate to senior government for policy programs and investments that will better address underlying root causes. The Better Together pilot being recommended today begins the work of bringing all community members together, businesses, renters, owners, housing operators, and social service providers. Are you privilege, are, or chair, just what a privilege. Is there, are the slides supposed to be moving with the president? I don't, okay, thank you, sorry. Yeah, we haven't got to that yet. I'll just wrap up my comments and then turn it over to Brooke. Thank you. So again, that we all work together to grow our understanding of each other's concerns and needs and to work to lasting solutions that ensure our communities are warm, safe, and caring of us all. The hard, this hard but important work moves us deeper into addressing systemic inequities together and acting on our commitments to reconciliation. And now I'll turn it over to Brooke, who will just quickly run you through our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. On behalf of the project team, I'm pleased to present you this overview of the proposed initiative, Better Together, Neighborhood Collective Action Pilot. Uh, in terms of the outline of our presentation, we'll provide you some context and rationale for the pilot, review the goals, identify the three pilot neighborhoods, and the four key elements of the program, as well as the timeline. So the Better Together pilot, for short, is, responsive, is, is a response to the increasing need for a more structured approach to address neighborhood concerns. There is a need for collaboration and compassion to mitigate impacts of unsheltered homelessness. The pilot provides resourcing, scope and space for community partnership to address and mitigate broader community issues impacting all neighbors. The pilot is in alignment with recent council motions that are listed here. Uh, and these recent council motions have pointed to the recognition that this is a complex issue and all stakeholders need to see reasonable mitigations that address safety and security for everyone and that do not criminalize poverty or mental health and build relationships between these diverse neighbors. To further expand on why this pilot is important in terms of the impacts of homelessness, uh, first and foremost, the suffering and devastating impacts are first and foremost felt by individuals experiencing homelessness. Homelessness itself contributes to real and perceived impacts on other housed community members and businesses. And research has demonstrated that unhoused or precariously housed individuals are more likely to be targets of violent crime and assault. So the goals of this pilot um, are to build on existing partnerships, to proactively respond to specific neighborhood concerns or issues. And we feel that staff feel that the Better Together pilot increases community engagement and awareness while collectively problem solving on issues related to the impacts of mental health, poverty, and unsheltered homelessness. Recognizing that many of these circumstances have their roots in trauma associated with colonialism, racism and gender-based violence. The goal is to is support for all, all residents who are without or with and with homes, for businesses, their staff and customers, and, and to have increased confidence in how to work with neighbors 
and living outside. So the pilot neighborhoods that have been um, identified for this pilot are downtown south, Mount Pleasant, and the Olympic Village area. These, the pilot, while, while staff recognize that many neighborhoods across Vancouver are grappling with the same challenging situations and I, um, identifying three pilot neighborhoods was a difficult task, but we based this, the neighborhoods on the following selection items. We wanted to build on enhanced supports that have not yet been formalized in these neighborhoods. There is the presence of neighbor, neighborhood champions with a demonstrated interest to tackle the broader issues. At neighborhoods where there is not already substantial social and program collaborations that provide points of connection into the city. <coughs> Lastly, we chose uh, these three because of their diverse geographies across or adjacent to Vancouver's denser urban core. We'll now just talk quickly about the key elements of the. the First one is to improve access to support services in the local neighborhood. This will be achieved through the City of Vancouver's Homelessness Services Outreach Team um, and also increase coordination with local service providers to support people in need. The second key element is to improve sense of safety and connection for all and to reduce stigma. There are two key um, ways that this will, will, will be achieved. The first is through a community education and training program which will be coordinated through the Homelessness Services Association of BC. The education and training program uh, strives to achieve increased understanding of the causes and solutions to homelessness, to increase overall confidence and the ability to de-escalate a situation with a customer, a neighbor, or situations within a neighborhood that may arise. Over the course of the pilot, there will be five training modules um, provided. 45 sessions uh, with 15 in each neighborhood and continued collaboration with the city and content experts to deliver these sessions. The second key um, activation through this element is to, uh, it will be achieved, pardon me, through the implementation of a peer-based neighborhood stewardship program. This would be coordinated through Ember's Eastside Works. The key elements would be a deployment of a peer neighborhood stewardship program in each of the pilot neighborhoods. This would be delivered through a community partner and will support low barrier employment, neighborhood and citizen engagement, and enhanced liaising with businesses. The program will work towards operationalizing in each of the three pilot neighborhoods with up to two peers a day. Uh, this program is modeled after the Chinatown Stewardship Program, and I just wanted to share a few highlights from peer voices themselves. So from their voices, one of the most important services that they feel they provide is liaising between the shopkeepers and those who are homeless. Peer stewards see themselves as diplomats, not security personnel, deal with situations in a calm and compassionate manner, and make suggestions that help both the businesses and the unsheltered residents. Third key element is to maintain neighborhood cleanliness. This will be achieved through the City of Vancouver Sanitation Services. Uh, support for this is provided through the recently approved street cleaning grants to nonprofits, which includes the four elements identified there. A portion of the above program grants support increased sanitation services in the three pilot neighborhoods. And lastly, the fourth key element is to improve communication between community organizations, resident associations, and service providers and city departments. This will be achieved through the establishment of a neighborhood collective action table in each neighborhood. Each table will consist of neighborhood stakeholders, businesses, and community service providers. Staff role will be to support coordination for all of the elements described so far and to manage and track issues and responses. Staff role will also be to ensure effective communication, problem solving, and work to build positive relationships between service providers and businesses. So just to recap the key objectives of Better Together Neighborhood Collective Action Pilot, 
to improve access to support services, improve sense of safety and connection, maintain neighborhood cleanliness, and to improve communication. We see the pilot project once uh, hopefully approved by council kickstarting here in March of 2022 and would be in place until December 2023. Monitoring and evaluation will be key through the life of the pilot. We just like to leave this, uh, this with council, which captures the essence we feel and key elements of the Better Together pilot and the key activities of the pilot. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, so, committee members, you have up to five minutes to ask questions of staff. Any questions? No, I didn't see. Any. Oh, Councillor Weeb, go ahead. Yeah, this is a really exciting program. I'm wondering, recognizing it's a pilot for three areas of the city, what is the plan if we are to really see the growth in these three to move it citywide? Um, is this something that we see can be? scalable or would we change the program to me or city program or do we need to look at kind of the outcomes of these pilots to get that kind of information thank you councillor brooke mellis director of homelessness services um so we do see this pilot uh being an opportunity to really review the efficacy of it and hopefully an opportunity to expand once we have a chance to monitor and evaluate okay yeah, no, it's really exciting. Thanks a lot for this work. Great. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. Um, Mayor Stewart, go ahead. Yeah, I've been, oh, I'm sorry, I've got a barking puppy here. Um, I, uh, yeah, I am also excited about this project. I'm just wondering um, who you consulted uh, in the way through in, in building this, which groups and organizations? Hi, Brooke Mellon. So we actually spoke with, our project team spoke with approximately 15 external stakeholders and um, six different uh, teams within the city itself. So the consultations included uh, the BIAs in the relevant, relevant neighborhood, the community policing centers in those neighborhoods. We spoke with nonprofits that are service providers um, and existing roundtable uh, nonprofit. nonprofit as well as BIAs. Thanks, and just to follow up, um, did, uh, did you talk with the VPD directly? Yes, we did speak with the VPD and they are aware of this initiative. I, I was wondering because I had heard some very positive rumblings from uh, the chief and the executive about this and I'm, I'm glad to see uh, in front of us today. So th thank you so much for your work. Great, thanks, Mayor Stewart. <clears throat> Councillor Fine. Yeah, um, also super appreciative of this direction and work. I think this is something that we've all been collectively talking about in various different capacities here at Council. So this is uh, an actualization of that, and I'm, I'm excited to see how this unfolds. So with that said, and kind of further to some of the, I think Councillor Weaves' points, um, what are the what are going to be the sort of key performance? indicators on this? How are we going to measure success and where we pivot and evolve through this pilot, recognizing it is a pilot? Hi, thank you for that question. Um, I'm Andrea Young. I'm a planner in Homelessness Services. Um, we're going to work together with a consultant to develop a robust evaluation framework. Um, some of the metrics that we will track, some will be subjective and some will be objective. So we want to monitor um, increased sense of safety by community members and businesses. Um, those are, these are some of the subjective um, data that we will collect. Um, number of positive interactions with community members and businesses through the peer stewardship program. Of course, um, how many peers are trained and uh, deployed through the peer stewardship program. And then some of the more objective metrics would be needles collected, um, the uh, number of people that we work with through enhanced outreach in each neighborhood and whom we house from that group of people, as well as some of the metrics that sanitation already collects. So um, for example, the volume of garbage that is collected, um, feces collections and needle pickups. That's fantastic. Now. Uh, the other piece, and, and um, 
I, I see that they're mentioned in the report and stuff, and I'm just curious the role of, because a lot of this sort of intersects with 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 health, uh, and I'm curious where 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 exactly coastal health will be involved and, and to what capacity in this work, because I, I see obvious overlap and would hope they're being really supportive here. Thank you, Councillor. So we, we would be pleased to invite Vancouver Coastal Health to any and each of the pilot um, neighborhood uh, action, neighborhood collective action. Okay, um, nothing more than that though. There, there's, there's not a specific direction that they're interested in pursuing here or they're just sort of being consulted? Um, so we can we can follow up there, but uh, the intention of the of the tables is to um, address the broader community neighborhood issues. So if health is a identified issue by the table, then certainly there it makes sense to have health a part of that conversation. Yeah, and I mean I would hope that there's opportunity to pursue some funding from Coastal Health and see them share on some of the the the, um, the programming here. But I'm, I'm I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair, and and thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, I just want to hone in on the um, the evaluation component, which I'm I'm really pleased to see again um, integrated into the the planning. Um, and if in your hopes in evaluating uh, the pilot, um, would it be to potentially scale this? Is no. if we see benefits uh, from this, is that it could be um, scaled to other no. neighborhoods and take a different form? Oh, I think there's some background noise. Just on. Thank you, Councillor. So within the evaluation framework, we are planning to do a midterm um, evaluation, sort of to monitor and, and do a midterm kind of check-in. So that may be an opportunity for us to pivot as needed. And, yeah, that's great. And and I guess my point being is that if if the findings from this are there's you know we see um, uh, there's a real impact and uh, based on our criteria that potentially it could be um, used in other neighborhoods. Would that be fair to say? Uh, I think so. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Sandra um, Singh, general manager. Yes, councillor. That's the intent of the pilot is to is to try out what the staff uh, what the pro programs the staff are recommending, and if it turns out that they are impactful, they're making the, the difference that we hope they will, then we would come forward with recommendations for uh, for next steps that would include potential expansion to other neighborhoods. Great, thank you. Um, I think we saw speakers, is that correct? We do. Okay, yes. so we're not. Thank you. That's right. And that is it for questions, so we can now turn to speakers, registered speakers. Our first speaker um, is Duncan Higgin, Senior Manager, PHS Community Services Society. Is Duncan Higgin on the line? I am here. Thank you. Great. We hear you clearly. You have up to five minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak on this uh, really um, important and possibly changing, deeply changing initiative at the city level. Um, I'll come uh, to you with a bit of background. I've got uh, 12 years working here in um, supportive housing as well as uh, quite in-depth work in homelessness across the city, including working uh, in the last um, any number of iterations of homeless encampments. One of the things when I look at an initiative like this, having sat through many CACs and sat through many public meetings in the um, onboarding of supportive housing, is that those spaces are acutely poor places to develop and mature our conversation around socioeconomic inclusivity across the city. Those are places where people's emotions are already at a heightened point and uh, we end up in places of either defending inclusivity at the risk of offending uh, existing neighbors. And, and quite frankly, in the conversation point, um, unfortunately, we never get to a maturing of the dialogue or the discussion. When I look at an opportunity um, to actually spend time where we are deeply humanizing um, some of the most beautiful, ardent, and strong members of our entire city spend time in communicating with neighborhood associations and BIAs, actually drilling into identifying what are these concerns. In my experience, the pushback in the development of supportive housing isn't actually as broadly perceived as this notion of simplistic nimbyism. It is a fear of the unknown. And so what we need to be able to do and what we look at in an initiative like this is the possibility of de developing conversations, identifying what are those deep concerns, 
What are the worries around individuals coming into house situations? I spent countless hours, I think some members here and people participating in the study, uh, watched 1,100 individuals come to the open house at Margaret Mitchell Place in one of the RH uh, supportive housing, temporary modular supportive housing units. And time and time again, of the 1,100 individuals came through that space, a thousand of them were there with concerns, my neighborhood, my safety, things of this nature. Um, and those places, while an opportunity to discuss that, are already places of increase in heightened emotion. Having the time to sit down and identify real concerns. Um, I believe that Vancouverites and this city as a whole is working towards uh, being receptive and being inclusive across the board. And so having a place where we can look at the humanity of, and the strength of the population that we have as citizens who have to live on the street here is a place to break down those barriers so that we're having mature conversations around, do you not like the color of this fence? Not, do you not want this person to move inside? And so I wanted to lend my support to this conversation and uh, to this initiative uh, as we at the PHS, um, we have we operate buildings across the city. We also operate a ton, and we're known for our work in the downtown east side. And we're over the moon to see the conversation expanding beyond the downtown east side, expanding towards supports where individuals don't have to leave their home communities when they become homeless in Shaughnessy, when they become homeless in Yale Town, and move to the downtown east side, where we're able to have those conversations around supports across the city where people's are people already live. Um, moreover, um, or along those lines, looking at uh, the, idea of, of, no, the idea of the initiative of meaningful paid employment of individuals who are experiencing exclusions, exclusions from housing um, and other factors, so they're able to be those contributing members of our communities, which they already are, and having that shown to work. We've seen this work in Victoria. We've seen this work across this city already. Um, and... I guess at that point, before I belabor this further and just ramble onward, I just want to back the support of this level of maturing of the dialogue across the city, um, certainly starting with these three neighbourhoods, of which not only do I work in the sector, but I, I live in Mount Pleasant, um, but also the potential for future expansion across the entire city. Thank you for hearing me. That's, uh, that's great. Thank you um, for speaking to us. Councillor Dominato, are you on this list for questions? That's a holdover? Okay. No problem. Um, that's great. We really appreciate you um, speaking to us. There are no questions for you, but, uh, but thanks very much for taking the time and the work you do um, in the community. Uh, second speaker, Neil Wiles. Is Neil on the phone? I am. Great. We can hear you clearly. Can you hear go me? ahead. Yep. This is the Executive Director of Mount Pleasant Business Improvement Association. Neil, go ahead for up to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try and I'll try and be brief. Um, I'm. Uh, Somewhat excited uh, to see this uh, and to see Mount Pleasant uh, being chosen as one of the pilot neighborhoods. Um, as you know, we had uh, uh, we had pushed strongly uh, to get a dedicated CPC here in Mount Pleasant and had uh, received council approval from that, uh, as well as the police board uh, approval. Yet uh, couldn't pass that last little uh, budget hurdle. Um, I have to say, <laughs> I'm a little dismayed. Uh, that uh, um, money could be found for this, uh, but not for that. Um, but I will, I will say that uh, in the motion regarding the CPC, uh, that an alternative model based on community-led responses for public safety, um, that staff are asked to explore that. And so I do commend them. They have, and they've come back with this. Uh, I'm hoping that this has, and I haven't heard, uh, that this will have a physical location, because um, I feel that that's important for our neighborhood uh, to have a place uh, for people to go and to connect and to sometimes access these services. And I know that a CPC would have had that. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, and, and when we get to uh, the staff can uh, address that, I'm curious that if we will have um, uh, a physical location in the area. Um, I did hear uh, what some of the measurements were, or I, was, I think I heard. Um, so I would ask that to be answered again, is what will the measurements be um, to show the success of uh, of this program, um, I sit on the uh, uh, I sit on the CAC for the Biltmore, um, uh, and and I've been on that for quite some time. And that that one has been going for a rather long time. I saw in the report that sometimes these CACs uh, dissolve after a while um, because they find that their work has uh, uh, been done. Um, the CAC uh, at the Biltmore um, has worked hard for the last four years to actually get some. Uh, medical attention uh, from Coastal Health 
uh, in uh, in that building, um, and after a long, hard-fought battle, um, we have. Uh, so, uh, uh, and it's and it's been overwhelming that they actually uh, needed to expand it. So we're helping the people where they are, um, which has been great. Uh, I was hoping to see that uh, the CAC for the 205 Kingsway uh, and Biltmore uh, be combined because I think that uh, working collaboratively, um, we would be able to solve some problems. Uh, and without just pointing the finger at the other person. Um, that uh, that effort was declined, um, and yet literally, it's uh, uh, building better together is the uh, is the name of this of this program. Uh, so I'm hoping that this program is able to maybe repair uh, or relook at that uh, just out of the respect for the people who are involved, because uh, it's all the same people and their time. Um, but I am encouraged that uh, possibly this uh, better together will start to bridge uh, the variety of services that are offered in this neighborhood that I, I can tell you that aren't necessarily aware of each other. Um, and from the few years I've been on this job, that has become uh, very evident that sometimes they're not even aware of uh, the services operated uh, by their next door neighbor. So I am, I am encouraged and pleased uh, that Mount Pleasant has been uh, chosen for this, and I'm interested in seeing how this is going to roll out. Um, but I'm also interested in, in hearing about the measurements of success. Thank you. Great, thank you. And you have spe oh, sorry, questions. First, Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead. Up to thank you. Um, hi, Neil. Thanks for speaking to Council. I know that you've been really working diligently to try to get the CPC up and running. And I know a big part of that vision um, was really that it was very integrated based on sort of the DNA of the community, uh, that it was integrated with social services in terms of connecting people to those resources and really trying to support people in need in the neighborhood. And so to your question around needing a space, are you suggesting as we continue work to get the CPC set up, the CPC could um, help by playing a home base and there might be a joint space, for example? So do you want to kind of speak to that? I would, I would actually love to see that. I know that um, uh, when we had approached with the CPC model, there was some feedback uh, and definitely some uh, uh, some uh, anti-VPD uh, sentiments from a few people. Um, so they were looking for something uh, uh, different. Um, I'm hoping that maybe we are able to uh, bring these two things uh, together and that people are able to access uh, whatever part of the system um, that they need to access uh, through a location, maybe based uh, somewhere near Main and Broadway, which is definitely sort of the epicenter of, uh, of what's going on here uh, right now. Okay, I can certainly follow up and ask staff that sort of that that question um, because my understanding is that you had potentially had a space available. Is that is that right? I I have I have uh, I'm able to provide some office space uh, gratis uh, for the uh, CPC in its formative year, um, but also some of uh, the members in uh, the Mount Pleasant uh, neighborhood are able to uh, come forward with some at least some uh, reduced rate. Uh, a space to rent uh, for the longer term. Um, so there is there is uh, there, there is a desire to see something happen here, uh, and I think that there's some supports uh, in place. And in, in, in your mind, because it's sort of part of what we're trying to achieve here is to foster those bridges between the different folks, whether it's residents, businesses, um, people that are in need. Um, and so, do you sort of see that part of what we're trying to do here is actually bridge understanding and bring people together? Correct. Okay. Anything else you want to add? I have forty seconds. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I'm just checking on some notes here, but uh, like I said, I'm 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 very curious about the measurements of success. Yeah, me too. I'll follow up on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You have do you have more questions? Thanks, Kirby Young, Councillor Weeb, up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks for coming to speak today. And you talked a little bit about the siloness of some of the great work happening in the neighborhood. Can you talk about what you think would be a positive neighborhood collective action table? Like, who do you think really needs to be at that table for this to be effective? Um, obviously, in the reports, there's some communications there of Vancouver Coastal Health and BPD and all others. But who do you think might be missing for that list? Or do you think that that list really kind of gets to the group of bringing everyone to the table together? Yeah, so let me just get to my uh, get to my mess, my list here. Well, it's it, it's quite a comprehensive uh, list. I mean, Coast Mental Health does operate here. The Neighborhood House 
Um, and I mean, we have a hospital a community center. Uh, there's also um, uh, for there, we have the native education center and I do believe uh, I've forgotten because it's such a long acronym, um, but there's a, there's another uh, uh, indigenous service uh, provider here uh, for uh, people who, who identify and, and need those services. Um, so that we, it is a very diverse neighborhood, but like I said, um, in my conversation, sometimes they just don't know, uh, you know, who each other are. We have a drug treatment court center here, which I don't even think anyone, um, anyone knows about. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Councillor Weep. Councillor Fry, over to you for up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us, Neil. Um, I'm curious, I, I see there's a, a reference in here to, to the old NIST program, and I'm, I'm going to assume that you've been around longer, long enough to remember the, the neighborhood integrated <laughs> services teams. Do you, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you can reflect how those services integrate now and if, the, if it's meeting a need, because I, I suspect that there is a, a lack of integration sometimes with some of the different city roles and departments. Um, I, you know what, without, uh, uh, I, I don't think that there is a, a ton of integration. I feel that people are operating uh, in silos. Um, and I think that we sort of need to start to break down some of those barriers and get people uh, working together. Because in, in dealing uh, with the people that you want to deal with, uh, you know, there's not only, you know, there's not only ever one thing, uh, you know, that they need. Um, you know, like bless them if, if, if a home is the only thing they need, Great. Then sometimes that's uh, that's quickly solved, but it's usually a myriad of other uh, other issues. And I, you know, it'd be nice to sort of see some of those addressed all at the same time. Yeah. So extrapolating upon that, so the old NIST model uh, enabled like property use, policing, engineering, all those different yep. components to come together around a table and, and and address those needs in a comprehensive way. Yeah. Okay. I guess we're yes. we're, we're definitely on the same page with that. I'm I'm excited to see that kind of coming back as a as an operation. Um, pivoting a little bit to the notion of de-escalation and, and, and sort of training and, and peer-based training for, uh, in particular, businesses and stuff. Are you hearing that's something uh, uh, in Mount Pleasant that, that retails and shops are, are looking for? Um, I'm, noticing a, uh, I'm noticing an increase in calls uh, to our security team uh, for service. Um, they're all sort of uh, uh, different things. Um, you know, we've had a couple of things where people just won't leave stores and whatnot. Uh, so I do find that sometimes our shopkeepers and, uh, and, and other business people uh, need a little support. Um, I'd like to see a bit more, and not to belabor the point, um, because I think that Collingwood uh, CPC is, uh, uh, does a good job. They're just stretched into, across probably a third of the, our city. Um, so, you know, those sorts of uh, programs uh, in the neighborhood, uh, I think, would be utilized a little bit more. Great. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. And that is it for your questions. Thank you so much, Neil, for calling in and uh, staying on the line to answer all those questions. Very much appreciate it. So, Council, uh, that takes us to the end of speakers. Um, and uh, would somebody like to move the motion? Um, was that Mike? Councillor, I think Councillor Weeb did. I don't need a seconder, but that's great. Um, so, speaking to um, the uh, the motion on the floor, Count oh, wait a second, I'm putting you into the main queue. That was Councillor Hardwick, I think. Were you first? Yep. Yeah, I'll um, go ahead. I have a point of information through you, Chair. I just I may have missed it, but I'm I'm wondering in the amounts of the grant. Uh, the two two grants in in this report. What is the source of funds? Yes, uh, city manager. Thanks, uh, chair. Um, I, do ECCS. I want to respond to that, or would you like me to take it? Um, I can I can do it. Paul Sanders, saying general manager. So the source of the funds is it's a one time uh, diminishing. Um, fund with, that was associated with the Vancouver Agreement and was established a number of years ago, and um, and so we had uh, we had encumbrances against that fund from from many many years ago that we determined after reviewing with finance no longer to be they don't not, the encumbrances are no longer required and so we were able to identify those funds to pilot this without um, without coming back to council How for much, a budget increase. 
Thank you very much. How much was that? Is, is there still a balance in that account? This pilot will deplete it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Um, Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead up to. Yeah, uh, questions to staff three, if I can. Uh, and the first one is about um, the question that was raised by the one speaker earlier. Are they expected to have a location or a home base to work out of, or how's that how's that working? Staff. Hi, Brooke Mellis, Director of Homeless and Services. So we will definitely work with our community partners to identify a space within community um, to to hold these uh, roundtables. But I guess, is it, isn't it more than just roundtables? And my, um, just to be clear, are they not doing outreach into the communities as well? Sorry, I might have misunderstood the question. Well, the scope of activities, you're going to have peer workers are going to be out in community, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so uh, they will have a, a home base within community as well. So while Embers is the uh, the coordinating body for the peer stewardship program, they will work with local partners in each of the pilot neighborhoods. So there will be a bricks and mortar place that uh, the peer stewards can congregate um, and and get support. And has, I guess just to be clear, have the, have the, given we have three different neighborhoods, are we looking at multiple spaces and have those been identified yet? So it would be one space per neighborhood and we will work with uh, community partners to identify that once the pilot is approved. Okay, um, thank you. Can we talk? Can I ask a question? Can we talk metrics a little bit? Or is an outcome of success really needle pickup or feces removal? I mean, these are things that the city of Vancouver tracks anyway, um, through engineering um, or through some of the street cleaning grants and the micro additional micro grants um, that we've given um, in terms of some of the um, the micro cleaning. So, aren't those things that we're already tracking? Like, what what is what, what is the more meaningful definition of success and how do you ask them if they feel safer? Do we have a baseline? I'm, I'm trying to get a sense here. Like, how are we going to know that this is actually making a difference beyond what we're doing already? Yeah, um, I can speak to that. This is Andrea Young in Homelessness Services. Um, so with our evaluation framework, what um, the length of this proposed pilot allows us to kind of develop a framework in conjunction with our partners and with a consultant so that we can get appropriate baseline data um, to track over time and then evaluate at the end, at midpoint and end of the pilot. As I mentioned before, we will be collecting some hard metrics and you're right, sanitation already um, does collect uh, information about refuse and needles. The stewards will also be doing um, limited uh, needle and refuse pickup on private property. So that will be an additional sanitation. What is, what is just because I have limited time, what's, what's distinct or different for an outcome for this program than some of the city initiatives? Like we might, for example, I understand be doing more of or additional needle pickup possibly, but mm -hmm. what is distinct and different? Like, what are we looking for here? Thank you. Um, so we will be also at the, in order to get baseline data, um, we want to go to community um, and do some deep listening with people with lived experience and other residents on their feelings of safety. And then we um, want to um, track that through satisfaction surveys before and after the educational workshops and through the life of the pilot. Okay, I'm still trying to get my head around, like if I was explaining to somebody, like you had that, you know, that elevator conversation, sort of the famous thing, and somebody's like, yeah. what is this initiative, this program, right? What is it, what is it, yeah. what, what does it do? What's it about? How, what would you say? Like if you get that elevator conversation. So we, we will be able to improve communication, awareness, and education among all people um, in the community, residents, businesses, people with lived experience, and we will track those elements through um, satisfaction surveys and through the evaluation. Um, it's Sandra saying here, maybe I'll just jump in and also add where we've outlined some proposed outcomes uh, in the Appendix A. So other types of uh, outcomes could be things like increased sense of connection, increased confidence and responsiveness by the city and partners, um, increased sense of uh, collaboration amongst community partners. So there's a number of, of additional outcomes that, uh, that we would uh, be seeking to track through this pilot. Okay, I'm, I'm, I have limited time, but thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Councillor Kirby. Young Councillor Fry, go ahead. 
Yeah, I'm just uh, going to speak in, 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 in real favor of this. I really appreciate the work that's gone into us. I, I appreciate the funding model. Uh, you know, and, and, and just to reflect on some of the aspirations I had with the motion that it brought forward a couple of times and was finally kind of picked up again just in January about crisis intervention and de-escalation. Uh, and, and, the, and the reflection that in talking to a lot of local small businesses and stuff that they, they really didn't have the tools to deal with some of the issues that they were finding they were, they were having to manage in the course of, of just running a, a small business, for instance. And I think that, that this represents a really exciting opportunity for us to pivot a little bit of how we do things. And I, and I really appreciate the reference to the NIST program. It's something that actually I was contemplating bringing forward as a, as a, as a member motion was to revisit the old neighborhood integrated services team model, specifically because I think one of the things that we hear time and time again is that the various siloed departments seem not to always communicate well together and, and the public feel that frustration. So that when they have, you know, for instance, a problem business that may kind of intersect with engineering, uh, licensing, ACC, CS, and planning, like how do they, and of course policing and fire, how do they integrate all those pieces and how does it all come together? And I think that revisiting that NIST, which was abandoned, I believe back in 2008, uh, when, 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 when Judy Rogers was sacked even. So I think that this is an opportunity to revisit something that actually did work pretty well and, and may actually kind of present a little bit of a pivot on how we, we work better in our communities. And so I'm really looking forward to some success from this pilot. I'll be watching it very closely and, 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 I, and, I, and I hope of course that we pass it today and that we see some, some real success and a, and a change in how we approach some of these things. Because I, I really appreciate the thought that's gone into pulling a lot of our various objectives as a council uh, into this and recognizing that this is an opportunity to do things very differently. And I was also very heartened to hear the mayor reflect that that he was feeling some optimism from the police board on this very item as well. So super stoked. Thanks very much, staff, for putting this together. I'm really uh, looking forward to the uh, some outcomes here. Thanks, Councillor Fry. Councillor Boyum. Thanks. Uh, I also want to speak uh, strongly in support of this uh, and echo everything Councillor Fry said. I think um, it's clearly needed. It's very well thought out. It pulls on past learning as well as what we're hearing in the public uh, right now. I'm really uh, grateful to see this come forward. I just have one question, um, Chair, through you to staff uh, around the, um, the neighborhood teams. Um, and uh, one of the many things I appreciate about this report is how clearly it outlines um, that uh, folks from marginalized communities are more likely to be uh, victims of violence. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering how their voices uh, are proposed to be included in the ongoing development and oversight of the pilot, and if there's space to ensure that those voices are present at the neighborhood collective action tables. Staff? Thank you very much uh, for the question, Councillor. So yes, we have been talking about that very important piece and what we'd like to see and ensure that there's a very safe way for uh, people with lived experience to be a part of this table. So we'd like, to, um, we'd like to take the opportunity to develop what that looks like and ensure again that uh, we are not doing more harm, but that it's done safely and it's an extremely good uh, voices. Thank okay. You. Um, I, I I don't see that in the list. I mean, the list itself says including but not limited to. So I, I guess I'm just seeking clarification if that direction is um, needed to make sure those voices are uh, are represented there. Um, Councillor, it's Sandra Singh. I'll just, I don't think we need that direction from council. I think um, in the list we've noted that it, the partner um, social service organizations. So I think staff can work with uh, Embers, for example, to talk about and explore, as Brooke noted, um, how we can ensure that people with lived experience through them are 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 part of the part of the ongoing discussion. Okay, uh, um, I really appreciate that. I know you know how important that is, and and also I think a really op uh, important opportunity to learn even around that table. So I had sent an amendment on that front. I hear it's not needed and I am, am happy to uh, go with that. And again, to just 
um, reiterate how important I think this is. Um, the, the one thing I will say is uh, big picture. I think if we want um, mental health and, and, uh, and poverty related uh, alternatives to policing, they can't just be uh, through grants to nonprofits. Um, I think as we see in other places, the longer term need is for a, a new public service um, that's reliably uh, and, and consistently funded over a long period of time. I, um, and I, I'm glad to see this move forward as a pilot. I think there's a lot that we can and will learn from this approach in terms of uh, how we can best meet the public and community safety needs that we hear from a whole array of community members around our city um, and to make sure we're doing that in a way that really gets at um, the, the core needs that people are facing. Um, so a lot of good in here and really look forward to um, the learning that we'll do and, uh, and where it can go and grow. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair. Through you um, to staff, I just have a couple of questions um, with respect to Appendix A. And uh, um, I'm looking at um, a couple of questions. One, do you, are these set in stone, these objectives? And is there, are you anticipating that these might change? And it stems from, I'll give you the context for my question. I'm looking at uh, the third objective, which is maintain neighborhood cleanliness. From my perspective, I would like to see improve neighborhood clean. I'd like to see a striving goal or objective in this. I, I see it for some of the others, but I don't see it for that one. But are, is it, if we approve this today, is that it? Or are we looking at potentially different objectives being shaped based on further work around this? Staff? Maybe I can ask that. Celine Mobles, Managing Director of Housing and Homelessness Services. I think um, uh, definitely we hope to see uh, an improvement in neighborhoods. Uh, the reason we um, kept the objective like that is because we're building on the work that engineering is already doing. So in this report, we're not recommending any additional resources towards um, engineering and sanitation. Mind you, some of our peers will be doing that work. <clears throat> so I think we do um, we do envision uh, seeing improvement in, in those neighborhoods. Okay, no, I appreciate that clarification. I, I guess my other question is around, I appreciate that this is... Um, uh, attempting to address, as it points out in the beginning of the report, a number of issues and considerations within neighborhoods that have been identified and, and to some degree addresses some, you know, social cohesion. And, and so one of the objectives is around uh, improving sense of safety and connection for all neighbors. But then I look at the sample metrics and, and what I see disconnected here, and, and maybe it's going to be expanded on, is how you're going to measure success. I, I see outputs, number of overdoses, number of interactions, are you planning to look at something where you would be able to survey people and get a sense of um, people's improved sense of uh, social cohesion, sense of improved sense of safety and security in their neighborhoods? Um, I see satisfaction, but satisfaction is not the same as um, uh, surveying and getting, so you're getting to that sense of outcomes. So I'm just curious if that's contemplated in the work. Staff? Thank you, Councillor. So, um, part of part of the evaluation and the the metrics around outcomes will will have shorter and longer term outcomes. So, the the focus in the draft uh, measurements around um, uh, satisfaction is really that that is part of measuring outcomes. Satisfaction surveys have been proven as a qu evidence qualitative um, method of of uh, of, in of reviewing outcomes. So that can be a starting point. We can also review in the midpoint and continue to see how we can grow from that baseline. Um, it's Sandra Singh here. Maybe I'll just jump in as well. Thank you so much, Brooke. And just to clarify, Councillor Dominato, we did um, we did articulate one of our sample, um, sample outcome metrics in Appendix A is increased sense of safety and connection by community members. So that is something that um, that we are looking as a potential outcome out of this uh, is an increase in sense of safety. But as per Brooke will and Celine, we'll need to work with the partners as well as the evaluation consultant to really nail down what that evaluation framework looks like, and then what the tools are to actually undertake the measurement over the over the pilot. Okay, that's great, um, Chair. Maybe I'll just offer. Can I, do I have time to offer comments? Those are my uh, points yeah, of information. Well, um, yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. 
Um, just to say, um, I really appreciate uh, the, the focus on this work. Um, I certainly think it is responsive to uh, some of the concerns that we're hearing uh, from neighborhoods. Uh, and, uh, and I did appreciate and note um, the comment around that uh, particularly individuals who may be homeless or uh, living in the streets are often more often likely victims of crime. And we've seen that uh, uh, recently uh, in our streets. And um, I'm, I think that the, what I hope that comes from this is that we get that really robust sense of, through the evaluation framework of, um, impact. And, uh, if we see the benefits, the opportunity for scaling, the opportunities for partnership with other levels of government. Um, and I know that uh, in some ways, I, I know it's referenced a couple of other motions, but, you know, Councillor Weeb and I brought a motion previously, um, that touched on a number of these areas and including supported employment. And so I know that it, it, it addresses and responds to a number of issues that have been raised by um, other members of this council over the course of our term. Um, but I, what I, I really appreciate that um, this is an attempt to try and do something different, um, to engage residents, um, to um, be responsive to uh, feedback, uh, and, and to the gaps that we're seeing uh, in our communities right now. Um, and I know it's certainly been exacerbated by the pandemic. There is no doubt we're seeing it across the country. Um, but um, being idle and doing nothing is, is really not an option. Um, and uh, the province obviously well, sir, left us these legacy funds. Up. And so um, I think that we should utilize them for the betterment of the community. So I look forward to the outcomes. Of Thank you, Councillor Dominato. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say I'm supportive because right now I think that public safety is, and, and it takes all forms, um, is one of the things that we're hearing the most about in the city. It's top of mind for residents, no matter your neighborhood, your background, your um, economic circumstance. And I think we need to be trying a number of different measures to try to address that. And so um, I'm supporting it in that spirit that we, it's, it's something that we hear about. It is a responsibility that residents look to their civic government um, to address, even though there's other more complex issues that require other levels of government and all kinds of partners to tackle, but um, we, we need to be creative, so I'm happy to support it. Great. Thanks, Councillor Kruber Young. Councillor Weeb. Um, yeah, I will be supportive, um, and I'm happy that this is coming forward in this way. I think that there's an opportunity for us to look at how to look at well-being indicators. I think that's something we continue to hear about. How do we define what community safety is? How do we define how we feel safe in a community. And I think that this is a great opportunity with three pilots to really work on what a community initiative is that creates a complete community that feels that connection, that supports and lifts up each other. And I think this work really kind of embraces that philosophy. And I look forward to seeing how we can utilize some of those indicators um, moving forward as we kind of grow up the Healthy City strategy. So really appreciating this work and looking forward to supporting it. Thanks, Councillor Weeb. And that is the end of um, our speaker's queue to this. Uh, so could you move us, Clerk, to a vote on this item, please? And that passes unanimously. Thanks, Council. Thank you, staff. We are now on to uh, well, item three, just so that everybody is reminded of it, um, was passed on consent. So we are on to item four, which is the quarterly capital budget adjustments and closeouts. We do have um, Patrice Impey, General Manager of Finance, Risk and Supply Chain Management, um, and her team here to answer your questions. There's no presentation, um, so we are on to questions. Councillor Hardwick, are you on for questions to this item? Um, I will be. I have, that's a holdover. All right. Councillor Kirby Young and Dominato, were you on this before? This is a holdover. Got it. Okay. Councillor Weeb. Yeah, I've got two questions. Uh, the first question is looking at the allocated versus balance remaining in the revised 2019-22 capital plan. It showcases that community facilities um, still has 45% of the allocated budget um, remaining. And I'm just wondering, recognizing we have a motion later on, can you talk to why there's such a large amount left over in community facilities and what was the um, reasoning for not being able to allocate or utilize that funding over the last three years? Staff. Hi, Colin Knight here, Director of Citywide Financial Planning and Analysis. Um, so I think 
within um, as as noted in, as part of when we brought the capital budget forward um, with the community ca uh, facilities category that would be things like community centers etc and there were a number of um, community centers that were noted that for a variety of factors um, just the the timing of those haven't proceeded um, yet and then as part of the um, the discussions that council will be engaged with in the public around the upcoming capital plan um, there'll be consideration of those items uh, and an opportunity for council to give feedback around um, the priorities and um, for uh, for having those proceed. So that will be coming to you. In this case, specific to this report, um, it's a, a specific situation where there is um, external funding that um, was received to support Fire Hall 12, uh, which frees up um, some community facilities funding um, to support um, an immediate priority around um, the city archives. Um, relocation okay thank you very much i appreciate that uh, my second question is on on the same graph it talks about our emerging priorities and recognizing that this council coming through COVID has had significant amount of motions and conversations about some significant emerging priorities i'm just wondering why none of that has been funded through the emerging priorities funding and we still have 100 percent of that funding remaining in the capital plan f I call a night uh, again, director of citywide financial planning and analysis. So I think the the emerging priorities funding um, again um, for my last answer that the use of that funding will be discussed as part of the um, the discussion with council in the coming months around the capital planning. Um, again, that was um, set aside uh, for a number of purposes as um, as noted in the capital the previous capital plan, including having uh, funding available to leverage um, senior government and partnerships as well as deal with potential cost escalation and a number of, of other factors. And so I think um, the consideration on how that um, money would be prioritized again will, will be um, part of the discussion um, as council is engaged around uh, the capital planning process. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Weep. Councillor Hardwick, over to you. Thank you. Um, Colin, the, the debenture reallocation is a bit curious to to me, since the archives are civic facilities, not community facilities. So why is the varying necessary? So the, the varying is, is um, moving the dollars from the, the civic facilities around the fire hall 12 to um, the community, community facilities category. Um, and um, the community facilities category um, has um, that supports the the work around the the real the relocation of this the um, the city um, the temporary relocation around the city archives. That doesn't really answer my question. I, I know it has to do with the cat categorize, categorization of projects, um, but it, it 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 is a bit of a shell game, and I'm I'm trying to understand the underlying rationale for the recategorization. Um, yeah, no, th thank you. The, 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 the rationale is, is uh, around having, making sure that the, the funding, which is in the category of civic facilities, but is no longer needed because of the um, external funding um, to then free up that, that funding for the community facilities category of which there is um, a significant need um, and uh, for a number of, um, of, of areas. And I'm just getting confirmation around the um, the um, the delivery, the archives related costs and funding. So um, I'll get back to you on that specific point. Yeah, I'm curious because of course we were gonna put the archives in with the library, now we're not going to do that. And so I'm just trying to get a sense of what's moving around where, but I don't wanna hold up the proceedings, but if there is a, an efficient quick answer on that, it would be appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll try and get an answer um, to, to uh, further respond to your question in just a moment. Thanks. Great. Meanwhile, there are other questions too. For Kirby Young, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to just understand a bit about the archives. I know that project, and I'll just sum up my understanding to make to preface my question. I understand that project was not um, supported by council, or it was um, deferred, if you will, in the capital plan. Now we've got this two million bucks, million bucks, you know funding, et cetera, moving around. I guess my question is at what point, because we're spending a million bucks so that we have, it stays where it is, and then we have to have the offsite storage for the extra million, at what point does it, are we spending money when 
versus will it become more cost effective to renew? Staff? Um, maybe I can take that question uh, and Colin can supplement. So yes, there has been a, obviously a significant change in direction with respect to the plan for the archives. Um, there is a need, you know, at this time, there is no imminent plan to move the archives from its current location. Long term, that will be necessary. In the meantime, this, we believe this is the most cost effective way to manage the archives capacity uh, sorry, by using this sorry, space. Sorry, city manager, we just lost quorum. Oh. Um, sorry. Can you stop my timer, Chair? Yeah, of course. Um, I think it was a, well, just under a minute. Uh, yeah. I, I, it was with... Okay. Council, um, we are very close around uh, the issue of quorum. We just received, uh, we just, we just got quorum back again. But please um, do have your cameras on if you're not here in present. And um, go ahead, Councillor Kirby Young. And oh, sorry, go ahead, City Manager. In response. Thanks. So the question, as I recall, uh, <laughs> was um, the the temporary solution and investments in the temporary solution. And yes, so um, we do foresee needing the space at Caswell for. Um, a, a relatively long period of time, kind of five to ten years. Um, the relocation of the archives is a very significant expense. We don't foresee that coming forward in the next capital plan, for example. Um, so we do think that this is a prudent investment and, and the best way to manage kind of the, like I say, the capacity needs for the archive over that intermediate period. Can I, um, can I follow up on that? Um, the initial cost for the offsite storage, would it be a much more, a more modest cost every year to maintain that? On an ongoing basis for that potential five to ten period, five, five to ten year period you've referenced. So yeah, this is a capital investment, so it's one time to prepare that, make sure that space is adequate. Obviously, the archives does need specific um, attributes, that the space in, in order to be able to store documents appropriately and so on. So that's the nature of the investment here, as I understand. Um, the operating costs, um, we will manage the operating budget. Um, so, so again, relative to other options, this, this is the option. Staff have done a lot of work looking at different options for the archives. This is the option that we believe is, okay. is optimal uh, from a cost. Awesome. And then the last question I have, which is a bit more philosophical, so I don't want to stray too much in the capital report, but with respect to this cost line item is that um, I understand from a number of different community organizations that are all run archives that are important to different cultural communities that there might be an opportunity or an interest in doing a shared space. Is that something that we could contemplate in having um, a larger archival type built facility where we could lever senior government funding and share costs? I think that's a great uh, suggestion or concept. I think long term we would be looking as broadly as possible around how, how to continue to support the archives for the city. If there are partnership opportunities there, whether it's uh, you know community um, organizations or post secondary, um, you know the, we would be looking at all of that long term. Okay, great. I'll follow up on that. Thanks so much. Thanks, Paul. Great. Well, that is it for questions. Um, so um, we now can hear from registered speakers. So we have a, a speaker to this item. Nathan Davidovich, are you on the line? Uh, no, the speaker is not on the line. Okay. Um, that means we can um, now have uh, somebody move the motion. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Any discussion? We just have quorum. Okay, nobody go anywhere. Uh, we just have enough right now because it, this is a um, two thirds majority, so it's eight votes. So please, um, please keep your video, uh, your your um, uh, vi yeah, videos on as well. So um, I believe we can be moved to a vote, clerk. Great, thank you. Well, we just made it. Um, I believe we have eight votes in favor. It passes unanimously. Okay, okay Council, we are now on to referred items. 
um, at our council meeting yesterday. Um, council referred the following items, and uh, we, uh, in order to hear speakers, followed by debate and decision, our first referred item, which is now item five on this agenda, is protecting BC coasts from acidic wash water dumping, which was member's motion B3. Um, our first speaker on that item is Anna Barford, Canada Shipping Campaigner for Stand.Earth. A uh, point of privilege, Chair. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, I just uh, got an a email from Anna Barford. Uh, she doesn't have an access code to call in yet. I just forwarded her email to the clerk, being Leslie Clerk. Okay. Well, um, why don't we thank you for, for uh, um, alerting us to that. Um, clerk, I wonder if we can just get that. Just a point of privilege or procedure, Chair. Well, it can be one or the other. Well, my, uh, so there's one, kind of two. I, just one second. I'm just speaking to the clerk for, just one second, please. Thank you. Uh, go ahead with your point um, of privilege, is I, it? I'm just going to, yes. Well, my, my point of privilege is I am going to need to step away. And because you're lean on quorum, I thought I'd let you know um, just for a quick break. Um, and I was going to propose while we're getting the access code, perhaps um, my point of procedure was could I move for a quick 10 minutes? No, you don't need to because I'm just going okay. to announce that we are taking a break um, in, in uh, conferring and conferring with the clerk. Um, staff just need a bit of time to contact speakers. Oh. Okay, but we just do have the next speaker on the line. Um, so, did you need a break for? I mean, you, you can step I, away. I we do, do not need, need you for. We do not need you for quorum. So, I'm not going to uh, proceed with a break because the speaker is on the line. Um, we needed a quorum for when when it was a two thirds vote, but we're fine for now. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Um, so, I'm going to turn to the speaker for item five, Anna Barford. Can you hear me, Anna Barford? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Thank you for uh, dialing in so quickly. And um, uh, go ahead. You have up to five minutes to address council. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Anna Barford and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm the Canada Shipping Campaigner with Stand.Earth. And I'm calling in here to speak very much in favor of this motion um, and tangentially of the port's approach on this issue. Uh, scrubbers take an air pollution problem and turn it into a water pollution issue. Um, they operate by pulling in what is naturally basic seawater and dumping out warm, acidic, and polluted wastewaters after they rinse their own exhaust uh, plume with it. They operate as a workaround to cleaner fuel standards um, and therefore lock in higher greenhouse gases as well as air pollution in the form of particulate matter. They contribute very directly to ocean acidification and dump heavy metals as well as carcinogens into the ocean. This is an important point because these contaminants are likely to remain in that ocean for forever as they do not metabolize in the marine environment. So they contribute to already high uh, contaminant burdens for southern resident killer whales, for salmon, and for filter feeders like oysters. Scarbers fundamentally are a choice. Um, this pollution could be prevented by ship operators, by them choosing to burn marine gas oil, which is a product that is already readily available uh, on the market, as well as with the Port of Vancouver. Instead, they are choosing cheaper fuels in conjunction with pollution for the rest of us. Scrubbers are a choice by ship owners who are installing record numbers of these devices. Um, you know, now, or as of the end of 2020, there are over 4,000 installed in marine, in marine vessels. In 2018, there were less than 100 in operation. Um, and when marine fuel standards came into place or when they were being discussed in 2008, there were only three in operation. And importantly, regulators are choosing this pollution um, by writing scrubbers in as a workaround to clean fuel standards. California has not. Ships there must use marine gas oil or other compliant fuels to 24 nautical miles from the coast. Um, and Canada, Canada could be making that choice as well. What the port is doing is uh, taking an absolute leadership pollution uh, position in pollution prevention. They're very clearly si signaling the end of the use of this device, which you may be able to <coughs> dog hate as well. Um, however, Transport Canada is going to take the protection beyond port limits, um, bringing this 
to LMLGA and UBCM that are incredibly <laughs> to raise up and highlight good actions, leadership, and encourage others to join. I'm assuming and your dog is in support. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. He is. Thanks. Um, transport does not materially limit scrubbit use um, and dumping. They're not in territorial seas or even in marine protected areas or close to shore or in open fishing season. BC has identified ocean acidification as a top risk um, to a thriving coast and to this province. And they're working on a coastal marine strategy that could be undermined by this dumping and by this ocean acidification directly from from vessels. And so they need also to be brought in to advocate for pollution prevention and disallowing scrubbers um, and bring this issue to the table. With global shipping making record profits and governments turning it to economic recovery and planning, this resolution sends a clear message about the value of pollution prevention as part of ecosystem uh, protection. So I thank you for listening and I encourage you very much to vote in favor. Great, thank you. I very much appreciate your composure as your dog kept barking. Um, well, you do have, uh, if you may, would remain on the line, you do have questions. Councillor Fry, over to you for up to three minutes. Uh, and the barking dog, we've all been there. Well, I've <laughs> definitely been there a few times. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just reflect where we stand sort of in a, in a global context and, and, and what's at risk, and, and I appreciate that the port's really moving ahead and, and, and are initiating stuff here at Port Port Metro Fraser, but, but as we look beyond to the Salish Sea, which of course is so critically important to this province, uh, what's at risk if we don't start intervening on this and, and, and what's the scale, of where, where do we stand relative to the rest of the planet? Oh, that's a great question. And um, so what is at risk? So much is at risk. A healthy, thriving ocean and ecosystem um, Southern resident killer whales, you know, everything from megafauna to microfauna. Scrubber wash water has been shown to be immediately lethal to plankton, you know, the literal basis of the marine food web, um, as well as contributing to sort of the long-term contaminant burden all the way up to Southern resident killer whales, um, and also through the food chain to us. So our health is at risk. Um, ocean acidification can put at risk the entirety of the food chain and the ability for coastal communities to feed ourselves um, off of the, the beauty of the ocean and the food source. Scrubber dumping is already equivalent in terms of ocean acidification in highly trafficked areas, and so what the port is doing is putting a stop to that already. Um, and globally, this issue is drawing a lot more attention. As we've seen more ships take up scrubbers and install these, um, we're starting to see more response. France recently banned scrubber discharges within three nautical miles of their entire coast. Um, locally, the Port of Seattle has uh, implemented a temporary pause until scrubbers can be studied in the local area. The Port of Vancouver has already done some studies, and so we understand that in Burrard Inlet, any amount of scrubbers, even a low take up by ships, could be dangerous to marine and aquatic life in our local area. Great. Thanks, Anna. Appreciate you coming. That's great. Very Yes, we do very much appreciate uh, you coming and, um, and your good work in civil society out there. Um, those are the speakers, Council. Um, so we, uh, this motion has already been moved and, um, and seconded yesterday. So um, um, is there any discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Fry. Uh, Chair, in, the, in order to speed this along, I'm just looking across the room for some nods from my colleagues because I, I would hope that we're all sort of in general support of this idea and I don't need to speak to it further. Great, okay. thank you, thank you for being so brief. Um, Claire, oh, Councillor DiGenova, go ahead. I did have a question. I'm sorry, I, I didn't have the opportunity to um, ask this yesterday, Councillor Fry, but just a point of information, if I may, Chair. Yeah, through go ahead, through me, go ahead. I was, I was just wondering if there was any consideration, um, I just didn't see it in the motion, to, to including the park board or we're notifying them. I'm not proposing amendment, but just wanted to know if that's a consideration that you had, had made or thought about considering um, that many of our 
our parks uh, also uh, are on shoreline? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Councilor Gijanova. Um, I mean, the, the focus of this really, the port's already moving ahead on this in, in our local context, so this really is truly a UBCM motion in the scope. Um, port Metro Vancouver Fraser is already on top of this and looking at the entire Burrard Inlet and Fraser Estuary, um, so kind of superseding the, the park's context. And as you know, when we bring forward motions to UBCM, it has to be provincial in scope, not, not so local as for instance, park board. So, uh, yeah, super on it. And I, and I do have to commend the Port, uh, port Fraser Authority. They are very ahead of the, the curve on this, and they're really moving, and they've done the studies, and they've seen what's happening, and uh, they're very concerned. So does that answer your That's question? That's good to know. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. I'll just um, say that I support this and appreciate the speaker coming, and I appreciate the motion. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor DiGenova. That is it for um, councillors speaking to this. So, Clerk, if you could move us to a vote, please. And that is unanimous. Great. Uh, that means we are now, now moving on to uh, the second referred motion, which is item six, previously motion B7, the unintended consequences of recent policy changes to GCL waivers on affordable housing, moved and introduced by Councillor Hardwick and seconded by Councillor Dominato. Um, so we are now going to hear speakers to this motion. Um, is Jerry Rakra here on the line? I mean, well, actually it was supposed to be in person, but either. Just a point of privilege, Chair. Um, yes. I, I do believe that Mr. Rakra's in the building. I got an email from him, and I think he was trying to find not his way up really to a the point, Not really a point um, of privilege. So my point of privilege, my, oh, sorry. Maybe yeah. it's a point of procedure. Uh, my point of procedure is, um, would staff be able to check and make sure that there's access to the third floor for the public without security? I think um, staff are in touch with security around this, Councillor DiGenova. Thank you. Thanks. Just a, another point. Okay, they, um, so I'm, they're gonna check, apparently he's not in the, in the building, but um, staff are asking secure, they're checking with security again. Meanwhile, we do have speaker two on the line. I'm gonna suggest we move forward for efficiency and um, move to hear from speaker two, Hassam De Dehimi. Hello? Oh, sorry, sorry, just, I'm, I'm so sorry. I did jump the gun a bit. I believe that our first speaker is just approaching council chambers. Okay, so we do have speaker one, uh, Jerry Rakra. Go ahead. Oh, you sorry, can come I'm forward. In You're in the elevator. That's why no one could see you. <laughs> okay, can I speak? Welcome. Go ahead. You have up to five minutes to address council. Sure. If you want to take a moment to just catch your breath, yeah. take your jacket off, that's right fine. Here. Um, hello, my name is Jerry. I'm the owner of Vandwell Developments. I'm here to support this motion. Um, when my project was approved by Council in February 2019, I was attached, uh, it was attached to a City of Vancouver policy that allowed uh, waivers for uh, rental 100 projects. In exchange for deepening affordability in rents in East Vancouver, which I complied to with my housing agreement the city of, and the, with the City of Vancouver. The policy was changed after my approval. Um, I'm one of the 13 projects that didn't make the, through the process in time for the in-stream rate protection for DCL waivers. Um, if anybody on council would like to ask me why I didn't meet the deadline, I would gladly provide that information and supporting evidence. Some projects may be available to make their projects work, but it won't be at the levels of affordability according to Rental 100. It will be at market rental. I am not in the situation. For my project, this means 38 less units of housing because my performa doesn't have the room to accommodate a cost that wasn't a part of my agreement. Larger developers have the ability to handle these costs. Uh, the Provincial Housing Minister, David Eby, has reached out to me and requested a meeting to discuss this project with me this month. Um, he just contacted me a few days ago. 
I'm a smaller developer who cares about the community. I've opened my, box, my books to the staff to show them about the waiver and the amount negotiated in my housing agreement for this project. I can't make it work, my project, and, and I can't wait for staff until June to make a decision. I've waited a very long time already. This council set housing targets as a certain rates of affordability through policy asked developers to deliver this housing. Please think about how this affects your housing targets, housing goals, and affordability in our city. I'm not approving, by not approving this motion, you are passing on opportunity for affordable rents and encouraging renters to compete for rising market rents. What type of message does this send to renters of Vancouver? I hope council doesn't see this as a missed opportunity in collecting $300,000 in fees, but rather if this motion is denied, a loss that may not be quantifiable for future residents, families, businesses, and community growth. Canceling this project will hurt us all. I, I was listening yesterday and the mayor said there's too many motions coming forward at council, and I agree. But this one is critical to preserve affordability and projects who have spent hours hearing and deciding on. I hope there'll be support for this motion to do what is right and include the 13 in-stream projects for the, the waivers that we agreed on on February 19th, 2019. Uh, that's it. Great. Um, you, oh, so you do have questions, so if you want to just stay right there. Councillor Hardwick, go ahead. Up to three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to understand a little bit more in detail why you weren't able to make the deadlines. Um, I'm not, I mean, I'll be, I'll be blunt. Look, looking at, at this motion, um, it's, it's referring to the targets of the Housing Vancouver strategy, which um, I call into question routinely. Sure. So that's not going to work for me. But uh, what I would like to understand is the practical reality that has impacted you as a small developer. Sure. So I started this uh, process almost six years ago now uh, for this rental project. Um, I was, it was passed, the rezoning was passed February 19, 2019. I've been working back and forth. My team has been working with the city of Vancouver. There's been significant delays due to COVID, staffing, staffing turnover. Um, so many different departments not communicating with one another, um, response times. Uh, I have documented proof that we'd send an, we'd get an email from city staff, we'd respond within 18 hours the next day, and we wouldn't get a response in three week intervals. Um, those are some of the delays that extended this. So we missed the deadline of September 29th, 2021. Uh, I was only notified by my project coordinator six months prior. And his response was, well, it's public information and you should have known about it. And so when I found out in March of 2021, I started talking to the, the permitting staff, I'm talking to building permit, development permit. I said, okay, we need to meet this deadline. And everybody was working towards that deadline. And engineering uh, delayed us by almost 10 weeks. They, uh, they confessed that they, that they didn't understand the part, their own parking bylaw. And that delayed me even 10 weeks right there. Then we went into summer session. Uh, I guess uh, council was away. And then by the time um, I was ready to go in front of council to, to enact the housing agreement, I got bumped by a couple weeks and I missed the deadline. So my housing agreement was uh, registered at land titles prior to the September 29th date uh, of 2021. But when I went to pay the permit fees, they didn't exempt the utility waiver which is $284,000 for my project alone. And a lot of the other developers, from my understanding, is they, they're, not, they're, not, they're not gonna, they're ripping up their housing agreements and they're gonna just go to rental rates. I'm doing under the rental 100, which uh, rates are set by CMHC and City of Vancouver. So paraphrasing, the, the goalposts have been moved because of mitigating circumstances with the pandemic, and you feel that those in combination should uh, uh, enable reconsideration of your sure. DCL waiver. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's correct. Your time. So I just wanted to verify. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Could you you raise this up right for in. me. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Great. 
Councillor Di Genova, you have up to three minutes of questions. Thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks for sharing your story with Council Jerry. Um, I I want to ask you, you had mentioned that there, there was a discrepancy in the dates of yes. letters. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? So when we got to the, the, the nearing the end of the project, when the permits are issued, I got an email from the uh, development permit, uh, sorry, it's the DCL coordinator. They're the ones that set the, the permit fees. And when I saw the, the document, it says that the fees were to be paid prior to September 29th, 2022. And that confused me further. So I have that document, that email from uh, the permitting staff that says, so according to that email, I didn't miss the deadline. But when were your fees, were your fees due on September 29th, 2022? Well, the, according to that email they were, but prior knowledge that I had in March, it said uh, September 29th, 2021. And okay. that was because the bylaw was passed, I believe in November 28th, 20. 2020 that they would go away with the utility waiver and anybody that's in stream would have to have their building permit issued by September 29th 2021. I wasn't okay. aware of that until of March 2021. Now, when I did I find do... out yeah I did go make ahead. an attempt. No you go ahead. Yeah. You did make an attempt to, to rectify that but yes. can you just clarify it was too late? Yeah, it was too late yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for sharing that. Are you saying, are you, are you telling council, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but your project won't be viable anymore? Like you can't wait until June until staff comes back with some new policy. It would just have to be a consideration for your project and other projects in your situation, which I understand is 13. Yes. Is, is that the case? And, and what I heard you say in your presentation, if you could just clarify and let me know if this is right or correct me, um, that other developers who possibly are, uh, have larger, you know, development companies or yep. um, more equity would be able to to do this and bridge that gap, but they would have to bridge finance and they would be tearing up their housing agreements and renting at market rents instead of the rental 100 rents. Is that correct? Correct. Larger developers, it's advantageous for them to not abide to the housing agreement. It's almost a blessing in disguise for them because the rates are raising rising so much, but due to my project because it's passive house the increased cost of that development first of all secondly inflation um, my numbers even if, if i even if i forego the housing agreement and i pay the million dollars in fees my project is not feasible it's, it's very well known that uh, um, rental projects have very fixed profitability it's very tight and that's my yes. time so yes. i'll leave it there thank you thank you and you have more questions councillor kirby young yeah, hi, Jerry, and thanks hi. for indulging me because it's been a long, it feels like it's been a long couple of council days, and I just want to get I, my I, head around this yes. to be clear. So you were in stream. Correct. You had a negotiated housing agreement. Correct. Affordability. And for some reason, you missed it. And you're not just saying now that the level of affordability is compromised. You are saying that you may not be able to do the project. Yeah, I, like, I, my, my financing is through Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation, and they have very strict guidelines. I have to sit certain amounts of profitability. All that information was already given to them, approved. All the waivers, all the numbers were in there. And then once this chain, that 300 delta, they're like, well, we can't approve it. That's not what we agreed on. So the, I gave them the housing agreement. I gave them all the numbers. And then when the goalposts changed, when, when the city changed the bylaw in 2020, um, and I thought I would hit it, of, uh, I, would, I would meet the deadline of 2021, I just missed it by like three weeks. Okay, and in your case, we were talking about how many rental housing? It's 38 rental units. 38 rental housing. And also, this is a passive house building. So, pa so rental, passive house, 38 Thir units, yeah. and theoretically 20% of those, whatever it would have been, would have been the... Affordable component. Well, well affordable in, in with regards to the definition of the rental 100, they're all under the affordable housing. Right. Out of 38 units. Was it the rental 100 program, program yes. at the time? Yeah, and so, those, are all, those rates are all set by the city of Vancouver. Okay. So next question, and I'm sorry if these are super no, no. simple questions, but if this isn't reviewed, what do you, or, you know, there isn't reconsideration, what are you doing with your... 
land in your project? What do you, what are your Either options? we sell it, I sell it, or it goes into bankruptcy. It's like I'm every month I'm losing about twenty thousand dollars because it's sitting empty. The permits have been ready since uh, December fifteenth, I believe. So and now like I'm having issues with. So you're thinking selling? Like you wouldn't? I'm just jumping in because I have yeah. limited time, but you wouldn't yeah. go strata or build something else. You can't build strata because it's because I I rezoned it under. Um, the rental 100 program, which increased the density from one to three. So you, I could I could build eight townhouses that would sell for about three million dollars each, or or I could build a rental building with fixed rental rates. Those are the alternatives. So so why won't I do strata? Yeah, so okay, so three options: to so get reconsideration, yes, sell the property, yes, owned townhomes, townhomes, yeah. But I'd have to wait another two years. I'd have to get it rezoned. It's just not a feasible project. I've I've been at this for five years. How frustrated are you? We're, uh, In a word. Words can't explain. I like, like I said, the larger developers they can eat a three hundred thousand dollar cost. They're making millions other spots. I don't have that ability. I'm a smaller developer. Um, I believe in the community. I've been in the community. This this neighborhood needs rental housing. Um, I've done everything that was asked of me. I've not asked for extra density. I haven't asked for an extra square inch compared to larger developers. They're always asking for this and that. I have not asked for anything. All I ask for is for the city of Vancouver to honor the agreement that we agreed upon. Okay, very you simple. are definitely over time, Councillor Kirby Young. Thank but you. you do have more questions. Councillor Fry, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Jerry. Um, Councillor. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I've, I've had issues with the DCL waiver programs in the past, but I do sure. appreciate fairness is fairness and that you have pursued it in good faith under the, the, the terms that we had set out as sure. a, Yeah, and was prior to this council, so I, yeah. Totally, totally yeah. get it. So I just, I, I'm looking for a little bit more clarity. So number one, um, the motion <laughs> seeks to have a report back like this month before April 2022. Yes. Is that germane to your situation or is that, because that's a, that's a tough deadline in yeah. any context. So, uh, yeah, because I'm like, to, for me, it's daily. I don't know. Like, I'm at the fringe of collapsing in 20, terms 20, of bucks the profitability, bucks. right? There's another, the, the building's been vacant for four months. We, we did the TRP. Everybody's been moved. We're having issues in the neighborhood with homelessness. It's just a dire situation. This is on right? Adenac? It's on Adenac, as you're aware. And, I, and because this was a residential property, I can't tear the building down. They won't issue a demolition permit. If I can't get a demolition permit, I can't get financing. If they see, this is obviously public information, CMHC knows that now the city is not giving me that warm, that, that um, waiver, all my numbers, they don't align. I just can't go into the bank account and, and pay that fee. Do you so, understand? I do totally yeah. understand. I mean, this is, this this is, is very a advantageous for a lot of the developers because they're like, oh, no housing agreement? Great. I'm just going to go to market at $4 a square foot. And, and so you have prescribed rents that were part of the agreement that you made back in... The, yeah, not the part of the whole agreement. If they're all prescribed, every single unit. There's a mix of one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms. The Rental 100 is a very clear breakdown of the unit sizes that they want and the prices that I could rent them for with a max. So 2017 rents or whatever the date was. Is, yes, is a good way 20, 2019, I believe, Okay, when it was approved by uh, council, the rezoning. Okay, because this is a big club approach to what, I mean, I see totally is a very specific problem for you. And yes. there hasn't been any opportunity in talking to staff about like some kind of discretionary work with your project specifically rather than a big policy sweep. Sure. So... There, when I spoke, staff has been, has been great. They've been trying to help me, but they don't have the mechanism to provide the waiver. They understand my intent was there. It's not like I disappeared for six months and said, just let it hit on the thumb. We were corresponding weekly with every department within the city. I have a clearly detailed timeline, everyone that I've spoken with, um, and that's the issue. The, the staff's like, we would, you know, you're right. You should get this, re but we don't know how because the, the policy that was approved in 2021, it contradicts this. It's saying, okay, if you miss this deadline, you're not getting this money. It's that simple. So they don't have a mechanism to provide it. I think that it would be fair of the 13 that were in stream that made the attempt should be able to be eligible for that waiver. And that is it for your time? I'm out of time. Yeah, and that is it for your questions. Very much appreciate you taking the time to also come here in person. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Um, do we have speaker two on the phone? Uh, Hassam uh, da Daimi? Daimi. Daimi, great. <laughs> we, we can hear yes. you. Go yes. ahead. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. The Worship Mayor and Council, my name is Hassam Dehimi. I'm the president of Placemaking Communities. I'm here to speak in support of the motion and ask the city to honor its commitment waiving the utilities DCL, which is now being imposed on our 51 unit rental 100 project. This project has been stuck in permitting for close to four years. The project includes three forms of rental housing, live work, townhomes, and apartments, in addition to a boutique neighborhood retail shop on a small and challenging irregular 18,700 square feet site. The original application was submitted on February 27, 2018. Rezoning was approved by Council on July 21st, 2020. On April 30th, 2021, the housing agreement was registered on title. The housing agreement dictates the rental rates on all residential units. The agreement was to provide the future residents with subsidized rental rates, and in exchange, the city would waive DCLs, all DCLs associated with the project, as per staff's report to council at the time of rezoning. We submitted our building permit stage one application on May 28, 2021. We hired a certified professional to expedite the building permit process in order to quickly deliver the type of housing that our city so desperately needs. The city was not in the position to issue a building permit due to outstanding items in the project's development permit application. All those items are related to the encroachment agreement and the pocket park design, which was pending approval from Metro Van, as they have infrastructure buried underneath the boulevard adjacent to our site. We were asked by the city staff during rezoning to build an off-site pocket park on that same boulevard located at the intersection of Rupert East 29, which we gladly accepted. However, Metro Van staff took over four months to conditionally approve our design. This approval process began in June 2021 and received conditional approval from Metro Van in November 2021. In addition to the off-site po pocket park, we've been asked to provide for significant off-site improvements to the intersection at East 29th and Rupert Street as per our services agreement. For those works, the city's engineering staff estimates ranges uh, between $600,000 dollars $650,000. Such as small rental projects simply cannot afford another $420,000 in fees on top of all off-site improvements and public pocket parks that we've been asked to provide. We're a small family-run developer focused on doing our part in solving our region's housing affordability crisis. We do this by delivering the most affordable housing that a private market developer can deliver. Transit-oriented, wood-frame, low-rise rental housing. We can only do this in partnership with municipal partners. We simply are not able to deliver housing if the rug is pulled out from under our feet by our municipal partners after promising us certain incentives to enable us to do our part. We never received any correspondence from staff with, with information on in-stream protection deadlines throughout the entire rezoning, development permit, and building permit uh, phases. We have paid $221,000 in building permit and connection fees to date. All those fees were paid prior to the in-stream protection deadline. As soon as we received the fee notice, we paid them right away so that we could re receive our permits to commence work and deliver the type of housing that our city so desperately needs. I understand that one of I understand that one of the applicants has requested to cancel their housing agreements because the city is not meeting their end of the bargain. We do not want to go that to go that route. We want to do our, our part to improve housing affordability. I'm confident that once our application timeline is reviewed by council, the waiver would still stand and we can proceed with delivering the diverse range of uh, rental housing, which include live work, townhomes, and apartments that our city and region so desperately need. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, and thank you for yours. You have some questions, so just stay on the line. Councilor Di Genova, up to three minutes. Thanks very much for coming out and sharing your your story about how you got here and how long it's taken you. Um, and I understand that that you know not, this motion isn't to point fingers; it's to try and find a way back to what this council, although we may have different ways of getting there to affordability. So I'm just wondering, in your situation, and you don't have to answer my question, but are you able mm -hmm. to eat the cost of the DCL waiver and still? Um, meet the terms of your housing agreement or it, without that DCL waiver, would you have to revert to market housing if you were able to, to move forward with your project at all? Uh, Madam Councillor, I we had our, uh, our appraiser uh, to do an appraisal exercise uh, to see what 
how to how much that housing agreement translates into in terms of the building value. We are providing about the twelve percent discount uh, compared to market rent, rent, and that translates to about two million dollars in, in in building value. So uh, the housing agreement uh, indicates certain rental caps uh, that we're still committed to provide if if the, the city is, uh, is is prepared to meet uh, um, their end of the bargain. But, but um, if the city can't so, come back with something, would you have to go in your pro forma to market rents or or we would, scrap the affordability uh, in rental 100? My, we would we would basically need to revise the housing agreement. We don't want okay. to do that, but we would need to revise the I housing understand. agreement because of and that's the, what the rent, I, that's yeah, what I was asking. Has gone up quite a bit. And yeah. some of my colleagues yeah, have talked agreement. about. I, I, sure. And I'm so sorry. I, I just have a minute left. I'll give you most of my time. Sure. I just no wanted Go to ahead. ask yeah. you. Go some ahead. of my colleagues have said, and it's true, our staff are coming back with other options in June. But what I've heard from others, not just from uh, Mr. Rockra, who spoke before you, is that's too late for them. And as was mentioned, you know, there's already someone who, or a developer, I suppose, that um, has tried to cancel their housing agreement or revise it. So is June too late for you? Do you need to hear about this sooner than later? Is it costing you money every day? Will you be able to do this if we don't hear back about this uh, in, the t in the timeline this, I've set out? This, this is costing a significant amount of money. Uh, on a daily basis, and this is one of the one of the issues. I sat on the district of North Vancouver Housing uh, Rental, Social, and Affordable Housing Task Force, and advised as as the only member of the development industry. And some of the, some of the policies we make some and encourages land banking, encourages in speculation. We're not in. I'm not in the in the business of speculation housing uh, and 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 land banking. We just want to build houses. I'm a, I'm a home builder. I, but you need I, this to be done by next month to be able to move forward. I, I, I need this. Uh, honestly, I need this to be done today. I, I need to gain some clarity. And, and Jay made an interesting point about, you know, some of the more well-capitalized or some of the, Actually, you know, bigger developers. They can sit on, they can sit on properties. We're, we're, we're home builders. Okay, we wait, and actually you are, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry to interrupt, but you are sure. well over time. Um, so, Councilor Thank Jacoba, you. that is your time. And um, that's it for questions. Very much appreciate, though, you calling in on this. And, um, yeah, Council, thank you. Um, have a good evening. Um, Council, we are at the end of speakers to this item. Um, so, at this point, um, the, it's already been moved and seconded, so it's open to, for debate. I'm, yeah, Councilor DiGenova. Thanks very much. Um, I want to start by thanking Councillor Hardwick. Um, I was on a medical leave of absence yesterday and Councillor Hardwick was uh, kind enough uh, to do for me what I'd hope we'd all do for each other, which is um, to move this forward um, on my behalf. And I just really wanted to, to note that and thank her uh, for doing so and, and thank Council for uh, um, allowing speakers to speak to that today. Um, I. I want I want to be very transparent that I'm not trying to change a policy. If I was trying to do that, I would ask for a vote of reconsideration. What I am looking for is we've spent many hours, Council, in public hearings. And regardless of how we voted on these 13 projects, what very much concerns me is that we could be losing affordability here or units in, that, that actually play a part in how close we can get to our housing target. Um, I, I did try and, and review some of the comments and I'd heard um, what was said um, on, on the tape uh, last night or yesterday afternoon when I couldn't be here. And I haven't put forward very many motions. In fact, I've been holding them back. And I think you can see that if you look at, um, at the minutes over the past few months. But I do think this is important. And that this is about making housing more affordable. And the most affordable housing is the housing that's either already there or that is going to come online very soon. So what we've heard from not only these developers, but you'll see in the, the comments for my questions on one of these projects to staff that were circulated to all of council is we can't just deal with one project individually. That that um, 
that it would in fact have to be all projects that were eligible or caught in this situation. So I would rather see there be some affordability, even if, if we argue that it's not affordable enough, than see that go to market rents or see a project that is green, that provides family housing, not be built because the developer just can't simply finance that extra amount that wasn't in their housing agreement um, and wasn't there at the time of council approval on this council. So I, I'm happy to take any questions also as points of information if the chair allows that, but I just wanted to be transparent and upfront as to why I'm doing this. And I hope that we can all support this together uh, because ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, I know that each and every one of us cares deeply about affordable housing in our city. And uh, that's all I'm trying to do here is to find a way forward for 13 projects that will be less affordable if even built, if we don't do this today. Great. Thanks, Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Hardwick. Yeah, thank you. Um, Councillor DiGenova, you're welcome. Um, this motion uh, uses in its whereas is the Housing Vancouver strategy targets, which I continue to find objectionable, um, which I will point to. That having been said, I also find it uh, very difficult when I listen to the shifting goalposts and what uh, uh, has been experienced because of these, not only the changing um, policies, but also uh, the impact of, of the pandemic. So I um, am going to at the end of the day, I'm going to abstain, which, as we know, under the Vancouver Charter counts as a vote uh, in support. And, and I just want to make it clear to, to Jerry that my purpose in doing this is, is my ongoing at, uh, attempt to draw attention to um, the shortcomings of the Vancouver house, uh, housing strategy. Um, but I am sensitive to, again, the shifting goalposts in this particular instance. So that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks. Sorry, Chair. Um, I'm um, sorry, just collecting my thoughts. Um, happy to support this motion. Um, and it, it stems from a number of conversations around this and, and what we've heard from both the speakers, but... Um, I really want to touch on a couple of points that Councillor DiGenova highlighted, is that um, the, these um, uh, small uh, builders um, entered into, uh, in good faith, uh, housing agreements with the city uh, to deliver affordable housing, um, uh, some, uh, particularly rental, which we know is uh, needed in the city, some of it below market, some of it targeted at families. And in some instances, I, I believe uh, there may have been unclear communication about the changes that were coming and and um and so as a result did not qualify for in stream and uh i i think that we need to continue to focus on what are the broader outcomes that we want to achieve as a city and and uh, the conversation we've had, um, and I think it will continue to be a conversation here, is the issue of housing and housing affordability and housing choice for families. And I think that um, this is, again, one of those situations where, um, and I appreciate the name of the motion of being unintended consequences of the recent policy changes, is there are unintended consequences here, which is that um, this housing might not be delivered. Uh, and uh, that would be very unfortunate because, again, it's, I'm always focused on what are the broad strategic outcomes we want to achieve. And I think this is an instance where um, we need to step back and we need to remedy this. And uh, the way I read this motion is it does ask for staff to report back, but to look at some solutions to deal with um, this gap. And so from, from my perspective, um, it's sound, it's reasonable, it has merit, and um, I, I would encourage council to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. Councillor Fry. Thanks, uh, Chair. Yeah, I, uh, I'm definitely um, appreciate the, the two speakers coming to speak to this, and I appreciate uh, Councillor DiGenova bringing this forward in the interest of, of fairness uh, across the board. Uh, it's no secret that I've I've voted against a lot of these rental 100s and the DCL waiver programs because I, I don't think it's the best use of um, of taxpayer resources. Uh, that being said, I think fair is fair, and 
and um, you know, Mr. Rockra and others have negotiated in good faith uh, with the intention of landing um, a project they thought they were working on. And I and I do also appreciate that Jerry Rockra is going to be meeting with Minister Eby uh, in short order, and and that there has been a lot of pretty significant uh, conversation coming from the province, and and uh, dare I say, a bit of saber rattling around how. Uh, local governments may or may not be getting in the way of development, so I think that this is an important thing to acknowledge. Um, so with that said, I've, I've submitted an amendment to clerks, and um, um, I, I think, um, barring any kind of uh, comments from legal, um, I'd like to move forward with the amendment. Um, so maybe jumping over to an amendment Q. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to move us to an amendment Q. Um, just a second. I've got I've got to clear the queue first. And um, Councillor Dijanova, if you could just let me put uh, Councillor Fry on first, please. Oh, of course. My apologies. Yeah. I didn't. I haven't done it yet, so I will put you on, Councillor Dijanova. Um, I'm just going to Councillor Fry. Go ahead to your amendment. Yeah, and so for for my support, I want it to be clear that this is not a big club approach to the the the, um, the DCL waivers that that I'm recognizing, and I, I feel that it is important to recognize, in fairness, uh, you know, developers who are, are working in good faith in our city and have you know through COVID and, and various circumstances have not been able to meet those timelines, and I think that that's fair. Uh, I see a comment from the city manager. There's no issue from law on this as well. I do uh, concede, though, that um, by April 2022 is uh, less than 30 days, and I don't think that's realistic to expect our staff to turn this around. It would be great if they could, but I don't want to be uh, putting pressure on that. And then by striking B, so referencing 13 projects, to be clear that that is what this is about, is the fairness for the folks who are in stream and not a big club approach to DCL waivers in, in, in total, and by striking B, also recognizing that this isn't the conversation at, at hand about, about DCL waivers so much as fairness for Mr. Rocker and others. Great. That's it. Councillor, uh, thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor DiGenova to the amendment. Thanks very much. I just wanted to ask a point of information, if that was all right, to staff. Yep, go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, just a point of information to our city manager. Um, I'm wondering if you could could share with the timeline struck here. Uh, we've heard from some of these uh, developers already today that they need this done quite urgently. So, how long will like will staff? I understand that staff have already spoken to many of these developers as they tried to work through the process with them, and there were 13, as I've noted in the motion, that did not make it. So, could you please? comment or tell me um, as soon as that's ready that that would come back to council that you would find a place to fit that into the agenda because my concern is is that if that doesn't happen and it's down the road the boat will be missed here and these 13 projects won't move forward so without this timeline that staff would be able to bring this back as soon as they have this ready um, just just before answering, City Manager, Councillor DiGenova, we're at um, we have five minutes to go before uh, we have to stop. Happy for to move break. a motion to extend th this item. If anyone doesn't want extend to do that, extend beyond to five to finish yes. this item. Uh, sorry, uh, there's a point of procedure to that um, motion. Thank you for the the motion. It, it does need. Yeah. Okay. Just one second. Um, Councilor Perhaps Kirby, I can ask for a point of clarification, maybe before doing so. Is is are we suggesting then that we would reconvene after a dinner break to finish the rest of the agenda? I just well, want to be that's clear. the way that's the way that would read. Okay, so we will be taking a dinner break and coming back. Is that correct, Chair? That is. This is. It's just to complete this particular item. Okay, but we are going to finish the rest of the business today. I just wanted to. We are scheduled to go to ten o'clock tonight. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure we're not dissing. We're not canceling the evening. That's no. fine. Okay. We are definitely not canceling the evening. Sorry, Thank city you. manager. Um, back to you in response to the. Do we point need of to vote on that, Chair? No, um, oh yes. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> we do. All those in favor of extending, I'll say aye. 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 This is to extend to complete this item. Any of those opposed, say nay. Fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, my apologies, city manager. Oh, thanks, uh, Chair. Through you. So yeah, I understand the question. 
um, from Councillor Gigenova relates to um, kind of when staff would come back. We certainly understand the time sensitivity of this issue, so I, you know, we're, I'm clear on that. I think staff are clear on that. We we would endeavor to bring this back as quickly as we could. Um, there is, um, you know, a, a, there is a there may be a workload issue here in the sense or in, in respect of the DCL update that staff are currently conducting and that council does need to approve. But we'll again, we, we certainly understand what council's intent would be here and would aim to come back as, as quickly as we could. Thanks. And just to follow up to this, this could possibly come back before that because it's exclusively for these 13 projects. Is that correct? Um, through you, Chair, yeah, hard to say. I, I, I don't want to kind of uh, put staff too far into a box by committing to a timeline, but the, it's, it may be possible. And if it is, we, we would bring it back sooner. Thank you. The word I used was could, not will. So thank you. That's, that's good to know. So with that information, I'm happy to support this uh, motion and, uh, or, or sorry, this amendment, Councillor Fry, I do appreciate it. Um, and I had had toyed with the idea of putting thir the number 13 in there myself. Um, I do think ultimately that, that regardless of where the chips fall on this, and if projects are able to hang in um, that long, we will get a report back on our housing target numbers um, in the housing strategy as to what the inventory is that we're, we are delivering and where we've fallen short in the Vancouver housing strategy that sets out targets until 2027. So for that reason, I do support this and really was, was trying to highlight um, what I thought was an unintended consequence here. So um, appreciate the amendments and we'll support them. Thank you very much, Councillor DiGenova. Councillor Kirby-Young to the amendment. Yeah, thanks. I, oh, sorry. Um, I had, can I ask a point of clarification, Chair, through you to the um, city manager? Uh, a point of clarification. A point of information is. Yes, that's, that's the word. Is. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, sorry. Thanks, Paul. Um, on B, and I'm just looking at this, and maybe it's the simplistic common sense approach in this amendment, when it says report back on metrics on how the absence of the waivers would affect the number of units affordability. Don't we already have that? Aren't there 13 applications with probably 13 sheets of paper somewhere that say how many units and what the rates were going to be? And if we didn't have them, we're not going to have X units? Like, that's not particularly cumbersome to compile, is it? Am I misreading that? That's, isn't that all that? Do you read that the same way that that's asking for? Councillor, um, uh, through the chair, it was just reviewing the kind of wording of the motion there again. So in, in B, yep. um, I guess it would require um, discussions around um, number and affordability. Like the, the, those questions may not be consistent across each project. Um, so I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to speak could it happened. Could it be compiled as a PDF and appendix of the page from the application or an Excel sheet that says 13 projects and this number of, of units? Like, I'm looking for simplicity here. I don't read that as being complex. It, it talks about what happens if the waivers aren't granted. That's, that's what, how I read B now. So certainly we, we can provide, we could provide the detail on what the projects, um, what kind of units are being proposed in each project. Okay. I think so, that's straightforward. So that's a helpful clarification because I think you're reading it differently than I am in terms of what's happening if it isn't granted, and maybe it's the part that says units project the housing Vancouver strategy. Would it read differently if that wasn't there, that we're just asking for the units and the affordability that we won't have from these yeah, specific I, 13 projects? I guess, yeah, thanks um, for the opportunity to clarify. What I'm reading there, it talks about provide metrics on how changes to the housing agreements in the absence of the waiver. So that's kind of a hypothetical scenario. Um, I would suggest, again, I, th I think we can certainly provide the background on how many units we're talking about um, with these 13 projects. I, I would suggest if the intent of council is to proceed with whatever um, adjustments you're looking for here that are kind of contemplated in this motion, I'm not, I don't know how much work is entailed in producing that kind of hypothetical scenario B. Okay. Um, yeah. I appreciate that. And maybe that's a signal to my colleague, Councillor DiGenova, to potentially clarify what her intent was on that, because I wonder if council might be reacting to it, perceiving different things. Right, okay, she's got back on the list, but um, you're almost out of time. Oh no, you have five minutes on this. Are you, are you done, Councillor Kirby? Young? Okay, Councillor Nova, you do have a couple of more minutes, go ahead. Well, I, 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 
don't know if it's appropriate to do in this amendment, but because it's all tangled in, um, I just wanted to uh, to provide some information that may be helpful there. And I think that our city manager had it right. Each and every one of these 13 projects could be different. As uh, you know, the first speaker, Jerry Rockra said, you know, he's in a different position than possibly other developers that have bigger companies with more equity where they can, you know, bridge their financing or make up that difference but they would still have to change their housing agreements. So their housing agreements may be going to market housing rates, whereas other projects may not be built at all. There could be something maybe in the middle. So each of them would technically be different. And I would like, to, I mean, if we can do this, then we know. So if all 13 of them are able to move forward in a way where they can honor their housing agreements, we already have those metrics. But right now, without this, they won't be able to do that. So my hope was is that we, we would find out kind of either way. Now I know we will at our housing update or the next housing update on this matter. And we might even know about that in June. That might be included in some of the information on the DCL uh, program. But for now, I'm, I'm fine to exclude this. And if we don't hear back by June, I could add this, I understand, to probably a report in June as an amendment to ask about those 13 projects if there was more information there. Um, really, the end goal here is just to make sure that we deliver the housing that we agreed to deliver and do our part in a partnership with others to make sure that we are um, moving towards more affordable housing in a city that we okay. all know is so un unaffordable. Great. Thanks. Thank Care. you, Councillor DiGenova. Um, seeing no one else um, on the list to speak, um, Clerk, if you could uh, move us to a vote on this amendment by Councillor Fry. And um, that passes uh, with one opposed, Councillor Kirby Young. Okay, and uh, we are now back to um, the main queue. Councillor Fry, do you have anything else at the this, on this queue? Uh, no, I'm fine. Thanks, Chair. Great, thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Go ahead. Are we the now speaking motion. to the main? You're, you're speaking to the amended, amended motion. motion. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm happy to support it because I believe in procedural fairness and I'm concerned about uh, rental housing and affordability. How's that for short? I think that's wonderful. Good precedent for everyone else. Go ahead, Councillor DiGenova. Well, I just, I just wanted to, uh, again, I really want to thank Councillor Hardwick or else we might not be doing this today um, and considering this. And I understand that, you know, there is not only sleep being lost by each and every developer, but uh, many of them have have uh, been very transparent with their pro formas, and and I understand from staff that they feel that way too. Um, I, regardless of of whether or not you voted for these projects or against them, council, I hope that we would all vote to make sure that the goalposts stay where we've said that they would, and uh, work in good faith with our partners, and that includes the people who build housing in our city. Um, it's the only way with, that we will move to affordability in uh, my opinion. So um, I humbly asking for your support, not for myself, but for the people who will have more affordable homes um, if we move forward with this. And also wanted to uh, appreciate and thank Councillor Fry for the amendment. And if we don't receive the numbers back, um, Councillor Kirby Young, uh, you can be sure that I will be moving an amendment to the DCL update um, report in June. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much. And that is it for the um, questions, I mean, for the comments. But uh, so, staff, if you could move us to a vote on the amended motion. Okay, that is, uh, that passes unanimously. Great. And that takes us to our dinner break. Um, so we will reconvene at six, right now. It's 5.07, so we'll reconvene at five minutes past six.
uh, to complete the last two items. 510, I could say 510, but um, 510 it is.
Welcome to
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, if we could just all come to order now. I, we have quorum. <clears throat> Our third referred motion is item seven, which was previously motion B8, Centering Community Facilities and Infrastructure in 2023-2026 Capital Plan, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Kirby Young and seconded by Councillor Dominato. Uh, we will now hear speakers uh, to this motion. Um, so, uh, I'm clerk. Have we got speakers on the line? We do. So is uh, speaker one, Wally Wargalet, on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, to You have five minutes to address council. Great. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak uh, to all of you today. Um, I am the executive director of the Gastown Business Improvement Society. I'm uh, excited to have this chance to talk on behalf of uh, close to 500 businesses, thousands of workers in our neighborhood. But also um, today I'm talking on behalf of some of the residents who reached out to me on this specific issue in support of this motion put forth. And um, probably the biggest reason is just a feel of a lack of care or concern for the infrastructure specifically of Gastown. I'm not sure if any of you folks have been in our neighborhood recently. Uh, I know some of you have because I walked through that with you. Um, it is really a shame that we have left a national historic site deteriorate to where it is today. Potholes and streets, cobblestones missing, uh, patched over with asphalt. Uh, very rare um, is it in, in, in the past 10 months that I have had this job that I can get many different stakeholders with many different viewpoints to agree on something, but this is the one thing I can get folks in uh, representing businesses, both large and small, um, international co companies like Global Relay, Microsoft, small businesses like uh, Colorbox uh, Hair Salon, and then we have market residents, uh, social housing residents. Uh, we have even city staff and city councilors I've talked to agree that we all should be ashamed of what has happened to this beautiful neighborhood, this national historic site. I, I say that twice because sometimes I, I don't even believe that that could be true given the state of it. So we do want this council to focus on infrastructure. Um, maybe not even the not even the complete streets. Uh, in my conversations with city staff, we're so far from that for Gastown. There are too many unknown factors. But the one unknown factor is that our streets are deteriorating, and we need some help. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the, my thoughts on a positive note, and that is we've actually made some headway in the 10 months um, I've been in this position and getting some things done in our neighborhood. It's a great first start. But we have a long, long way to go. I just had a conversation today with uh, city staff uh, where there's a couple hundred thousand dollars being set aside to do some cut repairs. I can tell you that is a drop in the bucket in the tens of 20 million, 30 million dollars it could be just to put our neighborhood back into the shape that it should be. Uh, and one that we can be proud to show the millions of tourists who are about to come back to our city. And we should care about our brand in many ways, and it is going to be tarnished if this is what we allow to happen. So uh, I really, really encourage um, all the councillors to uh, support this motion and to do the right thing and to make sure we're making the right investments um, in, in our neighbourhood. That's all I have to say. That's great. Thank you so much. You do have questions, so if you wouldn't mind staying on the line. Councillor sure. Kirby Young, go ahead. Hi, Wally. Good evening. Um, thanks for speaking to council. I, you sort of started to touch on the question I was going to ask you at the end, or my first question in the short time I have, and that was um, with respect to tourism and the tourism industry coming back. And how important do you think it is um, for that sector? Because I know that's been a huge impact on your neighborhood, <clears throat> your neighborhood. but in terms of guest towns being able to bounce back and sustain that it's a welcoming environment for visitors. No, it's a key, right? It's a key. We have many of our businesses still down 80, 90 percent from pre-pandemic levels in their revenues. And, you know, without tourists, um, and, and if it doesn't happen this, this year, we will lose a lot of those businesses. I had an executive director from um, Minnesota come through, and, and she was just astonished that such an amazing neighborhood could be left in the shambles that it is. She just, did, she just didn't understand it, and, and neither do I, to be frank. 
Okay, and you mentioned that you'd also been speaking with a lot of residents who were sort of trying to reflect their perspective today. I think we got a number of emails from different residents, and I think one of them spoke to the fact that they were actually looking at moving out of the neighborhood just because it felt that when it felt like people didn't care. I think mm -hmm. it was sort of, a, you know, in essence, that's what the letter came down to. And if they didn't care, and it sort of conveyed that why should the residents or, you know, people try to interact and keep sort of the social balance and be proud in the neighborhood. Is that reflective of what you're hearing? Because I certainly got a couple letters that really explicitly stated that. One, 100% counselor. I heard it just today uh, in t speaking to a resident. He, he literally, in, in real seriousness, in s real sadness, he says, why has the city forgotten about us? Why do they not care about this neighborhood? And and he, too, and his partner are saying, maybe we need to leave the neighborhood. Maybe we need to get out of here. If the city can't take care of it um, and can't show a real community effort here, how, how can we how can we do that? So you're, you're spot on. Uh, I'm hearing that daily, not just from residents, but also from so many businesses as well. Okay. Um, are you losing stores now? I'm sorry? Are you losing stores or retailers now, small business? We've, we've lost a few. Um, I mean, the, the good news is our neighborhood has been, always been very resilient. So we've, we've actually shored up quite a few of the empty storefronts. But the thing that I'm most fearful of, I know in talking to a lot of these, and especially a lot of the smaller businesses, they are hanging on by a thread. They just are. Um, it's, you know, daily receipts. Hopefully that covers the phone bill. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Uh, you know, just think about a loss of 80 to 90 percent of revenue. Uh, look at what the city of Vancouver um, had to experience during the pandemic when you've lost a fraction of that and how much stopped working. So think about that and, and, and help us. That's all we're asking for. Do, do, we're asking for everyone to just do their job. Thanks, Molly. That's my time. Thanks for speaking. Thanks, Councillor Thank you. Kirby-Young. Councillor Hardwick, for up to three minutes. Hi. Do you think that there has been a change in the attitude towards Gastown um, from a heritage and cultural perspective? Uh, one of the things that we hear uh, frequently in, uh, in our reports is um, an emphasis on uh, decolonization and uh, the sense that the hist our history is uh, not uh, valuable because of its negative impacts on uh, a variety of groups, starting with the Indigenous First Nations people. Do you think that that, at a cultural level, has had an impact on the way that the city has been viewing its interaction with Gastown? You know, it's an excellent question, uh, Councillor Hardwick. I think in some ways, yes. I think that I, I've certainly heard um, echoes from city staff about there is, has to be a reconciliation lens looked at um, on a lot of decisions that the city is making. And, you know, uh, you can applaud that. Uh, one of the things that I've learned in some of the reconciliation work I've done is um, the First Nations cared about the, the land that they had, and they and they saw themselves as caretakers. Well, we need to be caretakers of our neighborhood and of our infrastructure. That's also important. So there, there is, uh, I think there's some truth to that, and I think there's a lesson for us to learn from the First Nations when it comes to being caretakers of, of this land and this city. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and that is it for your questions, but thank you very much, Wally, for joining us. and. Um, uh, your great work down in Gastown. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank Have you. a good night. You too. And speaker two on the line, Eddie Emmerman. Yes, hello? Yes, we hear you clearly. Go ahead for up to five minutes. Okay, hi, my name, my name is Eddie Emmerman, and I own a, a building with four residential apartments, a business, and I also live in Gastown, uh, which I humbly recognize as the ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. I want to start by saying I support this motion, but I think it's only a start to fixing a systemic problem with how the city is operating. The city is spending too much money on issues that are not the city's jurisdiction or primary function. Yes, housing and climate change is, 
climate change are extremely important, and the city should be using its power and influence to pass bylaws and lobby provincial and federal governments for proper budget allocations to these issues. The city is not supposed to be buying real estate. However, one of the city's primary obligations and responsibilities is maintaining the infrastructure of its streets, sidewalks, plazas, and lighting. It's right behind police and fire. This motion is starting to get the city back on track. Gastown is a mess. From hodgepodge, from the hodgepodge of street repairs to public monuments to street lighting, it's not only an eyesore, but it's a danger to pedestrians and motorists alike. It's been a decade since we have been promised redevelopment and upgrade of our streets, sidewalks, and lighting. I've been to many public consultations, and we have spent almost $100,000 to prepare for these engagements. It's been 15 years since we agreed to compromises on the Carroll Street Greenways, Greenway because the City of Vancouver promised a pedestrian and bicycle overpass to Crab Park. The Greenway, Greenway is the only piece of meaningful infrastructure I have seen built in the neighborhood. That was already 15 years ago, and only one and a half blocks of the Greenway are in Gastown, and it's never been completion. The completion of that involved the development of Maple Tree Square and the overpass to Crab Park, which would finally complete the seawall of the entire circumference of the city's downtown. My dad is a civil engineer. He worked in public realm infrastructure projects from New York to San Francisco to Los Angeles and finally Vancouver. It is because of him that I took on the challenge of restoring a building in Vancouver's nationally recognized historic district. My dad would always say to me that the biggest problem with the city's public realm is that maintaining existing infrastructure does little for the legacy pieces of bureaucrats and politicians. I thought my father was just old and bitter. But the longer I'm in Gastown and on this planet, the more and more I see the truth in these words. I have been 17 years in Gastown. $25 million is being on, spent on some type of legacy peace park at Smythe and Richards, while the streets and lanes of Gastown continue to fall apart and be a hodgepodge of patches. In the alley at the back of my building, we used to have beautiful cobblestones. During some underground electrical maintenance, the cobblestones were removed and the alleyway was paved. We were promised that this was temporary. However, it's been more than 10 years and the cobblestones have not been replaced. When I wanted to paint the concrete block at the back of my building, I was told I was not allowed to do that because of the change to the heritage appearance of the building. It is my feeling that Gastown is cool and vibrant despite the city of Vancouver, not because of it. It's the private sector who is making Gastown cool. The city continues to drag its feet. One only needs to see how the issue of Gassy Jack ended in a violent coup as the city dragged its heels for two years on dealing with that issue. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. Um, if you wouldn't mind staying on the line, you do have questions. Go ahead, Councillor Kirby Young, up to three minutes. Yeah, hi, Eddie. Thanks for speaking. I just want to kind of ask you one question, and you spoke about um, kind of the difficulties in renewing existing infrastructure versus new projects. So I just want to reflect back and make sure I'm hearing you correctly that you've, you're feeling like it's, for whatever reason, there's more emphasis or it's sexier or whatever the reason is that we're you're kind of advocating for just taking care of what we have before we dramatically try to expand. Is that what I'm hearing? I don't want to put words in, so I want to make sure I'm reflecting. I think we need to do both, but it's obvious that there's much more of an emphasis on, on new projects. Um, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with legacy. I, it seems that, that, that people working for the city, you know, want to build something new and big, and that's sort of going to be what they left behind. It's, there's no glamour in, in redoing the streets of Gastown. Right. Although it's a pretty, it's a pretty glamorous neighborhood if it was looked after, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate the perspective. Thanks for hanging in to speak. Thank you. Great, and thanks. That is it for your, your um, questions, but thank you very much for joining us and um, also answering those questions. Uh, speaker three, is speaker three on the line, Ivo Stiano? Speaker three is not on the line. Okay, Council, um, that then finishes our speakers and um, moves us into debate on uh, or discussion on this motion, which has already been moved and seconded. Awesome. Any, any discussion? Okay. Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to um, thank Councillor Dominato for co-submitting this with me and um, also Council for considering it. I think that in conversations um, 
we all know that the capital plan is a really important initiative and I think I noted when um, in some comments when discussions with people that each council inherits a capital plan and each council has a chance to set one and so I think this really is our opportunity to try to listen to the, a lot of the feedback that we're hearing. We see it in the surveys coming in in terms of what it is that's important to people, um, but we are at that stage. It's just all those memories that people have um, from those facilities, like the ice rinks and everything else are just aging. And we've heard too, um, you know, from the speakers from Gastown around what's happening in that historic neighborhood. So um, I actually think there's a lot of um, opportunity for um, getting some really good information back. Um, I think it's always helpful when council are able to provide um, a sense of what they're looking for back from staff, especially an initiative like this in the capital plan. And I think it aligns with the previous motion that Councillor Carr brought forward with respect to having a climate lens on the capital plan. And I actually think there's a lot of um, sort of complementary nature in these motions because core infrastructure and climate are not distinct. They're actually interlinked. And so I often will also say that core infrastructure is climate infrastructure for all the reasons that I don't need to kind of go into and repeat here. So. Um, I think it, it'll be helpful in guiding the kind of information that council can get back so that we can try to um, set some good priorities and balance in our capital plan. But we do, at bottom line, really have some aging infrastructure. And I think that that's a lens that we really need to have when we go into the capital plan um, kind of uh, framing um, and then the final decisions that council is going to make on this. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Councillor Kirby and Councillor Fry. Up to five. Yeah, thanks. And um, I guess just uh, off the top, speaking to the uh, uh, the, the issue of gas town and the complete streets, uh, totally agree that that has long been languishing. As long as I've been on this council, this has been an ongoing conversation. Uh, it seems to get frustrated at every step, and it just keeps looking worse and worse. And as we know, we did have some struggles trying to find a, um, an RFP, uh, somebody to actually do the cobblestone work. But I, I don't think we can afford to just keep neglecting that particular feature. It's obviously one of the highlights of the, the tourist experience, especially for cruise ship folks, and it's a wonderful part of the city. So I think it is uh, definitely, a, I, I just want to acknowledge the concerns the speakers brought up from the gas town perspective. I think Councillor Kirby Young succinctly sort of nailed the notion that, that this is an opportunity for us to send signals about what we'd like to see in, in future capital investments. So I've submitted an amendment. Um, just adding uh, various things. Part of this came about actually through my role as the um, uh, library uh, trustee liaison and uh, their reflection on review of this that, that libraries weren't included in this and of course the Joe Fortes branch uh, as part of the um, King George renewal in the West End and the Marpole Library branch which has long been on the list and of course uh, from my own uh, work in the community, uh, Ray Cam Renewal, which has been uh, something that has been actively pursued for some time, especially the opportunity to uh, partner with BC Housing, and that window is quickly closing. Uh, and, and of course, the Britannia Renewal, which has long been on the books, and uh, folks have been anxiously waiting for that renewal as those facilities are quite threadbare. So as Councillor Kirby Young alluded, this is a great opportunity for us to send signals as to the kind of uh, stuff we'd like to see on the list. So those are my additions to that particular list. That was it for me, Chair. Um, yes, I'm sorry. I was just reading. I was just <laughs> making sure everybody had it. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Oops. Sorry. I have to move us to an amendment queue. Um, anybody wishing to speak to that amendment? Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks. I'll just say quickly, I'm happy to get information back. I think that's a good part of the process, having had the benefit, like Councillor Fry, of sitting on the library board also, sure. um, and the park board. I've got a sense of where I think in age relative, and these are all important amenities, right? They're all valued by the community, but in age, I think we've got a couple of major fire hall gaps, certainly, um, in speaking. Um, and understanding some of those, I think it's seven, two, and eight, don't quote me on the numbers, but there's three that are particularly uh, challenging. Um, there's some community centers that are old. So I, I think there is a couple of libraries that have been new and delivered. Um, and I suspect that we're going to see that we have some holes that may even be more dire than libraries, but I'm happy to get information back. Thanks. Great. I see no one. Oh, it's fire hall seven, eight, and two, I think, are identified as particularly challenging. So just noting that for the record as well. 
Great, thanks. Okay, I see no one else to speak to Councillor Fry's amendment. Um, so I will move us to um, a voting queue on this is on the amendment tabled by Councillor Fry. Vote assist in favor, please. And Chair, it's Councillor Blythe. I can have a vote assist in favor. Great, that is unanimously passed. Great. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, you are. No, good. You're good. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I don't know if there's more amendments. I was just going to make a few final comments. Oh, I see amendments coming, so I will wait. Thanks. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to advance Councillor Boyle. Councillor Boyle. Thanks, Chair. Um, and uh, I have just circulated an amendment, um, just noting that actually Councillor Chair Carr circulated it um, earlier. Uh, and as she's chairing, I, I am putting it forward. Um, so the amendment is uh, that the list of potential capital product projects as included in the motion and then just amended by Council uh, community facilities, street initiatives, green spaces, and fire hall renewals uh, align with and reflect the direction that Council gave in our last meeting um, around alignment between the capital plan and the city's climate emergency action plan. And, and I want to uh, emphasize that um, or, or articulate that I really appreciated uh, in the motion before us today how clearly these issues were linked together. Um, I know we all recognize that think was articulated really well in terms of the increased need for strong infrastructure for updating infrastructure. It's certainly a, a, a central part of the conversation that I hear around Gastown um, and the renewal of the street in particular um, and possibilities for uh, a much more um, pedestrian friendly uh, and active transportation friendly um, public realm uh, in the street there and, and hopefully a um, uh, uh, replacement for cobblestones that is um, much easier for people with disabilities. So a lot of important uh, uh, needs there that align with the climate plan. And um, I, I think this gives some clear direction to staff in terms of the options that would come forward to us um, for that capital plan and, and that alignment. So I, I'll, I think I'm rambling now, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. And um, I actually didn't move us to an amendment queue. Um, I think, Councillor Kirby Young, were you on that amendment queue from before? Okay. And Councillor Dominata, were you on from before yeah, as well? From before, thanks. Okay. So I see um, no one else on the list to speak. So perhaps, uh, Clerk, you can move us to a vote on this amendment. Board assist in favor, please. Chair, can I get a vote assist in favor? I think the clerk has noted that. And that passes unanimously. Great. And we are now back to the main queue. And Councillor Dominato, go ahead. Thanks, Chair, and, and thank you to um, the councillors for the various additions. Um, I, I think it's a really important um, conversation, and of course, uh, with any uh, capital plan, um, you know, we're trying to stretch the dollars as far as possible because there is enormous need, and as we know from initial briefings, just um, that we have infrastructure, newer infrastructure, but we have quite aging infrastructure in the city, and um, you know, Councillor Fry uh, pointed to a few examples um, that I know he's been engaged with over the years. I, I would cite other examples as well, like the Hastings Community Centre um, in my neighbourhood as well, which um, there was initial planning for renewal and, and, and essentially has sort of stalled out. And, and while um, uh, we have to recognise that these are essential amenities for communities and that we need to... Um, deal not only aging infrastructure, but be planning for the growth and the change that our city is going to see. And we know that from the recent census. And um, so 
this is really critical and, and why I was very supportive of, of bringing this forward jointly that uh, we're identifying some of the priorities that need to be looked at. And so um, again, happy to support and, and um, look forward to council embarking on this journey to develop a four year plan to go forward. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Dominato. Uh, Councillor Di Genova to the amended motion. I actually just had a point of procedure, Chair. Oh, sure. I was wondering, do we have to have our cameras on to vote? Because I understood that I was yes, not able to you vote do. my phone earlier. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that because I, I was going to yep. step away and vote by phone for the next item if possible, but just wanted to check. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for, for checking. And thanks. Uh, everybody should, should be cognizant of that. So uh, thank you. Uh, and that leaves no one on the speaker's list. So we can move to a vote, clerk, on the amended motion. Vote in favor. Council Bly in favor. And that passes unanimously with all of us here, which is wonderful. Um, so, well done. And uh, we are now on to our final item. Sorry. Okay, I just got a reminder from the um, clerk that we all really have to remember to keep our cam not, not not those of us in the chamber, but um, those of you uh, who are calling in, please make sure that your cameras are on. All right, we are on the final um, uh, item on this agenda, the fourth referred motion, which is item eight, uh, pro previously motion B10, a regulatory framework to enable innovative urban activation projects which was moved and introduced by Councillor Dominato, seconded by Councillor Kirby Young. And uh, we are now going to listen to um, speakers on this. Do we have um, Speaker Ian Tostenson, President and CEO of BC Rest Association online? You do. Oh, that's great. You're very clear. So you have up to five minutes to address Council. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, and Council, thank you for um, the time you put on these things. As you know, um, our industry was likely uh, the canary in the coal mine in the last two years. We're still in it. We're far from uh, being out of the pandemic. Um, I listened to the stories about Gastown. Our, our businesses have not recovered financially. It's going to be a long time. So we, um, we've done a number of things over the last couple of years to try to be leaders and innovate and to bring value to the industry um, to get them through this. And at the same time, we've always made really earnest attempts to work with the city of Vancouver to um, position the city as being first and being leaders, attracting international attention if we can. And um, and I think, you know, in most cases, the intentions are there. I don't think that we do a good job of actually getting across the finish line in many cases. But tonight, I just want to speak really quickly about the... Um, you know this this motion, and I and I applaud um, Councillor Dominato for bringing it to um, to the floor here. But essentially, what we're talking about here, in really simple terms, is the utilization of a space that's not being utilized for other purposes. In this particular case, this motion does refer to a business called Reef Technologies, and Reef Technologies. We've been working with them for about two years. They're a company that is. Um, has ownership in parking uh, lots in Vancouver and a very innovative approach to taking these parking lots, not just in Vancouver, but across North America for the purposes of repurposing them. In our case, um, the opportunity is, and I think you've all heard of Ghost Kitchens, which is, you know, which is up for a, a business to set up an external kitchen and either, you know, produce their own brands of food in those kitchens, and some in some cases they produce other brands entirely 
Uh, and they do this because they have small facilities or small restaurants. They don't have their reach and, facil- and, and, and frequency, and maybe they've got expansion plans of taking their brand and expanding it parts of Canada. But the, what, what is really cool about this is that they don't have the capital requirements because Reef takes care of that. They don't have any of the marketing uh, costs because Reef takes care of that. And basically, Reef takes care of everything. They take the recipe from the restaurant. They produce uh, the food to um, the specifications. Uh, they market and they distribute. And they can distribute. So essentially, take a small business. Restaurants in Vancouver have been particularly hard hit, as they have been in Victoria, and allow that business to expand. It expand its geographical territory for a small fee. It increases its revenue. And it's also very much in, in line with third-party delivery, which you know was about 13% of our business prior to the pandemic, and it's probably 30% of our business, and it's not going away. That's a trend that is is cemented in the consumer's preferences now. Even when the pandemic starts to diminish, people have enjoyed that experience. And Reef has brought this to Vancouver to, to allow Vancouver to be a first. I really hope that you can find a way through the regulations to make it simple because the regulations, uh, the way it's been going to get this process, they've been working at six month, for six months on it right now, and it's gone into a, a labyrinth of complexity and, and, and needing approvals and development permits, and it's just got bogged down in red tape. And I'm really asking the city to find an easier way to approve the utilizations of these spaces. It's all for good reason. It's for good. It's, it's going to help our businesses immensely. And it's going to set up Vancouver as being a place to do business and an opportunity for the city of Vancouver to shine. So I really have nothing more to say is that I just hope that um, you can take a good look at this and, and see if we can make the, uh, the, uh, the utilization of these types of spaces in Vancouver easier to work with. Thank you for your time. Great. You, uh, thanks so much for your time, uh, to, uh, taking the time to come to speak to Council. Very much appreciated. Um, there are no questions, but you're very clear. Thank you. Um, is Speaker 2 on the line? Andrew Partridge. I am here, yes. Can you hear me? You bet. Go ahead. You have up to five minutes to speak to Council. Awesome. I probably won't need five minutes because Ian so perfectly articulated much of what I was going to say. He sold stole my speech from me. Um, but I will speak personally from uh, being a, a member of the Reef Technology team. So my title is uh, the Area Director. I joined Reef in uh, May of last year. Uh, I grew up here in Vancouver, well, North Vancouver specifically. Um, I was one of the thousands that was uh, furloughed over the early stages of the pandemic. I've worked in hotels, restaurants for my, uh, my entire adult life. And obviously, uh, I was very much affected by what happened in our industry as um, even someone with a senior position um, was, you know, we, we often talk about the, the frontline workers and, and cooks and servers and, and the hourly staff. There was also um, thousands and thousands of senior level staff uh, that, were, that were also furloughed over this time. Um, to in an effort to, to save cash and, and capital over the, the uncertain times. So I was uh, really, really excited when I got the opportunity to bring my skill set to the Reef model. Um, Reef is an ecosystem that connects the world to your block. So as Ian mentioned, what we aim to do is solve many of the problems that are facing the restaurant, retail, and you know global industries by leveraging our parking assets to deploy last mile uh, deliverance with goods and services. Uh, in the city of Vancouver, our primary focus has been deploying kitchens. And um, one of the most empowering and exciting part of the job that I was really eagerly um, awaiting to get starting on is uh, connecting and onboarding local brand partners. So we obviously have a, a very diverse and eclectic um, offering of restaurants here in the city, and I was tasked with the job of selecting five or more brand partners to join our platform and allow us to move their delivery radius from their brick-and-mortar locations into the suburbs or into the city, depending on where they currently exist. Uh, this has been an incredibly 
uh, positive experience for those brand owners to to know that, as Ian mentioned, without investing any capital, they have the ability to grow their outreach, not just across um, Vancouver, but into other provinces and into the United States or across the seas. Um, Reef has done an excellent job of allowing the operators of each city the autonomy to work with their municipal partners, contractors, brand operators to do what's right for the community, which is why we call ourselves the neighborhood company. Um, if in, in the cities of Miami and Toronto specifically, where I've spent some time doing training, I've seen uh, alternate use of space, namely parking lots and, and lots at the back of buildings uh, turn from dark, dingy areas that you would want to avoid into busy centers of activity with job creation, with great food and, um, and a community place to gather. So I obviously am speaking in favor of this motion. I believe that uh, the, the opportunity we bring to the working class, the opportunity we bring to the city to provide green solutions to tech, uh, excuse me, to uh, global problems, as well as the offering that we, that we bring with our brand partners to expand their outre outreach is incredible. And uh, I hope that this motion will be considered and we can take our learnings over the last uh, six months and beyond to, to smooth the process so we can be a great partner of the city as well. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, you do have questions, so just stay on the line. Councillor Dominato, up to three minutes. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Andrew, uh, for calling in. I love your enthusiasm. Um, I just curious if you could comment uh, a little bit about um, your experience or Reef's experience to date in terms of the process of getting this underway. Um, you obviously have been doing work in other jurisdictions, but um, Ian you know, spoke to a labyrinth of complexity. Can you comment on your experience? Yeah, I, I sure can. So there are, there's a myriad of different obstacles that we try to navigate through to get the correct permitting process in. I understand that we don't, because we're not a mobile kitchen, we're not a temporary structure, we have to apply for a development permit to then trigger a building permit to get the business license that we need to operate. Um, an example of one of the challenges that we just recently learned is we, in order to enable our vessels to give them power and access to uh, fresh and potable water, we need to connect the kitchen vessel to a, an adjacent brick and mortar building. Uh, in most cases, the, the land beside the building is a different address of the building itself. So we are not able to connect our, our mobile vessel into that building because we're crossing property lines with enablement. Um, Vancouver is the only city I'm aware of that has this issue. Um, it's, it's something that was, uh, was the first that we had heard of across the network, and it's something that we've, for this reason, had to eliminate dozens, uh, maybe more, maybe close to hundreds of sites uh, that we would have otherwise intended to deploy businesses. Um, thanks, Andrew. So from, from your perspective, and I, and I appreciate you elaborating on that, is then you see, you see the benefit and value of, of us looking at this and providing further guidelines and guidance um, so that we can streamline and simplify uh, the process for these sort of non-traditional, non-bricks-and-mortar um, activations. It, exactly. And I think, you know, again, I, as a, as a Vancouverite and as a, as a local person here, I want to do right by the city and I want to be a partner. Um, and I would love just a smooth or, or clear pathway on, on what is required um, and, and allow us to do the work on the back end. Um, I think it's been really confusing. We haven't, it, the, the process hasn't been clear to get all of our ducks in a row. It's uh, depending on the site, depending on who is reviewing it, we've been given, you know, kind of multiple different responses. This will work, this won't, we need this, we need that. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking months um, before we actually get 
clarity on what exactly it is that we need to, to put forward. So I'm, I'm more than happy to get everything, you know, buttoned up and, and presentable on our side. I just want to know what that is. And I would like the, the process, obviously, to be less complicated for um, the individuals that are helping us with with submitting these in a, in a timely fashion. Yeah, and that, that is it for Councillor Dominato's time. Thank you, Chair. Thank yeah. you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is for your questions, but um, very much appreciate you coming to speak to us and staying to answer questions. Okay. Um, Thank you so much for hearing me. Great. No problem. Is speaker three on the line, Sebastian Toro. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, you bet. Go ahead. You're very clear. You have up to five minutes. Hi. Okay, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am an immigrant uh, that has been here for about 10 years, and I have worked for it since June of last year. I was attracted to the company by the vision that was sold to me about who risk is and uh, how the concept allows people to, um, it's like people interested in cooking, the exposure to a diverse set of menus. Um, I want to be a part of a rapid growth organization and experience the trajectory of a performance-based organization. With my first two months, I was promoted, and ever since, like, I have feel that I've been cut off because, of course, uh, all the all the issues with the permits. Uh, in the time that I have been working with the company, I have been uh, offering jobs to uh, a lot of people. And uh, we have hired around, I don't know, probably by now 40 people working for us, waiting for the same opportunity of growth that I had. Um, we have alliances with Covenant House and YMCA, and that's a big part of why I love to work uh, for the company and why I would like this motion to pass. We create space for people that they have been turned down in different places and yeah, like I just really like that part. Once we are full scale, I believe we will be able to provide extensive opportunities for growth and development. And I believe that kitchen cooks will learn logistics, retail, and ordering alongside with world class food, which is kind of like what drives the city. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm sorry that. I'm kind of nervous the first time <laughs> talking to this kind of thing. No, oh, you were very understandable, very clear. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, speaker Bye -bye. four, John Hello. Negrin. Speaker four on the line. Hello. Hi there. Yes. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yep, you bet. Up to five minutes. Perfect. Speak to council. Go ahead. Awesome. Uh, again, thank you very much, you guys, for letting me speak tonight. My name's Johnny Negrin, uh, and I am co-owner of Bloom Community Projects. Um, I am a native of Vancouver, BC, and we started. I started Bloom about a year back with the intention of, you know, helping with the community of Vancouver and finding ways to utilize space, vacant land, very similar to what Reef is doing. Uh, but on a much smaller scale. So uh, I've got a leased parcel of land at the Plaza Nations for the summer with the intentions of doing a uh, summer pop-up. And the goal there is we're going to drop 160 to 200 square foot uh, temporary modular units and bring in local retail. And the goal is to really get these businesses in the community, um, help kind of revitalize uh, areas in the city, um, and, uh, you know, just going through the process of permitting, it's very sim similar situation to what Andrew was speaking. It's just been, it's been difficult. There's a lot of gray area. And um, we've been at it for about eight months now. And we still are kind of unsure as to where we fall. Um, you know, with applying for a special event on a shorter term, it doesn't really fit our mold. And then also, you know, applying for a development permit just seems like quite a lot of work. Um, so we're, you know, forwarding a motion like this, I think that it would be, it's something that we obviously stand behind. Uh, it's, I think, being able to utilize these spaces in the downtown core and open them up to the community and support local businesses, it's kind of, you know, I think that it would just be a, a great opportunity for the city. And this is something that, you know, I've 
Um, my past career was playing hockey. I spent time in Europe and in the UK, and you see stuff like this all over. And it, it's really, it's, 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 it's a market in, in essence, and it just brings the community together. Um, you see, you know, areas like North Vancouver and what they've done with the shipyards. It's proven that, you know, you can have these open spaces and you can, you can be a little more lenient as to, you know, the laws and the restrictions and the red tape. Um, and like, I know being in Vancouver, I live downtown and those, especially on those summer evenings, you're looking for, for a place to go and for patio space and, you know, a place like Plaza Nation sat there empty for so long, um, to be able to bring in local businesses in these high density areas, it just kind of makes sense. You know, you see, it's obviously very expensive real estate. And if we can get that lease rate and work with developers to try and utilize this rant, this land, I think it could just add a lot of benefit to the city. So, you know, I've, uh, I'm in full support of it. I'm in support of companies like Reef coming into Vancouver and opening doors and changing ways, you know, utilizing parking lots, you know, working with the city. Uh, we're open to really anything. We want to try to find a way to really just connect the community. And uh, that's what we stand behind. So really appreciate you guys uh, letting us speak tonight. And thanks for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, there are no questions for you, mm -hmm. but um, you're very clear and we really appreciate you coming. Thank you. So we are now at the end of the speaker's list, um, which means we are open to discussion on this motion. Well, we could just vote, to vote but <laughs> go ahead, Councillor Kirby Young. Oh, thanks. Um, I'll be brief, but I just want to say I, I really want to be the kind of city that innovatively utilizes our space and we have a lot of underutilized land and I think that in the olden days when we used to travel and have ability to go somewhere um, outside of our own city, if you remember pre-COVID, the things that were always great um, was how spaces were being used for the benefit of communities. So you go through Brooklyn or um, all kinds of cities worldwide that would have pop-up, um, you know, whether it was food truck utilization, um, whether it's in combination with local entertainment, you know, in terms of the ability of live music, ch chances for people to be outdoors on underutilized lots, uh, which we've all seen now is important during COVID. But it's that sense of energy, um, you know, pop-up retail, like all, they're all just sorts of things. There's more um, sustained examples like Box Park and Shoreditch in London um, that have become um, real demonstration projects because it's much more flexible and nimble for, and, and it can really incubate um, new concepts, smaller entrepreneurs, which is really interesting and exciting that can't afford, because just like we talk about housing affordability being so expensive, um, and people, you know, gone are the days of the single family home, sometimes gone are the days of ownership. It's the same, not the, the similar in retail, right? Where it's really, really difficult to rent a space, especially if you're trying to start out. And this is a great way to not only provide great experiences for community, utilize assets and like land that are um, not being um, maximized. Um, and provide the, that sort of culture that fosters startup and innovation, um, which I think is incredibly um, interesting to do in sort of new and, and, and innovative ways. So I would really like to see us be able to be this kind of city. I just think about, for example, maybe a quick analogy is, look at how much people responded to Vancouver all of a sudden having a patio culture, right? <laughs> that came out of the pandemic and everybody went, Wow, they love this. There was an energy and a buzz and there was life on the streets and there were people enjoying them. And they said, it shouldn't have had to take a pandemic to do this, but what a great outcome that people got to enjoy that space. And I kind of look at this in a very similar way of being able to create that kind of, you know, those really interesting spaces, you know, art displays, right? Pop-up areas for artists that could um, utilize um, spaces for creation, um, whether it's... Um, it's amazing what you can do with shipping containers. You see them at the bottom of Lonsdale and they've been pop-up patios. They can be other spaces. We just are not creating a creative opportunity to use that space. And I think that if we could shift the mindset a little bit to make the to enable temporary uses, which is really what we're talking about here, um, because it's not the same, and of course you have to deal with safety issues, it's not the same as building a full-on building, right? Usually these are modular and adaptable, and it could be some really simple things, like food trucks pull up, and you allow seating, and um, there's all sorts of displays or pop-up things. So I just 
would really love to be that kind of city that has those spaces because those are the ones, the things that people talk about. That's what knits and brings people together. And I say this a lot, um, but a lot of life happens outside people's spaces and those spaces are becoming increasingly small and far between. So I think also that I'll say too, I think this is directly within the city's purview to do this is to enable and not um, preclude um, and having some of these kinds of opportunities come forward. And I also, the last thing I'll note is that my understanding in talking with some of the different folks operating in this space, and we heard some of the speakers tonight, is it really can be a benefit from a, a logistics perspective and a climate perspective for things like first and last mile for distribution, right? So if you're a, a restaurant and maybe you're a small operator, but your stuff is really popular and you operate on the west or the east side and you want to have another hub for distribution that's easier, but you're not clocking as many miles for people to go there. So all those things like the shift delivery um, and, you know, people being able to walk and pick up food, right, so they're not having to use other forms of transportation can be really climate friendly um, as well um, and pragmatic. And it also enables those kind of new operators to extend their reach there when we're trying to build neighborhoods you know when we talk about complete communities that's the other piece i'll just kind of tie in and leave here is that people being able to access all of these types of experiences within their neighborhoods so i think for me it it hits livability it hits you know kind of you know the city's core land use and permit enabling and permitting um, abilities it hits climate um, so it checks and it checks all the boxes for me it supports our credit sector it supports small business um, it supports tourism. I'm hard pressed to think of something it doesn't support. Um, so obviously I think it's pretty clear I like it um, and I will leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kirby Young and Councillor Dominato to you to close. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I think Councillor Kirby Young may have taken some of the words out of my mouth, but it's, um, I, I, I'll just reflect a couple of things. I um, really appreciated um, how articulate um, Ian Tossenson was in um, his reflections around um, the labyrinth of complexity and um, and that some of these initiatives get da bogged down in red tape and and you guys have all served on council long enough for me now to know that um, when I see gaps like that or challenges I want to see how can we do better how can we improve things and and I think that everyone here at the city is committed to that that culture of service and um, like Councillor Kirby Young, and I, I was extremely excited about um, these initiatives, and that's why in the motion I, I gave a number of examples of organizations I came in contact with over the last year um, who really want to uh, help um, uh, foster an animated city, whether it be the the e-bikes example or the farmer's market or uh, the reef kitchens and as well as uh, Bloom Community Group in terms of uh, really tapping in and activating those underutilized spaces in our city and uh, capturing the minds and hearts of people in terms of that animation is, um, I, I appreciate how Johnny spoke too about the fact that um, these, you know, he's talking about the pop-up retail and how it brings community together and um, the example cited, cited by Councillor Kirby Young and how um, excited that the public got about patios and, and how we were looking at using our spaces differently in the city. And, and, and uh, so f for me, um, uh, this was a really important step to um, recognizing that our regulatory frameworks um, a lot of them were developed and put in place at a different time and didn't contemplate these innovations. And so, as I said earlier, um, they, a lot of them were designed for more of a bricks and mortar construct, whereas uh, these examples do not fit in that box. And yet, um, there are many, many benefits which um, uh, include um, the uh, walkable neighborhoods, the 15-minute city, which is something I've been a long advocate for, is that um, that when we develop complete neighborhoods, um, then people can are more likely to walk or ride to their destinations if they have restaurants or amenities or services or daycares in their neighborhoods. And, and uh, that's something I'm extremely passionate about. Every time I have moved in my life, I have always sought to be in a neighborhood or a place where I have those amenities around me and I don't actually have to get into my car. And that has always been something I've prioritized wherever I've lived. And I also, it, it does speak to um, that conversation around the environmental benefits of this as well. And, and, and then finally, um, the uh, small business community. I think that um, uh, 
they are the backbone of our cities um, and many of the things we enjoy are actually our small businesses and they provide jobs for people to live and thrive here. And so if we can make it easier for them to do business here, to set up here, um, then I think that's a win. And so really there's like a win-win-win here in terms of supporting small business, in terms of um, supporting walkable, uh, accessible neighborhoods, in terms of supporting climate and the environment. And so that's why I, I'm passionate about this and I hope that Council will support the motion. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor Dominato. And that is it for speakers. So, Kirk, if you could move us to a vote on this uh, motion, that would be great. And that is unanimous. So that, that's good, yep. Uh, that is good, the standing, uh, that completes item eight. That standing committee portion of this meeting is now complete. We will now convene in council with Mayor Stewart as chair to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's committee meeting. Thanks very much, Chair Carr. Uh, we're gonna reconvene in council and I'm gonna ask the clerk for the roll call, please. Uh, Mayor Stewart in the in the chair. Uh, Councillor Carr here. Councillor Dijanova present. Councillor Fry present. Councillor Swanson is absent. Councillor Hardwick present. Councillor Weeb is absent. Councillor Boyle present. Councillor Dominato present. Councillor Bly. Present. Councillor Kirby Young. You have quorum, Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much, clerks. Uh, we need a motion to adopt the standing committee's recommendations for items one to eight. So move. So move. Councillor DeGenova. Thank you, Councillor DeGenova. I think I heard a seconder from Carr. Councillor Carr. Thanks very much. All in favor say yay. 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 Opposed nay. That's good. Um, it has passed. We have two bylaws on the agenda for enactment, both bylaws related to item one on yesterday's public hearing agenda. Uh, does anybody wish to hold these bylaws for debate, separate vote, or conflict of interest? You can just let me know verbally. Move adoption. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bly. Uh, any discussion? If not, all those in favor say yay. 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 Opposed nay. Thanks, that motion carries unanimously. And the list of these bylaws can be found on the website. Councillor Hardwick, would you like to? Be before, thank you very much, Mayor. <laughs> before that, I'm sorry she's not here. I just would have liked to acknowledge that it's Councillor Swanson's birthday today. Oh, Too bad nice. we could have sung happy birthday. <laughs> uh, but on that happy note, yes, a motion to adjourn. Thanks very much. Seconder? Second, Councillor Bly. Councillor Bly, thank you. Uh, all in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. There we go. We are adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody, for today. Thank you, clerk. Thank you, staff. Thanks to all participants. Okay. So long. <laughs>